15. Valentine Michael Smith swam through the murky water to the deepest part of the pool, under the diving board, and settled himself on the bottom. He did not know why his water brother Jubal had told him to hide there. Indeed, he did not know that he was hiding. His water brother Jubal had told him to do this and to remain there until his water brother Jill came for him. That was sufficient. As soon as he was sure that he was at the deepest part, he curled himself into the fetal position, let most of the air out of his lungs, swallowed his tongue, rolled his eyes up, slowed his heart down to almost nothing, and became effectively dead, save that he was not actually discorporate and could start his engines again at will. He also elected to stretch his time sense until seconds flowed past like hours. As he had much to contemplate, and did not know how quickly Jill would come to get him. He knew that he had failed again in an attempt to achieve the perfect understanding, the mutually merging rapport, the grokking, that should exist between water brothers. He knew that the failure was his, caused by his using wrongly the oddly variable human language, because Jubal had become upset as soon as he had spoken to him. He now knew that his human brothers could suffer intense emotion without any permanent damage. Nevertheless, Smith was wistfully sorry that he had been the cause of such upset in Jubal. At the time it had seemed to him that he had at last grokked perfectly a most difficult human word. He should have known better because, early in his learnings under his brother Mahmud, he had discovered that long human words, the longer the better, were easy, unmistakable, and rarely changed their meanings. But short words were slippery, unpredictable, changing their meanings without any pattern. Or so he seemed to grok. Short human words were never like a short Martian word, such as grok, which forever meant exactly the same thing. Short human words were like trying to lift water with a knife. And this had been a very short word. Smith still felt that he had grokked rightly the human word God. The confusion had come from his own failure in selecting other human words. The concept was truly so simple, so basic, so necessary, that any nestling could have explained it perfectly in Martian. The problem, then, was to find human words that would let him speak rightly, make sure that he had patterned them rightly to match in fullness how it would be said in his own people's language. He puzzled briefly over the curious fact that there should be any difficulty in saying it, even in English, since it was a thing everyone knew, else they could not grok alive. Possibly he should ask the human old ones how to say it, rather than struggle with the shifting meanings of human words. If so, he must wait until Jubal arranged it, for here he was only an egg and could not arrange it himself. He felt brief regret that he would not be privileged to be present at the coming discorporation of Brother Art and Brother Dotty. Then he settled down to reread in his mind... Webster's New International Dictionary of the English Language, 3rd edition, published in Springfield, Massachusetts. From a long way off, Smith was interrupted by an uneasy awareness that his water brothers were in trouble. He paused between Sherbacha and Sherbert to ponder this knowledge. Should he start himself up, leave the enfolding water of life, and join them to grok and share their trouble. At home, there could have been no question about it. Trouble is shared in joyful closeness. But this place was strange in every way, and Jubal had told him to wait until Jill came. He reviewed Jubal's words, trying them out in long contemplation against other human words, making sure that he grokked. No, Jubal had spoken rightly, and he had grokked rightly. He must wait until Jill came. Nevertheless, he was made so uneasy by the certain knowledge of his brother's trouble that he could not go back to his word hunt. 
At last an idea came to him that was filled with such gay daring that he would have trembled had his body not been unready for trembling. Jubal had told him to place his body under water and leave it there until Joel came. But had Jubal said that he himself must wait with the body? Smith took a careful long time to consider this, knowing that the slippery English words that Jubal had used could easily lead him, and often had led him, into mistakes. He concluded that Jubal had not specifically ordered him to stay with his body, and that left a way out of the wrongness of not sharing his brother's trouble. So Smith decided to take a walk. He was a bit dazed at his own audacity, for while he had done it before, twice, he had never soloed. Each time an old one had been with him, watching over him, making sure that his body was safe, keeping him from becoming disoriented at the new experience, staying with him until he returned to his body and started it up again. There was no old one to help him now, but Smith had always been quick to learn. He knew how to do it and was confident that he could do it alone in a fashion that would fill his teacher with pride. So first he checked over every part of his body, made certain that it would not be damaged while he was gone, then got cautiously out of it, leaving behind only that trifle of himself needed as watchman and caretaker. Then he rose up and stood on the edge of the pool, remembering to behave as if his body were still with him, as a guard against disorienting, against losing track of the pool, the body, everything, and wandering off into unknown places where he could not find his way back. Smith looked around. An air car was just landing in the garden by the pool, and beings under it were complaining of injuries and indignities done them. Perhaps this was the trouble he could feel. Grasses were for walking on, flowers and bushes were not. This was a wrongness. No, there was more wrongness. A man was just stepping out of the air car, one foot about to touch the ground, and Jubal was running toward him. Smith could see the blast of icy anger that Jubal was hurling toward the man, a blast so furious that, had one Martian hurled it toward another, both would have discorporated at once. Smith noted it down as something he must ponder, and, if it was a cusp of necessity as it seemed to be, decide what he must do to help his brother. Then he looked over the others. Dorcas was climbing out of the pool. She was puzzled and rather troubled, but not too much so. Smith could feel her confidence in Jubal. Larry was at the edge of the pool and had just gotten out, Drops of water falling from him were in the air. Larry was not troubled, but excited and pleased. His confidence in Jubal was absolute. Miriam was near him, and her mood was midway between those of Dorcas and Larry. Anne was standing where she had been seated, and was dressed in the long white garment she had had with her all day. Smith could not fully grok her mood. He felt in her some of the cold, unyielding discipline of mind of an old one. It startled him, as Anne was always soft and gentle and warmly friendly. He saw that she was watching Jubal closely and was ready to help him, and so was Larry, and Dorcas, and Miriam. With a sudden burst of emphatic catharsis, Smith learned that all these friends were water brothers of Jubal, and therefore of him. This unexpected release from blindness shook him so that he almost lost anchorage on this place. Calming himself, as he had been taught, he stopped to praise and cherish them all, one by one and together. Jill had one arm over the edge of the pool, and Smith knew that she had been down under checking on his safety. He had been aware of her when she had done it. But now he knew that she had not alone been worried about his safety. Jill felt other and greater trouble, trouble that was not relieved by knowing that her charge was safe under the water of life. This troubled him very much, and he considered going to her, making her know 
that he was with her and sharing her trouble. He would have done so had it not been for a faint, uneasy feeling of guilt. He was not absolutely certain that Jubal had intended to permit him to walk around while his body was hidden in the pool. He compromised by telling himself that he would share their trouble and let them know that he was present if it became needful. Smith then looked over the man who was stepping out of the air car, felt his emotions and recoiled from them, forced himself nevertheless to examine him carefully inside and out. In a shaped pocket strapped around his waist by a belt, the man was carrying a gun. Smith was almost certain it was a gun. He examined it in great detail, comparing it with two guns that he had seen briefly, checking what it appeared to be against the definition in Webster's New International Dictionary of the English Language, third edition, published in Springfield, Massachusetts. Yes, it was a gun, not alone in shape, but also in wrongness that surrounded and penetrated it. Smith looked down the barrel, saw how it must function, and wrongness stared back at him. Should he turn it and let it go elsewhere, taking its wrongness with it? Do it at once, before the man was fully out of the car? Smith felt that he should. And yet Jubal had told him at another time not to do this to a gun until Jubal told him that it was time to do it. He knew now that this was indeed a cusp of necessity, but he resolved to balance on the point of the cusp until he grokked all of it, since it was possible that Jubal, knowing that a cusp was approaching, had sent him underwater to keep him from acting wrongly at the cusp. He would wait, but in the meantime he would hold this gun and its wrongness carefully under his eye not at the moment being limited to two eyes facing always one way, being able to see all around him if needful, he continued to watch the gun and the man stepping out of the car while he went inside the car. More wrongness than he would have believed possible. Other men were in there, all but one of them crowding toward the door. Their minds smelled like a pack of Kalga, who had scented an unwary nymph. And each one held in his hands a something having wrongness. As he had told Jubal, Smith knew that shape alone was never a prime determinant. It was necessary to go beyond shape to essence in order to grok. His own people passed through five major shapes. Egg, nymph, nestling, adult and old one which had no shape. Yet the essence of an old one was already patterned in the egg. These somethings that these men carried seemed like guns, but Smith did not assume that they were guns. He examined one most carefully first. It was much larger than any gun he had ever seen. Its shape was very different, and its details were quite different. It was a gun. He examined each of the others, separately and just as carefully. They were guns. The one man who was still seated had strapped to him a small gun. The car itself had built into it two enormous guns, plus other things which Smith could not grok, but which he felt had wrongness also. He stopped and seriously considered twisting the car, its contents, and all, letting it topple away. But in addition to his lifelong inhibition against wasting food, he knew that he did not fully grok what was happening. Better to move slowly, watch carefully, and help and share at the cusp by following Jubal's lead. And if right action for him was to remain passive, then go back to his body when the cusp had passed and discuss it all with Jubal later. He went back outside the car and watched and listened and waited. The first man to get out talked with Jubal concerning many things which Smith could only file without grokking. They were beyond his experience. The other man got out and spread out. Smith spread his attention to watch all of them. The car raised, moved backwards, stopped again, 
which relieved the beings it had sat on. Smith grokked with them to the extent that he could spare attention, trying to soothe their hurtings. The first man handed papers to Jubal. In turn, they were passed to Anne. Smith read them along with her. He recognized their word shapings as being concerned with certain human rituals of healing and balance. But since he had encountered these rituals only in Jubal's law library, he did not try to grok the papers then, especially as Jubal seemed quite untroubled by them. The wrongness was elsewhere. He was delighted to recognize his own human name on two of the papers. He always got an odd thrill out of reading it, as if he were two places at once, impossible as that was for any but an old one. Jubal and the first man turned and walked toward the pool, with Anne close behind them. Smith relaxed his time sense a little to let them move faster, keeping it stretched just enough so that he could comfortably watch all the men at once. Two of the men closed in and flanked the little group. The first man stopped near the group of his friends by the pool, looked at them, then took a picture from his pocket, looked at it, and looked at Jill. Smith felt her fear and trouble mount, and he became very alert. Jubal had told him, Protect Jill. Don't worry about wasting food. Don't worry about anything else. Protect Jill. Of course he would protect Jill in any case, even at the risk of acting wrongly in some other fashion. But it was good to have Jubal's blanket reassurance. It left his mind undivided and untroubled. When the first man pointed at Jill, and the two men flanking him hurried toward her with their guns of great wrongness, Smith reached out through his doppelganger and gave them each that tiny twist which causes to topple away. The first man stared at where they had been and reached for his gun, and he was gone too. The other four started to close in. Smith did not want to twist them. He felt that Jubal would be more pleased with him if he simply stopped them. But stopping a thing, even an ashtray, is work, and Smith did not have his body at hand. An old one could have managed it all four together, but Smith did what he could do, what he had to do. Four feather touches. They were gone. He felt more intense wrongness from the direction of the car on the ground and went at once to it, grokked to a quick decision, and car and pilot were gone. He almost overlooked the car riding cover patrol in the air. Smith started to relax when he had disposed of the car on the ground, when suddenly he felt wrongness and trouble increase, and he looked up. The second car was coming in for a landing right where he was. Smith stretched his time sense to his personal limit and went to the car in the air, inspected it carefully, grokked that it was as choked with utter wrongness as the first had been, tilted it into neverness. Then he returned to the group by the pool. All his friends seemed quite excited. Dorcas was sobbing, and Jill was holding her and soothing her. Anne alone seemed untouched by the emotions Smith felt seething around him. But wrongness was gone, all of it, and with it the trouble that had disturbed his meditations earlier. Dorcas, he knew, would be healed faster and better by Jill than by anyone. Jill always grokked a hurting fully and at once. Disturbed by emotions around him, slightly apprehensive, that he might not have acted in all ways rightly at the point of cusp, or that Jubal might so grok him, Smith decided that he was now free to leave. He slipped back into the pool, found his body, grokked that it was still as he had left it, unharmed, slipped it back on. He considered contemplating the events at the cusp, but they were too new, too recent, he was not ready to enfold them, not ready to praise and cherish the men he had been forced to move. Instead, he returned happily to the task he had been on. Sherbet. Sherbetly. Sherbetside. He had reached tinwork 
and was about to consider tiny when he felt Jill's touch approaching him. He unswallowed his tongue and made himself ready, knowing that his brother Jill could not remain very long under water without distress. As she touched him, he reached out, took her face in his hands, and kissed her. It was a thing he had learned to do quite lately, and he did not feel that he grokked it perfectly. It had the growing closer of the water ceremony, but it had something else, too— something he wanted very much to grok in perfect fullness. Sixteen Jubal Harshaw did not wait for Jillian to dig her problem child out of the pool. He left instructions for Dorcas to be given a sedative and hurried to his study, leaving Anne to explain or not explain the events of the last ten minutes. Front! he called out over his shoulder. Miriam turned and caught up with him. I guess I must be front, she said breathlessly. But, boss, what in the— Girl, not one word. But, boss, zip it, I said. Miriam— about a week from now, we'll all sit down and get Anne to tell us what we really did see. But right now, everybody and his cousins will be phoning here, and reporters will be crawling out of the trees, and I've got to make a couple of calls first. I need help. Are you the sort of useless female who comes unstuck when she's needed? That reminds me. Make a note to dock Dorcas's pay for the time she spent having hysterics. Miriam gasped. Boss, you just dare do that, and every single one of us will quit cold. Nonsense. I mean it. Quit picking on Dorcas. Why, I would have had hysterics myself if she hadn't beaten me to it. She added. I think I'll have hysterics now. Harshaw grinned. You do, and I'll spank you. All right. Put Dorcas down for a bonus for extra hazardous duty. Put all of you down for a bonus. Me especially. I earned it. All right. But who pays your bonus? The taxpayers, of course. We'll find a way to clip... Damn! They had reached his study door. The telephone was already demanding attention. He slid into the seat in front of it and keyed in. Harshaw speaking. Who the devil are you? Skip the routine, Doc. A face answered cheerfully. You haven't frightened me in years. How's everything going? Harshaw recognized the face as belonging to Thomas McKenzie, production manager-in-chief for New World Networks. He mellowed slightly. Well enough, Tom, but I'm rushed as can be, so you're rushed. Come try my 48-hour day. I'll make it brief. Do you still think you are going to have something for us? I don't mind the expensive equipment you've got tied up. I can overhead that, but business is business, and I have to pay three full crews just to stand by for your signal. Union rules, you know how it is. I want to do you any favor I can. We've used lots of your script in the past, and we expect to use still more in the future, but I'm beginning to wonder what I'm going to tell our controller. Harshaw stared at him. Do you think the spot coverage you just got was enough to pay the freight? What spot coverage? A few minutes later, Harshaw said goodbye and switched off. Having been convinced that New World Networks had seen nothing of recent events at his home, he stalled off Mackenzie's questions about it, because he was dismally certain that a factual recital would simply convince Mackenzie that poor old Harshaw had at last gone to pieces. Nor could Harshaw have blamed him. Instead, they agreed that if nothing worth picking up happened in the next twenty-four hours, New World could break the linkage and remove their cameras and other equipment. As the screen cleared, Harshaw ordered, Get Larry 
Have him fetch that panic button. Anne probably has it. He then started making another call, followed it with a third. By the time Larry arrived, Harshaw was convinced that no network had been watching when the special service squads attempted to raid his home. It was not necessary to check on whether or not the two dozen hold messages that he had recorded had been sent. Their delivery depended on the same signal that had failed to reach the news channels. As he turned away from the phone, Larry offered him the panic button portable radio link. You wanted this, boss? I just wanted to sneer at it and see if it sneered back. Larry, let this be a lesson to us. Never trust any machinery more complicated than a knife and fork. Okay, anything else? Larry, is there a way to check that dingus and see if it's working properly? Without actually hauling three networks out of their beds, I mean? Sure. The techs set up the transceiver down in the shop, and it's got a switch on it for that very purpose. Throw the switch, push the button, a light comes on. To test on through, you simply call them, right from the transceiver, and tell them you want a hot test clear through to the cameras and back to the monitor stations. And suppose the test shows that we aren't getting through. If the trouble is here, can you spot what's wrong? Well, I might. Larry said doubtfully, if it wasn't anything more than a loose connection. But Duke is the electron pusher around here. I'm more the intellectual type. I know, son. I'm not too bright about practical matters either. Well, do the best you can. Let me know. Anything else, Jubal? Yes. If you see the man who invented the wheel, send him up. I want to give him a piece of my mind. Meddler. Jubal spent the next few minutes in umbilical contemplation. He considered the possibility that Duke had sabotaged the panic button, but rejected the thought as time-wasting, if not unworthy. He allowed himself to wonder for a moment just what had really happened down in his garden and how the lad had done it from ten feet under water for he had no doubt that the man from Mars had been behind those impossible shenanigans. Admittedly, what he had seen only the day before in this very room was just as intellectually stupefying as these later events, but the emotional impact was something else. A mouse was as much a miracle of biology as was an elephant. Nevertheless, there was an important difference. An elephant was bigger. To see an empty carton, just rubbish, disappear in midair logically implied the possibility that a squad car full of men could vanish in the same fashion. But one event kicked your teeth in. The other didn't. Well, he wasn't going to waste tears on those Cossacks. Jubal conceded that cops, quay cops, were all right. He had met a number of honest cops in his life, and even a fee-splitting village constable did not deserve to be snuffed out like a candle. The Coast Guard was a fine example of what cops ought to be and frequently were. But to be a member of the SS squads, a man had to have larceny in his heart and sadism in his soul. Gestapo. Stormtroopers in the service of whatever politico was in power. Jubal longed for the good old days when a lawyer could cite the Bill of Rights and not have some overriding Federation trickery defeat him. Never mind. What would logically happen now? Heinrich's task force certainly had had radio contact with its base. Ergo, its loss would be noted, if only by silence. Shortly, more SS troops would come looking for them. We're already headed this way if that second car had been chopped off in the middle of an action report. Miriam! Yes, boss. I want Mike, Jill, and Anne here at once. Then find Larry. In the shop, probably. And both of you come to the house, lock all doors and all ground floor windows. More trouble? Get moving, gal. If the SS apes showed up again, no, when they showed up, they probably would not have duplicate warrants. 
if their leader was silly enough to break into a locked house without a warrant, well, he might have to turn Mike loose on them. But this blind warfare of attrition had to be stopped, which meant that Jubal simply had to get through to the Secretary General. How? Call the Executive Palace again? Heinrich had probably been telling the simple truth when he said that a renewed attempt would simply be referred to Heinrich, or to whatever SS boss was now warming that chair that Heinrich would never need again. Well, it would surely surprise them to have a man they had sent a squad to arrest blandly phoning in face to face. He might be able to bowl his way all the way up to the top. Commandant, what's his name? Chap with a face like a well-fed ferret, Twitchell. And certainly the commanding officer of the SS Buckos would have direct access to the boss. No good. You had to have a feeling for what makes the frog jump. It would be a waste of breath to tell a man who believes in guns that you've got something better than guns and that he can't arrest you and might as well give up trying. Twitchell would keep on throwing men and guns at them till he ran out of both, but he would never admit he couldn't bring in a man whose location was known. Well, when you couldn't use the front door, you got yourself slipped in through the back door. Elementary politics. Jubal regretted mildly that he had ignored politics the last quarter century or so. Damn it, he needed Ben Caxton. Ben would know who had keys to the back door, and Jubal would know somebody who knew one of them. But Ben's absence was the whole reason for this silly donkey derby. Since he couldn't ask Ben, whom did he know who would know? Hell's half-wit. He had just been talking to one. Jubal turned back to the phone and tried to raise Tom McKenzie again, running into only three layers of interference on the way, all of whom knew him and passed him along quickly. While he was doing this, his staff and the man from Mars came in. Jubal ignored them, and they sat down. Miriam first stopping to write on a scratch pad, Doors and windows locked. Jubal nodded to her and wrote below it, Larry, panic button, then said to the screen, Tom, sorry to bother you again. A pleasure, Jubal. Tom, if you wanted to talk to Secretary General Douglas, how would you go about it? Eh? I'd phone his press secretary, Jim Sanforth, or possibly Jock Dumont, depending on what I wanted. But I wouldn't talk to the Secretary General at all. Jim would handle it. But suppose you wanted to talk to Douglas himself. Why, I'd tell Jim and let him arrange it. Be quicker just to tell Jim my problem, though. It might be a day or two before he could squeeze me in. And even then I might be bumped for something more urgent. Look, Jubal, the network is useful to the administration, and we know it and they know it but we don't presume on it unnecessarily. Tom, assume that it is necessary. Suppose you just had to speak to Douglas right now, not next week, in the next ten minutes. Mackenzie's eyebrows went up. Well, if I just had to, I would explain to Jim why it was so urgent. No, be reasonable. No, that's just what I can't be. Assume that you had caught Jim Sanforth stealing the spoons so you couldn't tell him what the emergency was, but you had to speak to Douglas immediately. Mackenzie sighed. I suppose I would tell Jim that I simply had to talk to the boss, and that if I wasn't put through to him right away, the administration would never get another trace of support from the network. Politely, of course. But make him understand that I meant it. Sanforth is nobody's fool. He would never serve his own head up on a platter. Okay, Tom. Do it. Huh? Leave this call on. Call the palace on another instrument and have your boys ready to cut me in instantly. I've got to talk to the secretary general right now. 
Mackenzie looked pained. Jubal, old friend, meaning you won't, meaning I can't. You've dreamed up a hypothetical situation in which a, pardon me, major executive of an intercontinental network could speak to the Secretary General under conditions of dire necessity. But I can't hand this entree over to somebody else. Look, Jubal, I respect you. Besides that, you are probably four of the six most popular writers alive today. The network would hate to lose you, and we are painfully aware that you won't let us tie you down to a contract. But I can't do it, even to please you. You must realize that one does not telephone the world chief of government unless he wants to speak to you. Suppose I do sign an exclusive seven-year contract. Mackenzie looked as if his teeth hurt. I still couldn't do it. I'd lose my job, and you would still have to carry out your contract. Jubal considered calling Mike over into the instrument's visual pickup and naming him. He discarded the idea at once. Mackenzie's own programs had run the fake Man from Mars interviews, and Mackenzie was either crooked and in on the hoax, or he was honest, as Jubal thought he was, and simply would not believe that he himself had been hoaxed. All right, Tom, I won't twist your arm, but you know your way around in the government better than I do. Who calls Douglas whenever he likes and gets him? I don't mean Sanforth. No one. Damn it, no man lives in a vacuum. There must be at least a dozen people who can phone him and not get brushed off by a secretary. Some of his cabinet, I suppose, and not all of them. I don't know any of them either. I've been out of touch. But I don't mean professional politicos. Who knows him so well that they can call him on a private line and invite him to play poker? Um... You don't want much, do you? Well, there's Jack Allenby. Not the actor, the other Jack Allenby. Oil. I've met him. He doesn't like me. I don't like him. He knows it. Douglas doesn't have very many intimate friends. His wife rather discourages... Say, Jubal, how do you feel about astrology? Never touch the stuff. Prefer brandy. Well, that's a matter of taste, but see here, Jubal, if you ever let on to anyone that I told you this, I'll cut your lying throat with one of your own manuscripts. Noted. Agreed. Proceed. Well, Agnes Douglas does touch the stuff, and I know where she gets it. Her astrologer can call Mrs. Douglas at any time, and believe you me, Mrs. Douglas has the ear of the Secretary-General whenever she chooses. You can call her astrologer. And the rest is up to you. I don't seem to recall any astrologers on my Christmas card list, Jubal answered dubiously. What's his name? Her. And you might try crossing her palm with silver in convincing denominations. Her name is Madame Alexandra Vassant, Washington Exchange. That's V-E-S-A-N-T. I've got it, Jubal said happily. And Tom, you've done me a world of good. Hope so. Anything for the network soon? Hold it. Jubal glanced at a note Miriam had placed at his elbow some moments ago. It read, Larry says the transceiver won't trans... And he doesn't know why. Jubal went on. That spot coverage failed earlier through a transceiver failure here, and I don't have anyone who can repair it. I'll send somebody. Thanks. Thanks twice. Jubal switched off placed the call by name, and instructed the operator to use Hushen's scramble if the number was equipped to take it. 
It was not to his surprise. Very quickly, Madame Fassant's dignified features appeared in his screen. He grinned at her and called, Hey, Rube! She looked startled, then looked more closely. Why, Doc Harsha, you old scoundrel. Lord love you, it's good to see you. Where have you been hiding? Just that, Becky, hiding. The clowns are after me. Becky Vesey didn't ask why. She answered instantly. What can I do to help? Do you need money? I've got plenty of money, Becky, but thanks a lot. Money won't help. I'm in much more serious trouble than that, and I don't think anyone can help me but the Secretary General himself, Mr. Douglas. I need to talk to him, and right away, now, or even sooner. She looked blank. That's a tall order, Doc. Becky, I know it is, because I've been trying for a week to get through to him, and I can't. But don't you get mixed up in it yourself, Becky, because, girl, I'm hotter than a smoky bearing. I just took a chance that you might be able to advise me, a phone number, maybe, where I could reach him. But I don't want you to mix into it personally. You'd get hurt and I'd never be able to look the professor in the eye if I ever meet him again. God rest his soul. I know what the professor would want me to do, she said sharply. So let's knock off the nonsense, Doc. The professor always swore that you were the only sawbones fit to carve people. The rest were butchers. He never forgot that time in Elkton. Now, Becky, we won't bring that up. I was paid. You saved his life. I did no such thing. It was his rugged constitution and his will to fight back. And your nursing. Ah. Doc, we're wasting time. Just how hot are you? They're throwing the book at me. And anybody near me is going to get splashed. There's a warrant out for me, a Federation warrant, and they know where I am and I can't run. It will be served any minute now, and Mr. Douglas is the only person who can stop it. You'll be sprung, I guarantee that. Becky, I'm sure you would, but it might take a few hours. It's that back room I'm afraid of, Becky. I'm too old for a session in the back room. Oh, goodness. Doc, can't you give me some details? I really ought to cast a horoscope on you. Then I'd know what to do. You're Mercury, of course, since you're a doctor. But if I knew what house to look in to find your trouble, I could do better. Girl, there isn't time for that. But thanks. Jubal thought rapidly. Whom to trust and when... Becky, just knowing could put you in as much trouble as I am in, unless I convince Mr. Douglas. Tell me, Doc, I've never taken a powder at a clem yet, and you know it. All right, so I'm Mercury, but the trouble lies in Mars. She looked at him sharply. How? You've seen the news. You know that the man from Mars is supposed supposed to be making a retreat someplace high up in the Andes. Well, he's not. That's just a hoax the yokels. Becky seemed startled, but not quite as Jubal had expected her to be. Just where do you figure in this, Doc? Becky, there are people all over this sorry planet who want to lay hands on that boy. They want to use him. They want to make him geek for them their way. But he's my client, and I don't propose to hold still for it, if I can help it. But my only chance is to talk with Mr. Douglas himself, face to face. The man from Mars is your client? You can turn him up? Yes, but only to Mr. Douglas. You know how it is, Becky. 
The mayor can be a good Joe, kind to children and dogs. But he doesn't necessarily know everything his town clowns are up to, especially if they haul a man in and take him into that back room. She nodded. I've had my troubles with cops. Cops! So I need to dicker with Mr. Douglas before they haul me in. All you want is to talk to him on the telephone? Yes, if you can swing it. Here, let me give you my number, and I'll be sitting right here, hoping for a call, until they pick me up. If you can't swing it. Thanks anyway, Becky. Thanks a lot. I'll know you tried. Don't switch off, she said sharply. Eh? Keep the circuit, Doc, while I see what I can do. If I have any luck, they can patch right through this phone and save time, so hold on. Madame Bassant left the screen without saying goodbye, then called Agnes Douglas. She spoke with calm confidence, pointing out to Agnes that this was precisely the development foretold by the stars, and exactly on schedule. Now had come the critical instant when Agnes must guide and sustain her husband, using all her womanly wit and wisdom to see that he acted wisely and without delay. Agnes, dear, this configuration will not be repeated in a thousand years. Mars, Venus, and Mercury in perfect trine, just as Venus reaches the meridian, making Venus dominant. Thus you see... Allie... What do the stars tell me to do? You know I don't understand the scientific part. This was hardly surprising, since the described relationship did not obtain at the moment. Madame Vassant had not had time to compute a new horoscope and was improvising. But she was untroubled by it. She was speaking a higher truth, giving good advice and helping her friends. To be able to help two friends at once made Becky Vesey especially happy. Dear, you really do understand it. You have born talent for it. You are Venus, as always, and Mars is reinforced, being both your husband and that young man Smith for the duration of this crisis. Mercury is Dr. Harshaw. To offset the imbalance caused by the reinforcement of Mars... Venus must sustain Mercury until the crisis is past. But you have very little time for it. Venus waxes in influence until reaching Meridian only seven minutes from now. After that, your influence will decline. You must act quickly. You should have warned me sooner. My dear, I have been waiting here by my phone all day, ready to act instantly. The stars tell us the nature of each crisis. They never tell us the details. But there is still time. I have Dr. Harshaw waiting on the telephone here. All that is necessary is to bring them face to face, if possible, before Venus reaches Meridian. Well, all right, Allie. I've got to dig Joseph out of some silly conference, but I'll get him. Keep this line open. Give me the number of the phone you have this Dr. Rackshaw on, or can you transfer the call there? I can switch it over here. Just get Mr. Douglas. Hurry, dear. I will. When Agnes Douglas' face left the screen, Becky went to still another phone. Her profession required ample phone service. It was her largest single business expense. Humming happily, she called her broker. Seventeen. As Madame Vassant left the screen, Jubal Harshaw leaned back from his phone. Front, he said. Okay, boss, Miriam acknowledged. This is one for the Real Experiences group. Specify on the cover sheet that I want the narrator to have a sexy contralto voice. Maybe I should try out for it. Not that sexy. Shut up. 
Dig out that list of null surnames we got from the Census Bureau. Pick one and put an innocent mammalian first name with it for the pen name. A girl's name ending in A. That always suggests a C cup. Huh? And not one of us with a name ending in A. Why, you louse. Flat-chested bunch, aren't you? Angela. Her name is Angela. Title, I Married a Martian. Start. All my life I had longed to become an astronaut. Paragraph. When I was just a tiny thing, with freckles on my nose and stars in my eyes, I saved box tops just as my brothers did and cried when Mummy wouldn't let me wear my space cadet helmet to bed. Paragraph. In those carefree childhood days, I did not dream to what strange, bittersweet fate my tomboy ambition would... Boss? Yes, Dorcas? Here come two more loads. Jubal got up from the telephone chair. Hold for continuation. Miriam, sit down at the phone. He went to the window, saw the two air cars Dorcas had spotted, decided that they could be squad cars and might be about to land on his property. Larry, bolt the door to this room and put on your robe. Watch them, but stand back from the window. I want them to think the house is empty. Jill, you stick close to Mike and don't let him make any hasty moves. Mike? You do what Jill tells you to. Yes, Jubal, I will do. Jill, don't turn him loose unless you have to. To keep one of us from being shot, I mean. If they bust down doors, let them. I rather hope they do. Jill, if it comes to scratch, I'd much rather he snatch just the guns and not the men. Yes, Jubal. Make sure he understands. This indiscriminate elimination of cops has got to stop. Telephone, boss. Coming. Jubal went unhurriedly back to the phone. All of you stay out of pickup. Dorcas, you can take a nap. Miriam, note down another title for later. I married a human. He slid into the seat as Miriam vacated it and said, Yes? A blandly handsome man looked back at him. Dr. Harshaw? Yes? Please hold on. The Secretary General will speak with you. The tone implied that a genuflection was in order. Okay. The screen flickered, then rebuilt in the tousled image of His Excellency the Honorable Joseph Edgerton Douglas, Secretary General of the World Federation of Free Nations. Dr. Harshaw! Understand you need to speak with me. Shoot. No, sir. Me? Eh? But I understood. Let me rephrase it precisely, Mr. Secretary. You need to speak with me. Douglas looked surprised, then grinned. Pretty sure of yourself, aren't you? Well, Doctor, you have just ten seconds to prove that. I have other things to do. Very well, sir. I am attorney for the man from Mars. Douglas suddenly stopped, looking tousled. Repeat that. I am attorney for Valentine Michael Smith, known as the man from Mars. Attorney with full power. In fact, it may help to think of me as de facto ambassador from Mars, in the spirit of the Larkin decision, that is to say. Douglas stared at him. Man, you must be out of your mind. I've often thought so lately. Nevertheless, I am acting for the man from Mars, and he is prepared to negotiate. The man from Mars is in Ecuador. Please, Mr. Secretary, this is a private conversation. He is not in Ecuador, as both of us know. Smith, the real Valentine Michael Smith, not the one who has appeared in the newscasts, escaped from confinement, 
and, I should add, illegal confinement, at Bethesda Medical Center on Thursday last in company with nurse Gillian Boardman. He kept his freedom and is now free, and he will continue to keep it. If any of your large staff of assistants has told you anything else, then someone has been lying to you, which is why I am speaking to you yourself, so that you can straighten it out. Douglas looked very thoughtful. Someone apparently spoke to him from off-screen, but no words came over the telephone. At last he said, Even if what you said were true, Doctor, you can't be in a position to speak for young Smith. He's a ward of the state. Jubal shook his head. Impossible. The Larkin decision. Now see here. As a lawyer myself, I assure you, as a lawyer myself, I must follow my own opinion and protect my client. You are a lawyer? I thought that you meant that you claim to be attorney in fact, rather than counselor. Both. You'll find that I am an attorney at law in good standing and admitted to practice before the high court. I don't hang my shingle these days, but I am. Jubal heard a dull boom from below and glanced aside. Larry whispered, The front door, I think, boss. Shall I go look? Jubal shook his head in negation and spoke to the screen. Mr. Secretary, while we quibble, time is running out. Even now your men, your SS hooligans, are breaking into my house. It is most distasteful to be under siege in my own home. Now, for the first and last time, will you abate this nuisance so that we can negotiate peaceably and equitably? Or shall we fight it out in the high court with all the stink and scandal that would ensue? Again, the secretary appeared to speak with someone off screen. He turned back, looking troubled. Doctor... If the special service police are trying to arrest you, it is news to me. I do not see if you'll listen closely. You'll hear them tromping up my staircase, sir. Mike, Anne, come here. Jubal shoved his chair back to allow the camera angle to include three people. Mr. Secretary, General Douglas, the man from Mars. He did not, of course, introduce Anne, but she and her white cloak of probity were fully in view. Douglas stared at Smith. Smith looked back at him and seemed uneasy. Jubal! Just a moment, Mike. Well, Mr. Secretary, your men have broken into my house. I hear them pounding on my study door this moment. Jubal turned his head. Larry, unbolt the door. Let them in. He put a hand on Mike. Don't get excited, lad, and don't do anything unless I tell you to. Yes, Jubal. That man, I have know him. And he knows you. Over his shoulder, Jubal called out to the now open door. Come in, Sergeant. Right over here. The SS Sergeant standing in the doorway, mob gun at the ready, did not come in. Instead, he called out. Major, here they are, Douglas said. Let me speak to the officer in charge of them, doctor. Again, he spoke off screen. Jubal was relieved to see that the major for whom the sergeant had shouted showed up with his sidearm still in its holster. Mike's shoulder had been trembling under Jubal's hand ever since the sergeant's gun had come into view, and while Jubal lavished no fraternal love on these troopers, he did not want Smith to display his powers and cause awkward questions. The major glanced around the room. You're Jubal Harshaw? Yes. Come over here. Your boss wants you. None of that. You come along. I'm also looking for... Come here. The Secretary General himself wants a word with you. On this phone. 
The SS Major looked startled, then came on into the study around Jubal's desk and in sight of the screen, looked at it, suddenly came smartly to attention and saluted. Douglas nodded. Name, rank, and duty? Sir, Major C.D. Block, Special Service Squadron Cheerio, Maryland Enclave Barracks. Now, tell me what you are doing, where you are, and why. Sir, that's rather complicated. I... Then unravel it for me. Speak up, Major. Yes, sir. I came here pursuant to orders. You see, I don't see. Well, sir, about an hour and a half ago, a flying squad was sent here to make several arrests. They didn't report in when they should have, and when we couldn't raise them by radio, I was sent with the reserve squad to find them and render assistance as needed. Whose orders? Uh, the Commandant, sir. And did you find them? No, sir, not a trace of them. Douglas looked at Harshaw. Counselor, did you see anything of another squad earlier? It's no part of my duties to keep track of your servants, Mr. Secretary. Perhaps they got the wrong address, or simply got lost. That is hardly an answer to my question. You are correct, sir. I am not being interrogated, nor will I be other than by due process. I am acting for my client. I am not nursemaid to these uniformed, uh, persons but I suggest, from what I have seen of them, that they might not be able to find a pig in a bathtub. Hmm, possibly. Major, round up your men and return. I'll confirm that via channels. Yes, sir, the Major saluted. Just a moment, Harshaw said sharply. These men broke into my house. I demand to see their warrant. Oh, Major... Show him your search warrant. Major Block turned brick red. Sir, the officer ahead of me had the warrants. Captain Heinrich, the one who's missing. Douglas stared at him. Young man, do you mean to stand there and tell me that you broke into a citizen's home without a warrant? But, sir, you don't understand. There was a warrant. There are warrants. I saw them. But, of course, Captain Heinrich took them with him. Sir. Douglas just looked at him. Get on back. Place yourself under arrest when you get there. I'll see you later. Yes, sir. Hold it, Harshaw demanded. Under the circumstances, I shan't let him leave. I exercise my right to make a citizen's arrest. I shall take him down and charge him in this township and have him placed in our local lockup. Armed, breaking, and entering. Douglas blinked thoughtfully. Is this necessary, sir? I think it is. These fellows seem to be awfully hard to find when you want them, so I don't want to let this one leave our local jurisdiction. Why, aside from the serious criminal charges, I haven't even had opportunity to assess the damage to my property. You have my assurance, sir, that you will be fully compensated. Thank you, sir. But what is to prevent another uniformed joker from coming along twenty minutes from now, perhaps this time with a warrant? Why, he wouldn't even need to break down the door. My castle stands violated, open to any intruder. Mr. Secretary, only the few precious moments of delay afforded by my once stout door kept this scoundrel from dragging me away before I could reach you by telephone, and you heard him say that there was still another like him at large, with, so he says, warrants. Doctor, I assure you that I know nothing of any such warrant. Warrants, sir. He said warrants for several arrests. Though well, perhaps a better term would be lettre de cachet. 
That's a serious imputation. This is a serious matter. You see what has already been done to me? Doctor, I know nothing of these warrants, if they exist. But I give you my personal assurance that I will look into it at once, find out why they were issued, and act as the merits of the matter may appear. Can I say more? You can say a great deal more, sir. I can reconstruct exactly why those warrants were issued. Someone in your service, in an excess of zeal, caused a pliant judge to issue them, for the purpose of seizing the persons of myself and my guests in order to question us safely out of your sight, out of anyone's sight, sir. We will discuss all issues with you, but we will not be questioned by such as this creature. Jubal hooked a thumb at the SS Major. In some windowless back room. Sir, I hope for and expect justice at your hands. But if those warrants are not cancelled at once, if I am not assured by you personally, beyond any possibility of quibble that the man from Mars... Nurse Boardman and myself will be left undisturbed in our persons, free to come and go, then... Jubal stopped and shrugged helplessly. I must seek a champion elsewhere. There are, as you know, persons and powers outside the administration who hold deep interest in the affairs of the man from Mars. You threaten me. No, sir. I plead with you. I have come to you first. We wish to negotiate, but we cannot speak easily while we are being hounded. I beg of you, sir, call off your dogs. Douglas glanced down, looked up again. Those warrants, if any, will not be served. As soon as I can track them down, they will be cancelled. Thank you, sir. Douglas glanced at Major Block. You still insist on booking him locally? Jubal looked at him contemptuously. Him? Oh, let him go. He's merely a fool in uniform. And let's forget the damages, too. You and I have more serious matters to discuss. You may go, Major. The SS officer saluted and left very abruptly. Douglas continued. Counselor, it is my thought that we now need conversations face to face. The matters you raise can hardly be settled over the telephone. I agree. You and your, uh, client will be my guests at the palace. I'll send my yacht to pick you up. Can you be ready in an hour? Harshaw shook his head. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. But that won't be necessary. We'll sleep here, and when it comes time to meet, I'll dig up a dog sled or something. No need to send your yacht. Mr. Douglas frowned. Come, doctor. As you yourself pointed out, these conversations will be quasi-diplomatic in nature. In proffering proper protocol, I have, in effect, conceded this. Therefore, I must be allowed to provide official hospitality. Well, sir, I might point out that my client has had entirely too much official hospitality already. He had the devil's own time getting shut of it. Douglas' face became rigid. Sir, are you implying... I'm not implying anything. I'm simply saying that Smith has been through quite a lot and is not used to high-level ceremony. He'll sleep sounder here, where he feels at home. And so shall I. I am a crotchety old man, sir, and I prefer my own bed. Or I might point out that our talks may break down and my client and I would be forced to look elsewhere, in which case I would find it embarrassing to be a guest under your roof. The Secretary General looked very grim. Threats again. I thought you trusted me, sir, and I distinctly heard you say that you were... Ready to negotiate. I do trust you, sir. 
about as far as I could throw a fit. And we are indeed ready to negotiate, but I use negotiate in its original sense, not in this newfangled meaning of appeasement. However, we intend to be reasonable, but we can't start talks at once in any case. We're shy, one factor, and we must wait. How long, I don't know. What do you mean? We expect the administration to be represented at these talks by whatever delegation you choose. And we have the same privilege. Surely. But let's keep it small. I shall handle this myself with only an assistant or two. The Solicitor General, I think, and our experts in space law. But to transact business, you require a small group. The smaller, the better. Most certainly. Our group will be small. Smith himself, myself. I'll bring a fair witness. Oh, come now. A witness does not slow things up. I suggest you retain one also. We'll have one or two others, perhaps. But we lack one key man. I have firm instructions from my client that a fellow named Ben Caxton must be present. And I can't find the beggar. Jubal, having spent hours of most complex maneuvering in order to toss in this one remark, now waited with his best poker face to see what would happen. Douglas stared at him. Ben Caxton? Surely you don't mean that cheap Winchell. The Ben Caxton I refer to is a newspaperman. He has a column with one of the syndicates. Absolutely out of the question. Harshaw shook his head. Then that's all, Mr. Secretary. My instructions are firm and give me no leeway. I'm sorry to have wasted your time. I beg to be excused now. He reached out as if to switch off the phone. Hold it. Sir, don't cut that circuit. I'm not through speaking to you. I most humbly beg the Secretary General's pardon. We will, of course, wait until he excuses us. Yes, yes, but never mind the formality. Doctor, do you read the tripe that comes out of this capital labeled as news? Good heavens, no. I wish I didn't have to. It's preposterous to talk about having a journalist present at these talks in any case. We'll let them in later, after everything is settled. But even if we were to have any of them present, Caxton would not be one of them. The man is utterly poisonous, a keyhole sniffer of the worst sort. Mr. Secretary, we have no objection to the full glare of publicity throughout. In fact, we shall insist on it. Ridiculous! Possibly. But I serve my client as I think best. If we reach agreement affecting the man from Mars and the planet which is his home, I want every person on this planet to have opportunity to know exactly how it was done and what was agreed. Contrarywise, if we fail to agree, people must hear how and where the talks broke down. There will be no star chamber proceedings, Mr. Secretary. Damn it, man! I wasn't speaking of a star chamber, and you know it. I simply meant quiet, orderly talks without our elbows being jostled. Then let the press in, sir, through their cameras and microphones. But with their feet and elbows outside. Which reminds me, we will be interviewed, my client and I, over one of the networks later today, and I shall announce that we want full publicity on these coming talks. What? You mustn't give out interviews now. Why, that's contrary to the whole spirit of this discussion. I can't see that it is. We won't discuss this private conversation, of course. But are you suggesting that a private citizen must have your permission to speak to the press? No, of course not, but I'm afraid it's too late in any case. The arrangements have all been made. And the only way you could stop it now would be by sending more carloads of your thugs, with or without warrants. But I'm afraid they would be too late, 
Even so, my only reason for mentioning it is that it occurs to me that you might wish to give out a news release in advance of this coming interview, telling the public that the man from Mars has returned from his retreat in the Andes and is now vacationing in the Poconos, so as to avoid any possible appearance that the government was taken by surprise. You follow me? I follow you. Quite well. The secretary-general stared silently at Harshaw for several moments, then said, Please wait. He left the screen entirely. Harshaw motioned Larry to him while he reached up with his other hand, covered the telephone sound pickup. Look, son, he whispered. With that transceiver out, I'm bluffing on a busted flush. I don't know whether he's left to issue that news release, I suggested, or has gone to set the dogs on us again while he keeps me tied up on the phone. And I won't know either way. You hightail it out of here, get Tom McKenzie on the phone, and tell him that if he doesn't get the set-up here working at once, he's going to miss the biggest story since the fall of Troy. Then be careful coming home. There may be cops crawling out of the cracks. Got it. But how do I call Mackenzie? Uh, Douglas was just sitting back down on screen. Speak to Miriam, git. Dr. Harshaw, I took your suggestion. A news release, much as you worded it, plus a few substantiating details. Douglas smiled warmly in a good simulation of his homespun public persona. And there is no use in half measures. I can see that if you insist on publicity, there is no way to stop you, foolish as it is to hold exploratory talks in public. So I added to the release that the administration had arranged to discuss future interplanetary relations with the man from Mars, as soon as he had rested from his trip, and would do so publicly, quite publicly. His smile became chilly, and he stopped looking like good old Joe Douglas. Harshaw grinned jovially, in honest admiration, why the old thief had managed to roll with the punch and turn a defeat into a coup for the administration. That's just perfect, Mr. Secretary. Much better if such matters come officially from the government. We'll back you right down the line. Thank you. Now about this Caxton person. Letting the press in does not apply to him. He can sit at home, watch it over stereovision, and make up his lies from that. And no doubt he will. But he will not be present at the talks. I'm sorry. No. Then there will be no talk. Mr. Secretary, no matter what you have told the press. I don't believe you understand me, Counselor. This man is offensive to me. Personal privilege. You are correct, sir. It is a matter of personal privilege. Then we'll say no more about it. You misunderstand me. It is indeed personal privilege, but not Yours. Smith's. Eh? You are privileged to select your advisers to be present at these talks, and you can fetch the devil himself, and we shall not complain. Smith is privileged to select his advisers and have them present. If Caxton is not present, we will not be there. In fact, you will find us across the street at some quite different conference, one where you won't be welcome, even if you speak fluent Hindi. Now, do you understand me? There was a long silence, during which Harshaw thought clinically that a man of Douglas' age really should not indulge in such evident rage. Douglas did not leave the screen, but he consulted off-screen and silently. At last he spoke to the man from Mars. Mike had stayed on screen the whole time, as silently and at least as patiently as the witness. Douglas said to him, Smith 
Why do you insist on this ridiculous condition? Harshaw put a hand on Mike and said instantly, Don't answer, Mike. Then to Douglas, Tut, tut, Mr. Secretary. The cannons, please. You may not inquire why my client has instructed me. And let me add that the canons are violated with exceptional grievance in that my client has but lately learned English and cannot be expected to hold his own against you. If you will first take the trouble to learn Martian, I may permit you to put the question again, in his language. Or I may not, but certainly not today. Douglas sighed. Very well. It might be pertinent to inquire into what cannons you have played fast and loose with, too. But I haven't time. I have a government to run. I yield. But don't expect me to shake hands with this Caxton. As you wish, sir. Now back to the first point. We are held up. I haven't been able to find Caxton. His office says that he is out of town. Douglas laughed. That's hardly my problem. You insisted on a privilege, one I find personally offensive. Bring whom you like, but round them up yourself. Reasonable, sir, very reasonable. But would you be willing to do the man from Mars a favor? Eh? What favor? The talks will not begin until Caxton is located. That is flat and is not subject to argument. But I have not been able to find him, and my client is getting restive. I am merely a private citizen, but you have resources. What do you mean? Some minutes ago I spoke rather disparagingly of the special service squadrons. Check it off to the not unnatural irk of a man who has just had his front door broken down. But in truth I know that they can be amazingly efficient. And they have the ready cooperation of police forces everywhere, local, state, national, and all Federation departments and bureaus. Mr. Secretary, if you were to call in your SS Commandant and tell him that you were anxious to locate a certain man as quickly as was humanly possible, well, sir, it would produce more meaningful activity in the next hour than I myself could hope to produce in a century. Why on earth? Should I alert all police forces everywhere to find one scandal-mongering reporter? Not on Earth, my dear sir. On Mars. I asked you to regard this as a favor to the man from Mars. Well, it's a preposterous request, but I'll go along. Douglas looked directly at Mike. As a favor to Smith only. But I shall expect similar cooperation when we get down to cases. You have my assurance that it will ease the situation enormously. Well, I can't promise anything. You say the man is missing. If he is, he may have fallen in front of a truck. He may be dead. And I, for one, would not mourn. Harshaw looked very grave. Let us hope not, for all of our sakes. What do you mean? I've tried to point out that sad possibility to my client, but it is like shouting into the wind. He simply won't listen to the idea. Harshaw sighed. A shambles, sir. If we can't find this Caxton, that is what we will both have on our hands. A shambles. Well, I'll try. But don't expect miracles, doctor. Not I, sir. My client. He has the Martian viewpoint, and he does expect miracles. So let's pray for one. You'll hear from me. That's all I can say. Harshaw bowed without getting up. Your servant, sir. As the Secretary General's image cleared from the screen, Jubal sighed and stood up, and at once found Jillian's arms around his neck. Oh, Jubal, you were wonderful! We aren't out of the woods yet, child. I know, but if anything can save Ben, you've just done it. She kissed him. Hey, none of that stuff. I swore off smooching before you were born. 
so kindly show respect for my years. He kissed her carefully and thoroughly. That's just to take the taste of Douglas out of my mouth. Between kicking him and kissing him, I was getting nauseated. Now go smooch Mike instead. He deserves it for holding still to my damned lies. Oh, I shall. Jill let go of Harshaw, put her arms around the man from Mars. Such wonderful lies, Jubal. She kissed Mike. Jubal watched with deep interest as Mike initiated a second section of the kiss himself, performing it very solemnly, but not quite as a novice. Clumsy, Harshaw decided, but he did not bump noses nor hang back. Harshaw awarded him a B- minus with an A for effort. Son, he said, you continue to amaze me. I would have expected that to cause you to curl up in one of your faints. I so did, Mike answered seriously, without letting go of Jill. On the first kissing time. Well. Congratulations, Jill. A.C. or D.C.? She looked at Harshaw. Jubal, you're a tease, but I love you anyhow, and refuse to let you get my goat. Mike got a little upset once, but no longer, as you can see. Yes, Mike agreed. It is a goodness. For Water Brothers, it is a growing closer. I will show you. Yes? He let go of Jill. Jubal hastily put up a palm. No. No? Don't be hurt. But you would be disappointed, son. It's a growing closer for Water Brothers only if they are young girls and pretty, such as Jill. My brother Jubal, you speak rightly? I speak very rightly. Kiss girls all you want to. It beats the hell out of card games. Beg pardon? It's a fine way to grow closer, but just with girls. Hmm. Jubal looked around the room. I wonder if that first-time phenomenon would repeat. Dorcas, I want your help in a scientific experiment. Boss, I am not a guinea pig. You go to hell. In due course I shall. Don't be difficult, girl. Mike has no communicable diseases, or I wouldn't let him use the pool. Which reminds me. Miriam, when Larry gets back, tell him I want the pool drained and refilled tonight. We're through with murkiness. Well, Dorcas? How do you know it would be our first time? Hmm. There's that. Mike, have you ever kissed Dorcas? No, Jubal. Only today did I learn that Dorcas is my water brother. She is? Yes. Dorcas and Anne and Miriam and Larry. They are your water brothers, my brother Jubal. Mm, yes. Correct in essence. Yes, it is essence, the grokking, not sharing of water. I speak rightly? Very rightly, Mike. They are your water brothers. Mike paused to think words. In a catenative assemblage, they are my brothers. Mike looked at Dorcas. For brothers, growing closer is good. But I did not know. Jubal said, Well, Dorcas? Huh? Oh, heavens! Boss, you're the world's worst tease. But Mike isn't teasing. He's sweet. She walked up to him, stood on tiptoes, and held up her arms. Kiss me, Mike. Mike did. For some seconds they grew closer. Dorcas fainted. Jubal spotted it and kept her from falling, Mike being far too inexperienced to cope with it. Then Jill had to speak sharply to Mike, to keep him from trembling into withdrawal when he saw what had happened to Dorcas. Luckily, Dorcas came out of it shortly and was able to reassure Mike that she was all right, that she had indeed grown closer and would happily grow closer again, but she needed to catch her breath. Whew. 
Miriam had watched round-eyed. I wonder if I dare risk it. Anne said, By seniority, please. Boss, are you through with me as a witness? For the time being, at least. Then hold my cloak. She slipped out of it. Want to bet on it? Which way? I'll give you seventy-two. I don't faint. But I wouldn't mind losing. Done. Dollars, not hundreds. Mike, dear, let's grow lots closer. In time, Anne was forced to give up through simple hypoxia, although Mike, with his Martian training, could have gone without oxygen much longer. She gasped for air and said, I don't think I was set just right. Boss, I'm going to give you another chance for your money. She started to offer her face again, but Miriam tapped her on the shoulder. Out. Don't be so eager. Out, I said. The foot of the line for you, wench. Miriam insisted. Oh, well. Anne pecked Mike hastily and gave way. Miriam moved in, smiled at him, and said nothing. It was not necessary. They grew close and continued to grow closer. Front! Miriam looked around. Boss, can't you see I'm busy? All right, all right, but get out of the pickup angle. I'll answer the phone myself. Honest, I didn't even hear it. Obviously, but for a while we've got to pretend to a modicum of dignity around here. It might be the Secretary General, so get out of range. But it was Mr. Mackenzie. Jubal, what in the devil is going on? Trouble? A short while ago I got a wild phone call from a young man claiming to speak for you who urged me to drop everything and get cracking because you finally got something for me since I had already ordered a mobile unit to your place. Never got here. I know. They called in after wandering around somewhere north of you. Our dispatcher straightened them out and they should be there any moment now. I tried twice to call you and your circuit was busy. What have I missed? Nothing yet. Jubal considered it. Damnation. He should have had someone monitor the babble box. Had Douglas actually made that news release? Was Douglas committed? Or would a new passel of cops show up? While the kids played post office. Jubal, you're getting senile. I'm not sure that there's going to be just yet. Has there been anything special in the way of a news flash this past hour? Why, no. Oh, one item. The palace announced that the man from Mars had returned north and was vacationing in the... Jubal, are you mixed up in that? Just a moment. Mike, come to the phone and grab your robe. Got it, boss. Mr. McKenzie, meet the man from Mars. Mackenzie's jaw dropped. Then his professional reflexes came to his aid. Hold it! Just hold it right there, and let me get a camera on this. We'll pick it up in flat, right off the phone. And we'll repeat in stereo, just as quick as those jokers of mine get there. Jubal, I'm safe on this. You wouldn't... you wouldn't... Would I swindle you with a fair witness at my elbow? Yes, I would if necessary. But I'm not forcing this interview on you. Matter of fact, we should wait and tie in Argus and Transplanet. Jubal, you can't do this to me. And I won't. The agreement with all of you was to monitor what the cameras saw when I signaled. And use it if it was newsworthy. But I didn't promise not to give out interviews in addition to that. And News World can have this interview, oh, say, thirty minutes ahead of Argus and Trans P, if you want it. Jubal added, Not only did you loan us all the equipment for the tie-in, but you've been very helpful personally, Tom. I can't express how helpful you've been. You mean, uh, 
That telephone number? Correct. And it got results? It did. But no questions about that, Tom. Not on the air. Ask me privately. Next year. Oh, I wouldn't think of it. You keep your lip buttoned and I'll keep mine. Now, don't go away. One more thing. That spool of messages you're holding for me against the same signal. Make damn sure they don't go out. Send them back to me. Eh? All right, all right. I've been keeping them in my desk. You were so fussy about it. Jubal, I've got a camera on this phone screen right now. Can we start? Shoot. And I'm going to do this one myself. Mackenzie turned his face away and apparently looked at the camera. Flash News. This is your NW NW reporter on the spot while it's hot. The man from Mars has just phoned you right here in your local station and wants to talk to you. Cut. Monitor. Insert Flash News plug and acknowledgement to sponsor. Jubal, anything special I should ask him? Don't ask him questions about South America. He's not a tourist. Swimming is your safest subject. You can ask me about his future plans. Okay. End of cut. Friends, you are now face-to-face -face and voice-to-voice -voice with Valentine Michael Smith, the man from Mars. As NWNW, always first with the burst, told you earlier, Mr. Smith has just returned from his solitary retreat high in the Andes, and we welcome him back. Wave to your friends, Mr. Smith. Wave at the telephone, son. Smile and wave at it. Thank you, Valentine Michael Smith. We're all happy to see you looking so healthy and tan. I understand that you have been gathering strength by learning to swim. Boss, visitors or something. Cut before interruption, after the word swim. What the hell, Jubal? I'll have to see. Jill, ride herd on Mike again. It might be general quarters. But it was not. It was the NWNW mobile stereovision unit landing. And again, rose bushes were damaged. Larry returning from phoning Mackenzie from the village, and Duke returning. Mackenzie decided to finish the flat black-and-white interview quickly, since he was now assured of depth and color through his mobile unit, and in the meantime its technical crew could check the trouble with the equipment on loan to Jubal. Larry and Duke went with them. The interview was finished with inanities, Jubal fielding any questions Mike failed to understand. Mackenzie signed off with a promise to the public that a color and depth special interview with the man from Mars would follow in thirty minutes. Stay synced with this station. He stayed on the phone and waited for his technicians to report, which the crew boss did almost at once. Nothing wrong with that transceiver, Mr. Mackenzie, nor with any part of this field setup. Then what was wrong with it before? The technician glanced at Larry and Duke, then grinned. Nothing. But it helps quite a bit to put power through it. The breaker was open at the board. Harshaw intervened to stop a wrangle between Larry and Duke, one which seemed concerned with the relative merits of various sorts of idiocy more than with the question of whether Duke had or had not told Larry that a certain tripped circuit breaker must be reset if it was anticipated that the borrowed equipment was going to be used. The showman's aspect of Jubal's personality regretted that the finest unrehearsed spectacular since Elijah bested the priests of Baal had been missed by the cameras. But the political finagler in him was relieved that mischance had kept Mike's curious talents still a close secret. Jubal anticipated that he still might need them as a secret weapon, not to mention the undesirability of trying to explain to skeptical strangers the present whereabouts of certain policemen plus two squad cars. As for the rest, it merely confirmed his own conviction that science and invention had reached its peak with the Model T Ford and had been growing steadily more decadent ever since. And besides, Mackenzie wanted to get on with the depth and color interview. 
They got through that with a minimum of rehearsing, Jubal simply making sure that no question would be asked which could upset the public fiction that the man from Mars had just returned from South America. Mike sent greetings to his friends and brothers of the champion, including one to Dr. Mahmoud, delivered in croaking, throat-rasping Martian. Jubal decided that Mackenzie had his money's worth. At last, the household could quiet down. Jubal set the telephone for two hours' refusal, stood up, stretched, sighed, and felt a great weariness, wondered if he were getting old. Where's dinner? Which one of you wenches was supposed to get dinner tonight? And why didn't you? Gad, this household is falling to rack and ruin. It was my turn to get dinner tonight, Jill answered, but... Excuses, always excuses. Boss, Anne interrupted sharply. How do you expect anyone to cook when you've kept every single one of us penned up here in your study all afternoon? That's the moose's problem, Jubal said dourly. I want it clearly understood that... Even if Armageddon is held on these premises, I expect meals to be a hot and on time, right up to the ultimate trump. Furthermore, furthermore, Anne completed. It is now only 7.40 and plenty of time to have dinner by eight. So quit yelping, boss, until you have something to yelp about. Cry, baby. Is it really only twenty minutes of eight? Seems like a week since lunch. Anyhow, you haven't left me a civilized amount of time to have a pre-dinner drink. Poor you. Somebody get me a drink. Get everybody a drink. On second thought, let's skip a formal dinner tonight and drink our dinners. I feel like getting as tight as a tent rope on a rainy day. Anne? How are we fixed for Schmorgasburg? Plenty. Then why not thaw out eighteen or nineteen kinds and spread them around and let anybody eat what he feels like when he feels like it? What's all the argument about? Right away, agreed Jill, and stopped to kiss him on his bald spot. Boss, you've done nobly. We'll feed you and get you drunk and put you to bed. Wait, Jill, I'm going to help. I may to help, too, Smith said eagerly. Sure, Mike, you can carry trays. Boss, dinner will be by the pool. It's a hot night. How else? When they had left, Jubal said to Duke, Where the hell have you been all day? Thinking. Doesn't pay to. Just makes you discontented with what you see around you. Any results? Yes, said Duke. I've decided that what Mike eats or doesn't eat is no business of mine. Congratulations. A desire not to butt into other people's business is at least 80% of all human wisdom, and the other 20% isn't very important. You butt into other people's business all the time who said I was wise. I'm a professional bad example. You can learn a lot by watching me or listening to me, either one. Jubal, if I walked up to Mike and offered him a glass of water, do you suppose he would go through that lodge routine? I feel certain that he would. Duke, Almost the only human characteristic Mike seems to possess is an overwhelming desire to be liked. But I want to make sure that you know how serious it is to him. Much more serious than getting married. I myself accepted water brotherhood with Mike before I understood it, and I've become more and more deeply entangled with its responsibilities the more I've grokked it. You'll be committing yourself never to lie to him, never to mislead or deceive him in any way, to stick by him come what may, because that is just what he will do with you. Better think about it. I have been thinking about it all day. Jubal, there's something about Mike that makes you want to take care of him. 
I know. You've probably never encountered complete honesty before. I know I hadn't. Innocence. Mike has never tasted the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So we who have don't understand what makes him tick. Well, on your own head, Bit. I hope you never regret it. Jubal looked up. Oh, there you are. I thought you had stopped to distill the stuff, Larry answered. Couldn't find a corkscrew at first. Machinery again. Why didn't you bite the neck off? Duke, you'll find some glasses stashed behind the anatomy of melancholy up there. I know where you hide them. And we'll all have a quick one, neat, before we get down to serious drinking. Duke got the glasses. Jubal poured and held up his own. The golden sunshine of Italy congealed into tears. Here's to alcoholic brotherhood, much more suited to the frail human soul, if any, than any other sort. Health! Cheers! Jubal poured his slowly down his throat. Ah, he said happily and belched. Offer some of that to Mike afterwards, Duke, and let him learn how good it is to be human. Makes me feel creative. Front! Why are those girls never around when I need them? Front! I'm still front, Miriam answered at the door. But I know, and I was saying, to what strange, bittersweet fate my tomboy ambition... But I finished that story while you were chatting on the telephone with the Secretary General. Then you are no longer front. Send it off. Don't you want to read it first? Anyhow, I've got to revise it. Kissing Mike gave me a new insight on it. Jubal shuddered. Read it? Good God, no. It's bad enough to write such a thing, and don't even consider revising it, certainly not to fit the facts. My child, a true confession story should never be tarnished by any taint of truth. Okay, boss. And Anne says, if you want to come down to the pool and have a bite before you eat, come on. I can't think of a better time. Shall we adjourn to the terrace, gentlemen? At the pool, the party progressed liquidly, with bits of fish and other Scandinavian high-caloric comestibles added to taste. At Jubal's invitation, Mike tried brandy, somewhat cut with water, Mike found the resulting sensation extremely disquieting, so he analyzed his trouble, added oxygen to the ethanol in an inner process of reversed fermentation, and converted it to glucose and water, which gave him no trouble. Jubal had been observing with interest the effect of his first drink of liquor on the man from Mars, saw him become drunk almost at once, saw him sober up even more quickly. In an attempt to understand what had happened, Jubal urged more brandy on Mike, which he readily accepted since his water brother offered it. Mike sopped up an extravagant quantity of fine imported liquor before Jubal was willing to concede that it was impossible to get him drunk. Such was not the case with Jubal, despite his years of pickling Staying sociable with Mike during the experiment dulled the edge of his wits. So, when he attempted to ask Mike what he had done, Mike thought that he was inquiring about the events during the raid by the SS, concerning which Mike still felt latent guilt. He tried to explain, and if needed, receive Jubal's pardon. Jubal interrupted when at last he figured out what the boy was talking about. Son, I don't want to know what you did, nor how you did it. What you did was just what was needed. Perfect, just perfect, but... He blinked owlishly. Don't tell me about it. Don't ever tell anybody about it. Not? Not. It was the damnedest thing I've seen since my uncle with the two heads debated free silver and triumphantly refuted himself. An explanation would spoil it. I do not grok rightly. Nor do I. So let's not worry. 
and have another drink. Reporters and other newsmen started arriving while the party was still climbing. Jubal received each of them with courteous dignity, invited them to eat, drink, and relax, but to refrain from badgering himself or the man from Mars. Those who failed to heed his injunction were tossed into the pool. At first, Jubal kept Larry and Duke at flank to administer the baptism as necessary. But while some of the unfortunate importunates became angry and threatened various things which did not interest Jubal, other than to caution Mike not to take any steps, others relaxed to the inevitable and added themselves to the dousing squad on a volunteer basis with the fanatic enthusiasm of proselytes. Jubal had to stop them from ducking the doyen Lipman of the New York Times for a third time. During the evening, Dorcas came out of the house, sought out Jubal, and whispered in his ear, Telephone, boss, for you. Take a message. You must answer it, boss. I'll answer it with an axe. Duke, get me an axe. I've been intending to get rid of that Iron Maiden for some time, and tonight I'm in the mood for it. Boss, you want to answer this one. It's the man you spoke to for quite a long time this afternoon. Oh. Why didn't you say so? Jubal lumbered upstairs, made sure his study door was bolted behind him, went to the phone. Another of Douglas' sleek acolytes was on the screen, but was replaced quickly by Douglas. It took you long enough to answer your phone. It's my phone, Mr. Secretary. Sometimes I don't answer it at all. So it would seem. Why didn't you tell me that this Caxton fellow is an alcoholic? Is he? He certainly is. He isn't missing. Not in the usual sense. He's been off on one of his periodic benders. He was located sleeping it off in a flea bag in Sonora. I'm glad to hear that he has been found. Thank you, sir. He's been picked up on a technical charge of vagrancy. The charge won't be pressed. Instead, we are releasing him to you. I am very much in your debt, sir. Oh, it's not entirely a favor. I'm having him delivered to you in the state in which he was found, filthy, unshaven, and, I understand, smelling like a brewery. I want you to see for yourself what sort of a tramp he is. Very well, sir. When may I expect him? Almost at once, I fancy. A courier arrow left Nogales some time ago. At Mach 3 or better, it should be overhead soon. The pilot has instructions to deliver him to you and get a receipt. He shall have it. Now, Counselor, having delivered him, I wash my hands of it. I shall expect you and your client to appear for talks, whether you fetch along that drunken libeler or not. Agreed. When? Shall we say tomorrow at ten? Here. "'Twere best done quickly. Agreed.' Jubal went back downstairs and paused at his broken door. "'Jill! Come here, child.' "'Yes, Jubal.' She trotted toward him, a reporter in close formation with her. Jubal waved the man back. "'Private!' he said firmly. "'Family matter. Go have a drink.' Whose family? A death in yours, if you insist. Scat! The newsman grinned and accepted it. Jubal leaned over Jillian and said softly, It worked. He's safe. Ben? Yes. He'll be here soon. Oh, Jubal! She started to bawl. He took her shoulders. Stop it! he said firmly. Go inside and lock your door until you get control of yourself. This is not for the press. Yes, Jubal, yes, boss. That's better. Go cry in your pillow, then wash your face. He went on out to the pool. Quiet, everybody, quiet! I have an announcement to make. We've enjoyed having you, but the party is over. Boo! Toss him in the pool, somebody. 
I've got work to do early tomorrow morning. I'm an old man, and I need my rest. And so does my family. Please leave quietly and as quickly as possible. Black coffee for any who need it, but that's all. Duke, cork those bottles. Girls, clear the food away. There was minor grumbling, but the more responsible quieted their colleagues. In ten minutes, they were alone. In twenty minutes, Ben Caxton arrived. The SS officer commanding the courier car silently accepted Harshaw's signature and thumbprint on a prepared receipt, then left at once while Jewel continued to sob on Ben's shoulder. Jubal looked him over in the light from the pool. Ben, you're a mess. I hear you've been drunk for a week, and you look it. Ben cursed fluently and well while continuing to pat Jill's back. Mm, drunk? All right, but haven't had a drink. What happened? I don't know. I don't know. An hour later, Ben's stomach had been pumped out. Alcohol and gastric juices, no food. Jubal had given him shots to offset alcohol and barbiturates. He was bathed, shaved, dressed in clean clothes that did not fit him, had met the man from Mars, and was sketchily brought up to date while ingesting milk and bland food. But he was unable to bring them up to date. For Ben, the past week had not happened. He had become unconscious in a taxi cab in Washington. He had been shaken into drunken wakefulness two hours earlier. Of course I know what happened. They kept me doped and in a completely dark room and wrung me out. I vaguely remember some of it, but I can't prove anything. And there's the village Hefe and the madam of this dive they took me to, plus I'm sure plenty of other witnesses to swear just how this gringo spent his time. And there's nothing I can do about it. Then don't fight it, Jubal advised. Relax and be happy. The hell I will. I'll get that. Tut, tut, you've won, Ben, and you're alive, which I would have given long odds against earlier today. Douglas is going to do exactly what we want him to, and smile and like it. I want to talk about that. I think, I think you're going to bed. Now, with a glass of warm milk to conceal old Doc Harshaw's secret ingredient for secret drinkers. Shortly thereafter, Caxton was in bed and beginning to snore. Jubal was puttering around, heading for bed himself, and encountered Anne in the upper hall. He shook his head tiredly. Quite a day, lass. Yes, quite. I wouldn't have missed it, and I don't want to repeat it. You go to bed, boss. In a moment. Anne, tell me something. What's so special about the way that lad kisses? Anne looked dreamy and then dimpled. You should have tried it when he invited you to. I'm too old to change my ways, but I'm interested in everything about the boy. Is this actually something different, too? Anne pondered it. Yes. How? Mike gives a kiss, his whole attention. Oh, rats. I do myself. Or did. Anne shook her head. No, some men try to. I've been kissed by men who did a very good job of it indeed. But they don't really give kissing a woman their whole attention. They can't. No matter how hard they try, some parts of their minds are on something else. Missing the last bus, maybe, or how their chances are for making the gal, or their own techniques in kissing, or maybe worry about their jobs or money, or will husband or papa or the neighbors catch on, or something. Now, Mike doesn't have any technique, but when Mike kisses you, he isn't doing anything else, not anything. You're his whole universe for that moment. And the moment is eternal because he doesn't have any plans and he isn't going anywhere, just kissing you. She shivered. 
a woman notices. It's overwhelming. Hmm. Don't hmm at me, you old lecher. You don't understand. No, and I'm sorry to say I probably never will. Well, good night. And, oh, by the way, I told Mike to bolt his door tonight. She made a face at him. Spoil sport. He's learning quite fast enough. Mustn't rush him. Eighteen. The conference was postponed to the afternoon, then quickly re-postponed to the following morning, which gave Caxton an extra twenty-four hours of badly needed recuperation, a chance to hear in detail about his missing week, a chance to grow closer with the man from Mars. For Mike grokked at once that Jill and Ben were water brothers, consulted Jill about it, and solemnly offered water to Ben. Ben had been adequately briefed by Jill. He accepted it just as solemnly and without mental reservations. After soul-searching in which he decided that his own destiny was in truth interwoven with that of the man from Mars, through his own initiative before he ever met Mike, Ben had had to chase down, in the crannies of his soul, one uneasy feeling before he was able to do this. He at last decided that it was simple jealousy, and, being such, had to be cauterized. He had discovered that he felt irked at the closeness between Mike and Jill. His own bachelor persona, he learned, had been changed by a week of undead oblivion. He found that he wanted to be married, and to Jill. He proposed to her again without a trace of joking about it as soon as he got her alone. Jill had looked away. Please, Ben. Why not? I'm solvent. I've got a fairly good job. I'm in good health. Or I will be as soon as I get their condemned truth drugs washed out of my system. And since I haven't quite, I feel an overpowering compulsion to tell the truth right now. I love you. I want you to marry me and let me rub your poor, tired feet. So why not? I don't have any vices that you don't share with me, and we get along together better than most married couples. Am I too old for you? I'm not that old. Or are you planning to marry somebody else? No, neither one. Dear Ben, Ben, I love you. But don't ask me to marry you now. I have responsibilities. He could not shake her firmness. Admittedly, Mike was more nearly Jill's age, almost exactly her age, in fact, which made Ben slightly more than ten years older than they were. But he believed Jill when she denied that age was a factor. The age difference wasn't too great, and it helped, all things considered, for a husband to be older than his wife. But he finally realized that the man from Mars couldn't be a rival. He was simply Jill's patient. And at that point, Ben accepted that a man who marries a nurse must live with the fact that nurses feel maternal toward their charges. Live with it and like it, he added. For if Jillian had not had the character that made her a nurse, he would not love her. It was not the delightful figure eight in which her pert fanny waggled when she walked, nor even the still pleasanter and very mammalian view from the other direction. He was not, thank God, the permanently infantile type, interested solely in the size of the mammary glands. No, it was Jill herself he loved. Since what she was would make it necessary for him to take second place from time to time to patients who needed her, unless she retired, of course, and he could not be sure it would stop completely even then, Jill being Jill. Then he was bloody be damned, not going to start by being jealous of the patient she had now. Mike was a nice kid, just as innocent and guileless as Jill had described him to be. And besides, he wasn't offering Jill any bed of roses. 
The wife of a working newspaper man had things to put up with, too. He might be, he would be, gone for weeks at times, and his hours were always irregular. He wouldn't like it if Jill bitched about it, but Jill wouldn't, not Jill. Having reached this summing up, Ben accepted the water ceremony from Mike wholeheartedly. Jubal needed the extra day to plan tactics. Ben, when you dumped this hot potato in my lap, I told Jillian that I would not lift a finger to get this boy his so-called rights. But I've changed my mind. We're not going to let the government have the swag. Certainly not this administration, nor any other administration, as the next one will probably be worse. Ben, you undervalue Joe Douglas. He's a cheap courthouse politician with morals to match. Yes, and besides that, he's ignorant to six decimal places. But he is also a fairly able and usually conscientious world chief executive, better than we could expect and probably better than we deserve. I would enjoy a session of poker with him, for he wouldn't cheat and he wouldn't welch, and he would pay up with a smile. Oh, he's an S.O.B. But you can read that as swell old boy, too. He's middle and decent. Jubal, I'm damned if I understand you. You told me yesterday that you had been fairly certain that Douglas had had me killed, and believe me, it wasn't far from it, and that you had juggled eggs to get me out alive, if by any chance I still was alive, and you did get me out, and God knows I'm grateful to you. But do you expect me to forget that Douglas was behind it all? It's none of his doing that I'm alive. He would rather see me dead. I suppose he would, but, yep, just that. Forget it. I'm damned if I will. You'll be silly if you don't. In the first place, you can't prove anything. In the second place, there's no call for you to be grateful to me, and I won't let you lay this burden on me. I didn't do it for you. Huh? I did it for a little girl who was about to go charging out and maybe get herself killed much the same way. If I didn't do something, I did it because she was my guest, and I temporarily stood in loco parentis to her. I did it because she was all guts and gallantry, but too ignorant to be allowed to monkey with such a buzz saw. She'd get hurt. But you, my cynical and sin-stained chum, know all about those buzz saws. If your own asinine carelessness caused you to back into one, who am I to tamper with your karma? You picked it. Hmm. I see your point. Okay, Jubal, you can go to hell for monkeying with my karma, if I have one. A moot point. The predestinationers and the free willers were still tied in the fourth quarter, last I heard. Either way, I have no wish to disturb a man sleeping in a gutter. I assume, until proved otherwise, that he belongs there. Most do-gooding reminds me of treating hemophilia. The only real cure for hemophilia is to let hemophiliacs bleed to death before they breed more hemophiliacs. You could sterilize them. You would have me play God. But we're veering off the subject. Douglas didn't try to have you assassinated. Says who? Says the infallible Jubal Harshaw, speaking ex cathedra from his belly button. See here, son. If a deputy sheriff beats a prisoner to death, it's sweepstakes odds that the county commissioners didn't order it, didn't know it, and wouldn't have permitted it had they known. At worst, they shut their eyes to it. Afterward rather than upset their own apple carts. But assassination has never been an accepted policy in this country. I'd like to show you the backgrounds of quite a number of deaths I've looked into. 
Jubal waved it aside. I said it wasn't a policy. We've always had political assassination, from prominent ones like Huey Long to men beaten to death on their own front steps with hardly a page eight story in passing. But it's never been a policy here, and the reason you are sitting in the sunshine right now is that it is not Joe Douglas' policy. Consider. They snatched you clean. No fuss. No inquiries. They squeezed you dry. Then they had no more use for you, and they could have disposed of you as quietly as flushing a dead mouse down a toilet. But they didn't. Why not? because they knew their boss didn't really like for them to play that rough. And if he became convinced that they had, whether in court or out, it would cost their jobs, if not their necks. Jubal paused for a swig. But consider. Those SS thugs are just a tool. They aren't yet a Praetorian guard that picks the new Caesar. Such being, whom do you really want for Caesar? Courthouse Joe, whose basic indoctrination goes back to the days when this country was a nation, and not just a satrapy and a polyglot empire of many traditions. Douglas, who really can't stomach assassination? Or do you want to toss him out of office? We can, you know, tomorrow. Just by double-crossing him on the deal, I've led him to expect. Toss him out and thereby put in a secretary general from a land where life has always been cheap and political assassination, a venerable tradition. If you do this, Ben, tell me what happens to the next snoopy newsman who is careless enough to walk down a dark alley. Caxton didn't answer. As I said, the SS is just a tool. Men are always for hire who like dirty work. How dirty will that work become if you nudge Douglas out of his majority? Jubal, are you telling me that I ought not to criticize the administration when they're wrong, when I know they're wrong? Nope. Gadflies such as yourself are utterly necessary. Nor am I opposed to turning the rascals out. It's usually the soundest rule of politics. But it's well to take a look at what new rascals you are going to get before you jump at any chance to turn your present rascals out. Democracy is a poor system of government at best. The only thing that can honestly be said in its favor is that it is about eight times as good as any other method the human race has ever tried. Democracy's worst fault is that its leaders are likely to reflect the faults and virtues of their constituents. A depressingly low level. But what else can you expect? So take a look at Douglas and ponder that, in his ignorance, stupidity, and self-seeking, he much resembles his fellow Americans, including you and me. And that, in fact, he is a notch or two above the average. Then take a look at the man who will replace him if his government topples. There's precious little choice. There's always a choice. This one is a choice between bad and worse which is a difference much more poignant than that between good and better. Well, Jubal, what do you expect me to do? Nothing, Harshaw answered, because I intend to run this show myself, or almost nothing. I expect you to refrain from chewing out Joe Douglas over this coming settlement in that daily poop you write. Maybe even praise him a little for statesmanlike restraint. You're making me vomit. Not in the grass, please. Use your hat. 
because I'm going to tell you ahead of time what I'm going to do and why, and why Joe Douglas is going to agree to it. The first principle in riding a tiger is to hang on tight to its ears. Quit being pompous. What's the deal? Quit being obtuse and listen. If this boy were a penniless nobody, there would be no problem. But he has the misfortune to be indisputably the heir to more wealth than Croesus ever dreamed of. Plus a highly disputable claim to political power, even greater through a politico-judicial precedent unparalleled in pure jug-headedness. Since the time Secretary Fall was convicted of receiving a bribe that Doheny was acquitted of having given him. Yes, but I have the floor. As I told Jill, I have no slightest interest in true prince nonsense, nor do I regard all that wealth as his. He didn't produce a shilling of it. Even if he had earned it himself, impossible at his age, Property is not the natural and obvious and inevitable concept that most people think it is. Come again? Ownership of anything is an extremely sophisticated abstraction, a mystical relationship, truly. God knows our legal theorists make this mystery complicated enough, but I didn't begin to see how subtle it was until I got the Martian's slant on it. Martians don't have property. They don't own anything. Not even their own bodies. Wait a minute, Jubal. Even animals have property. And the Martians aren't animals. They're a highly developed civilization with great cities and all sorts of things. Yes. Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests. And nobody understands a property line, and the meus et tuus involved better than a watchdog. But not Martians. Unless you regard an undistributed joint ownership of everything by a few millions or billions of senior citizens, ghosts to you, my friend, as being property. Say, Jubal, how about these old ones Mike talks about? Do you want the official version, or my private opinion? Huh? Your private opinion, what you really think. Then keep it to yourself. I think it is a lot of pious poppycot, suitable for enriching lawns. I think it is a superstition burned into the boy's brain at so early an age that he stands no chance of ever breaking loose from it. Jill talks as if she believed it. At all other times you will hear me talk as if I believed it too. Ordinary politeness. One of my most valued friends believes in astrology. I would never offend her by telling her what I think of it. The capacity of a human mind to believe devoutly in what seems to me to be the highly improbable, from table-tapping to the superiority of their own children, has never been plumbed. Faith strikes me as intellectual laziness, but I don't argue with it, especially as I am rarely in a position to prove that it is mistaken. Negative proof is usually impossible. Mike's faith in his old ones is surely no more irrational than a conviction that the dynamics of the universe can be set aside through prayers for rain. Furthermore, he has the weight of evidence on his side. He has been there. I haven't. Hmm, Jubal, I'll confess to a sneaking suspicion that immortality is a fact, but I'm glad that my grandfather's ghost doesn't continue to exercise any control over me. He was a cranky old devil. And so was mine. And so am I. But is there any really good reason why a citizen's franchise should be voided simply because he happens to be dead? Come to think of it, the precinct I was raised in had a very large graveyard vote. Almost Martian. Yet the town was a pleasant one to live in. 
as may be, our lad Mike can't own anything because the old ones already own everything. So you see why I have had trouble explaining to him that he owns over a million shares of Lunar Enterprises, plus the Lyle Drive, plus assorted chattels and securities. It doesn't help that the original owners are dead. That makes it worse. They are old ones, and Mike wouldn't dream of sticking his nose into the business of old ones. Ah, uh, damn it. He's obviously legally incompetent. Of course he is. He can't manage property because he doesn't believe in its mystique any more than I believe in his ghosts. Ben, all that Mike owns at the present time is a toothbrush I gave him, and he doesn't know he owns that. If you took it away from him, he wouldn't object. He wouldn't even mention it to me. He would simply assume conclusively that the old ones had authorized the check. Jubal sighed. So he is incompetent, even though he can recite the law of property verbatim. Such being the case, I shan't allow his competency to be tried, nor even mentioned. For what guardian would be appointed? Huh? Douglas? Or rather, one of his stooges? Are you certain, Ben? Consider the present make-up of the High Court. Might not the appointed guardian be named Savonavong, or Nadi, or Ki? Ah, uh, you could be right. In which case the lad might not live very long, or he might live to a ripe old age in some pleasantly gardened prison for one, a great deal more difficult to escape from than Bethesda Hospital. What do you plan to do? The power the boy nominally owns is far too dangerous and cumbersome for him to handle. So we throw it away. How the hell do you go about giving away that much money? You don't. You can't. It's impossible. The very act of giving it away would be an exercise of its latent power. It would change the balance of power, and any attempt to do so would cause the boy to be examined on his competence to manage in jig time. So, instead, we let the tiger run like hell while hanging on to its ears for dear life. Ben, let me outline... The fait accompli I intend to hand to Douglas. Then you do your damnest to pick holes in it. Not the legality of it. As Douglas' legal staff will write the double talk and I'll check it for booby traps. Don't worry about that. The idea is to give Douglas a plan he won't want to booby trap because he'll like it. I want you to sniff it for its political feasibility. Whether or not, we can put it over. Now, here's what we are going to do. Nineteen. The Martian Diplomatic Delegation and Inside Straight Sodality Unlimited as organized by Jubal Harshaw, landed on the flat of the Executive Palace shortly before ten o'clock the next morning. The unpretentious pretender to the Martian throne, Mike Smith, had not worried about the purpose of the trip. He had simply enjoyed every minute of the short flight south with utter and innocent delight. The trip was made in a chartered flying greyhound, and Mike sat up in the Astrodome above the driver, with Jill on one side and Dorcas on his other, and stared and stared in awed wonderment as the girls pointed out sights to him and chattered in his ears. The seat being intended for two people was very crowded, but Mike did not mind, as a warming degree of growing closer necessarily resulted. He sat with an arm around each, and looked and listened and tried to grok, and could not have been happier 
if he had been ten feet under water. It was, in fact, his first view of Terran civilization. He had seen nothing at all in being removed from the champion to Suite K-12 at Bethesda Center. He had indeed spent a few minutes in a taxi ten days earlier going from the hospital to Ben's apartment. But at the time he had grokked none of it. Since that time his world had been bounded by a house and a swimming pool, plus surrounding garden and grass and trees. He had not been as far as Jubal's Gate. But now he was enormously more sophisticated than he had been ten days ago. He understood windows, realized that the bubble surrounding him was a window and meant for looking out of, and that the changing sights he saw were indeed the cities of these people. He understood maps and could pick out, with the help of the girls, where they were and what they were seeing on the map flowing across the lapboard in front of them. But, of course, he had always known about maps. He simply had not known until recently that humans knew about maps. It had given him a twinge of happy homesickness the first time he had grokked a human map. Sure, it was static and dead compared with the maps used by his people. But it was a map. Mike was not disposed by nature, and certainly not by training, to invidious comparisons. Even human maps were very Martian in essence. He liked them. Now he saw almost two hundred miles of countryside, much of its sprawling world metropolis, and savored every inch of it, tried to grok it. He was startled by the enormous size of human cities, and by their bustling activity, visible even from the air, so very different from the slow-motion, monastery-garden pace of cities of his own people. It seemed to him that a human city must wear out almost at once, becoming so choked with living experience that only the strongest of the old ones could bear to visit its deserted streets and grok in contemplation the events and emotions piled layer on endless layer in it. He himself had visited abandoned cities at home only on a few wonderful and dreadful occasions— and then his teachers had stopped having him do so, grokking that he was not strong enough for such experience. Careful questions to Jill and Dorcas, the answers of which he then related to what he had read, enabled him to grok in part enough to relieve his mind somewhat. The city was very young. It had been founded only a little over two earth centuries ago. Since earth-time units had no real flavor for him, he converted to Martian years and Martian numbers. Three filled plus three waiting years. Three to the fourth plus three to the third equals 108 Martian years. Terrifying and beautiful. Why, these people must even now be preparing to abandon the city to its thoughts before it shattered under the strain and became not... And yet, by mere time, the city was only an egg. Mike looked forward to returning to Washington in a century or two, to walk its empty streets, and try to grow close to its endless pain and beauty, grokking thirstily until he was Washington and the city was himself, if he were strong enough by then. Then he firmly filed the thought away as he knew that he must grow and grow and grow before he would be able to praise and cherish the city's mighty anguish. The Greyhound driver swung far east at one point in response to a temporary rerouting of unscheduled traffic caused unknown to Mike by Mike's own presence. And Mike, for the first time, saw the sea. Jill had to point it out to him and tell him that it was water, and Dorcas added that it was the Atlantic Ocean and traced the shoreline on the map. Mike was not ignorant. He had known since he was a nestling that the planet next nearer the sun was almost covered with the water of life, and lately he had learned that these people accepted this lavish richness casually. He had even taken, unassisted, the much more difficult hurdle of grokking at last the Martian orthodoxy that the water ceremony did not require water, that water was merely symbol for the essence, 
beautiful but not indispensable. But, like many a human still virgin towards some major human experience, Mike discovered that knowing a fact in the abstract was not at all the same thing as experiencing its physical reality. The sight of the Atlantic Ocean filled him with such awe that Jill squeezed him and said sharply, Stop it, Mike! Don't you dare! Mike chopped off his emotion and stored it away for later use. Then he stared at the ocean, stretching out to an unimaginably distant horizon, and tried to measure its size in his mind until his head was buzzing with threes and powers of threes and superpowers of powers. As they landed, Jubal called out, Now remember, girls, form a square around him and don't be at all backward about planting a heel in an instep or jabbing an elbow into some oaf's solar plexus. And I realize you'll be wearing your cloak, but that's no reason not to step on a foot if you're crowded, or is it? Quit fretting, boss. Nobody crowds a witness. But I'm wearing spike heels, and I weigh more than you do. Okay. Duke, you know what to do. But get Larry back here with the bus as soon as possible. I don't know when I'll need it. I grok it, boss. Quit jittering. I'll jitter as I please. Let's go. Harshaw, the four girls with Mike and Caxton got out. The bus took off at once. To Harshaw's mixed relief and apprehension, the landing flat was not crowded with newsmen. But it was far from empty. A man picked him out at once, stepped briskly forward, and said heartily, Dr. Harshaw? I'm Tom Bradley, Senior Executive Assistant to the Secretary General. You are to go directly to Mr. Douglas' private office. He will see you for a few moments before the conference starts. No. Bradley blinked. I don't think you understood me. These are instructions from the Secretary General. Oh, he said that it was all right for Mr. Smith to come with you. The man from Mars, I mean. No. This party stays together, even to go to the washroom. Right now, we're going to that conference room. Have somebody lead the way, and have all these people stand back. They're crowding us. In the meantime, I have an errand for you. Miriam, that letter. But, Dr. Harshaw, I said no. Can't you understand plain English? But you are to deliver this letter to Mr. Douglas at once and to him personally, and fetch back his receipt to me. Harshaw paused to write his signature across the flap of the envelope Miriam had handed to him, pressed his thumbprint over the signature, and handed it to Bradley. Tell him that it is most urgent that he read this at once, before the meeting. But the Secretary General specifically desires, the Secretary desires to see that letter. Young man, I am endowed with second sight, and I predict that you won't be working here later today if you waste any time getting it to him. Bradley locked eyes with Jubal, then said, Jim, take over, and left with the letter. Jubal sighed inwardly. He had sweated over that letter. Anne and he had been up most of the night, preparing draft after draft. Jubal had every intention of arriving at an open settlement, in full view of the world's news cameras and microphones, but he had no intention of letting Douglas be taken by surprise by any proposal. Another man stepped forward in answer to Bradley's order. Jubal sized him up as a prime specimen of the clever, conscienceless young men on the way up, who gravitate to those in power and do their dirty work. He disliked him on sight. The man smiled heartily and said smoothly, The name's Jim Sanforth, Doctor. I'm the Chief's press secretary. I'll be buffering for you from now on, arranging your press interviews and so forth. I'm sorry to say that the conference room is not quite ready. There have been last-minute changes, and we've had to move to a larger room. Now it's my thought that... It's my thought that we'll go to that conference room right now. We'll stand up until chairs are fetched for us. Doctor, I'm sure you don't understand the situation. 
They are still stringing wires and things, and that room is swarming with reporters and commentators. Very well. We'll chat with them till you're ready. No, doctor, I have instructions. Youngster, you can take your instructions, fold them until they are all corners, and shove them in your oubliette. We are not at your beck and call. You will not arrange press interviews for us. We are here for just one purpose, a public conference. If the conference is not ready to meet, we'll see the press now, in the conference room. But, and that's not all, you're keeping the man from Mars standing on a windy roof. Harshaw raised his voice. Is there anyone here smart enough to lead us straight to this conference room without getting lost? Sanforth swallowed and said, Follow me, doctor. The conference room was indeed crowded with newsmen and technicians. But there was a big oval table, plenty of chairs and several smaller tables. Mike was spotted at once, and Sanforth's protests did not keep them from crowding in on him. But Mike's flying wedge of amateur Amazons got him as far as the big table. Jubal sat him against it with Dorcas and Jill in chairs flanking him, and the fair witness and Miriam seated behind him. Once this was done, Jubal made no attempt to fend off questions or pictures. Mike had been warned that he would meet lots of people, and that many of them would do strange things, and Jubal had most particularly warned him to take no sudden actions, such as causing persons or things to go away, or to stop, unless Jill told him to. Mike took the confusion gravely, without apparent upset. Jill was holding his hand, and her touch reassured him. Jubal wanted news pictures taken, the more the better. As for questions put directly to Mike, Jubal did not fear them and made no attempt to field them. A week of trying to talk with Mike had convinced him that no reporter could possibly get anything of importance out of Mike in only a few minutes, without expert help. Mike's habit of answering a question as asked, answering it literally and stopping, would be enough to nullify most attempts to pump him. And so it proved. Most questions Mike answered with a polite, I do not know, or an even less committal, beg pardon. But one question backfired on the questioner. A Reuters correspondent, anticipating a monumental fight over Mike's status as an heir, tried to sneak in his own test of Mike's competence. Mr. Smith, what do you know about the laws of inheritance here? Mike was aware that he was having trouble grokking in fullness the human concept of property, and in particular the ideas of bequest and inheritance. So he most carefully avoided inserting his own ideas and stuck to the book, a book which Jubal recognized shortly as Ely on Inheritance and Bequest, Chapter 1. Mike related what he had read, with precision and careful lack of expression, like a boring but exact law professor, for page after tedious page, while the room gradually settled into stunned silence and his interrogator gulped. Jubal let it go on until every newsman there knew more than he wanted to know about dower and curtsy, consanguinean and uterine, per stirpes and per capita, and related mysteries. At last Jubal touched his shoulder. That's enough, Mike. Mike looked puzzled. There is much more. Yes, but later. Does someone have a question on some other subject? A reporter for a London Sunday paper of enormous circulation jumped in with a question closer to his employer's pocketbook. Mr. Smith, we understand you like the girls here on Earth, but have you ever kissed a girl? Yes. Did you like it? Yes. How did you like it? Mike barely hesitated over his answer. Kissing girls is a goodness, he explained very seriously. It is a growing closer. It beats the hell out of card games. Their applause frightened him but he could feel that Jill and Dorcas were not frightened, that indeed they were both trying to restrain that incomprehensible noisy expression of pleasure which he himself could not learn. 
so he calmed his fright and waited gravely for whatever might happen next. By what did happen next, he was saved from further questions, answerable or not, and was granted a great joy. He saw a familiar face and figure just entering by a side door. My brother, Dr. Mahmoud. Mike went on talking in overpowering excitement, but in Martian. The champion's staff semanticist waved and smiled and answered in the same jarring language while hurrying to Mike's side. The two continued talking in unhuman symbols. Mike in an eager torrent, Mahmoud not quite as rapidly, with sound effects like a rhinoceros ramming an ironmonger's lorry. The newsmen stood it for some time, those who operated by sound recording it, and the writers noting it as local color. But at last one interrupted. Dr. Mahmoud, what are you saying? Clue us! Mahmoud turned, smiled briefly, and said in clipped Oxonian speech, For the most part, I've been saying, Slow down, my dear boy, do, please. And what does he say? The rest of our conversation is personal, private, of no possible interest to others, I assure you. Greetings, you know, old friends. He turned back to Mike and continued to chat in Martian. In fact, Mike was telling his brother Mahmoud all that had happened to him in the fortnight since he had last seen him, so that they might grok closer. But Mike's abstraction of what to tell was purely Martian in concept, it being concerned primarily with new water brothers and the unique flavor of each. The gentle water that was Jill, the depth of Anne, the strange, not yet fully grokked fact that Jubal tasted now like an egg, then like an old one, but was neither, the ungrockable vastness of ocean. Mahmoud had less to tell Mike, since less had happened in the interim to him by Martian standards. One Dionysian excess, quite un-Martian, and of which he was not proud, one long day spent lying face down in Washington's Suleiman Mosque, the results of which he had not yet grokked and was not ready to discuss. No new water brothers. He stopped Mike presently and offered his hand to Jubal. You're Dr. Harshaw, I know. Valentine Michael thinks he has introduced me to all of you, and he has, by his rules. Harshaw looked him over as he shook hands with him. Chap looked and sounded like a huntin', shootin', sportin' Britisher, from his tweedy, expensively casual clothes to a clipped grey moustache. But his skin was naturally swarthy rather than ruddy tan, and the genes for that nose came from somewhere close to the Levant. Harshaw did not like fake anything, and would choose to eat cold corn pone over the most perfect syntho sirloin. But Mike treated him as a friend, so friend he was, until proved otherwise. To Mahmoud, Harshaw looked like a museum exhibit of what he thought of as a yank, vulgar, dressed too informally for the occasion, loud, probably ignorant, and almost certainly provincial. A professional man, too, which made it worse. As in Dr. Mahmoud's experience, most American professional men were undereducated and narrow, mere technicians. He held a vast but carefully concealed distaste for all things American. Their incredible, polytheistic babble of religions, of course, although they were hardly to be blamed for that, their cooking, cooking, their manners, their bastard architecture and sickly arts and their blind, pathetic, arrogant belief in their superiority long after their sun had set. Their women, their women most of all, their immodest, assertive women with their gaunt, starved bodies, which nevertheless reminded him disturbingly of Howries. Four of them here crowded around Valentine Michael at a meeting which certainly should be all male. But Valentine Michael had offered him all these people, including these ubiquitous female creatures, offered them proudly and eagerly as his water brothers, thereby laying on Mahmoud a family obligation closer and more binding than that owed to the sons of one's father's brother. 
Since Mahmud understood the Martian term for such accretive relationships, from direct observation of what it meant to Martians, and did not need to translate it clumsily and inadequately as catenative assemblage, nor even as things equal to the same thing are equal to each other. He had seen Martians at home. He knew their extreme poverty by earth standards. He had dipped into, and had guessed at far more, of their cultural extreme wealth and had grokked quite accurately the supreme value that Martians place on interpersonal relationships. Well, there was nothing else for it. He had shared water with Valentine Michael, and now he must justify his friend's faith in him. He simply hoped that these Yanks were not complete bounders. So he smiled warmly and shook hands firmly. Yes, Valentine Michael has explained to me, most proudly, that you are all in... Mahmoud used one word of Martian. To him. Eh? What a brotherhood. You understand? I grok it. Mahmoud strongly doubted if Harshaw did, but he went on smoothly. Since I myself am already in that relationship to him, I must ask to be considered a member of the family. I know your name. And I have guessed that this must be Mr. Caxton. In fact, I have seen your face pictured at the head of your column, Mr. Caxton. I read it when I have opportunity. But let me see if I have the young lady straight. This must be Anne. Yes, but she's cloaked at the moment. Yes, of course. I'll pay my respects to her when she is not busy professionally. Harshaw introduced him to the other three and Jill startled him by addressing him with the correct honorific for a water brother, pronouncing it about three octaves higher than any adult Martian would talk, but with sore-throat purity of accent. It was one of the scant dozen Martian words she could speak out of the hundred-odd that she was beginning to understand. But this one she had down pat because it was used to her and by her many times each day. Dr. Mahmoud's eyes widen slightly. Perhaps these people would turn out not to be mere uncircumcised barbarians after all. And his young friend did have strong intuitions. Instantly he offered Jill the correct honorific in response and bowed over her hand. Jill saw that Mike was obviously delighted. She managed, slurringly but passably, to croak the shortest of the nine forms by which a water brother may return the response. Although she did not grok it fully, and would not have considered suggesting in English the nearest human biological equivalent, certainly not to a man she had just met. However, Mahmoud, who did understand it, took it in its symbolic meaning rather than its humanly impossible literal meaning, and spoke rightly in response. But Jill had passed the limit of her linguistic ability. She did not understand his answer at all and could not reply, even in pedestrian English. But she got a sudden inspiration. At intervals around the huge table were placed the age-old furniture of human palavers, water pitchers, each with its clump of glasses. She stretched and got a pitcher and a tumbler, filled the latter. She looked Mahmoud in the eye, said earnestly, Water! Our nest is yours. She touched it to her lips and handed it to Mahmoud. He answered her in Martian, saw that she did not understand him, and translated, Who shares water shares all. He took a sip and started to hand the glass back to Jill, checked himself, looked at Harshaw, and offered him the glass. Jubal said, I can't speak Martian, son. But thanks for water. May you never be thirsty. He took a sip, then drank about a third of it. Ah! He passed the glass to Ben. Caxton looked at Mahmoud and said very soberly, Grow closer. With the water of life we grow closer. He wet his lips with it and passed it to Dorcas. In spite of the precedents already set, Dorcas hesitated. Dr. Mahmoud, you do know how serious this is to Mike. I do, miss. Well, it's just as serious to us. You understand? You grok? 
I grok its fullness, or I would have refused to drink. All right, may you always drink deep. May our eggs share a nest. Tears started down her cheeks. She drank and passed the glass hastily to Miriam. Miriam whispered, Pull yourself together, kid, then spoke to Mike. With water we welcome our brother, then added to Mahmoud, Nest, water, life. She drank, our brother. She offered him the glass. Mahmoud finished what was left in it and spoke neither in Martian nor English, but Arabic. And if ye mingle your affairs with theirs, then they are your brothers. Amen, Jubal agreed. Dr. Mahmoud looked quickly at him, decided not to inquire just then whether Harshaw had understood him or was simply being polite. This was neither the time nor the place to say anything which might lead to unbottling his own troubles, his own doubts. Nevertheless, he felt warmed in his soul, as always, by water ritual, even though it smelled of heresy. His thoughts were cut short by the assistant chief of protocol bustling up to them. You're Dr. Mahmoud. You belong over on the far side of the table, doctor. Follow me. Mahmoud looked at him, then looked at Mike and smiled. No, I belong here with my friends. Dorcas, may I pull a chair in here and sit between you and Valentine Michael? Certainly, Doctor. Here, I'll scrunch over. The A.C. of P. was almost tapping his foot in impatience. Dr. Mahmoud, please, the chart places you over on the other side of the room. The Secretary General will be here any moment, and the place is still simply swarming with reporters, and goodness knows who else who doesn't belong here, and I don't know what I'm going to do. Then go do it someplace else, bub, Jubal suggested. What? Who are you? Are you on the list? He worriedly consulted the seating chart he carried. Who are you? Jubal answered. The head waiter? I'm Jubal Harshaw. If my name is not on that list, you can tear it up and start over. And look, Buster, if the man from Mars wants his friend Dr. Mahmoud to sit by him, that settles it. But he can't sit here. Seats at the main conference table are reserved for high ministers, chiefs of delegations, high court justices, and equal ranks. And I don't know how I can squeeze them all in if any more show up. And the man from Mars, of course. Of course, Jubal agreed dryly. And of course, Dr. Mahmoud has to be near the Secretary General, just back of him, so that he'll be ready to interpret as needed. I must say, you're not being helpful. I'll help. Jubal plucked the paper out of the official's hand, sat down at the table, and studied it. Mmm. Let me see now. The man from Mars will sit directly opposite the Secretary General, just about where he happens to be sitting. Then Jubal got out a heavy, soft pencil and attacked the seating chart. This entire half of the main table, from here clear over to here, belongs to the man from Mars. Jubal scratched two big black cross marks to show the limits and joined them with a thick black arc, then began scratching out names assigned to seats on that side of the table. That takes care of half of your work, because I'll seat anybody who sits on our side of the table. The protocol officer was too shocked to talk. His mouth worked, but no meaningful noises came out. Jubal looked at him mildly. Something the matter? Oh, I forgot to make it official. He scrawled under his amendments, J. Harshaw for V. M. Smith. Now trot back to your top sergeant, son, and show him that. Tell him to check his rule book on official visits from heads of friendly planets. The man looked at it, opened his mouth, then left very rapidly without stopping to close it. But he was back very quickly on the heels of another older man, 
The newcomer said in a firm, no-nonsense manner, Dr. Harshaw, I'm LaRue, Chief of Protocol. Do you actually need half the main table? I understood that your delegation was quite small. That's beside the point. LaRue smiled briefly. I'm afraid it's not beside the point to me, sir. I'm at my wit's end for space. Almost every official of first rank in the Federation has elected to be present today. If you are expecting more people, though I do wish you had notified me, I'll have a table placed behind these two seats reserved for Mr. Smith and yourself. No! I'm afraid that's the way it must be. I'm sorry. So am I. For you. Because if half the main table is not reserved for the Mars delegation, we are leaving right now. Just tell the Secretary General that you busted up his conference by being rude to the man from Mars. Surely you don't mean that. Didn't you get my message? Uh, well, I took it as a jest. A rather clever one, I admit. Son, I can't afford to joke at these prices. Smith is either top man from another planet paying an official visit to the top man of this planet, in which case he is entitled to all the side boys and dancing girls you can dig up, or he is just a simple tourist and gets no official courtesies of any sort. You can't have it both ways. But I suggest that you look around you, count the officials of first rank, as you called them, and make a quick guess as to whether they would have bothered to show up if, in their minds, Smith is just a tourist. LaRue said slowly, There's no precedent. Jubal snorted. I saw the chief of delegation from the Lunar Republic come in a moment ago. Go tell him there's no precedent. Then duck. I hear he's got a quick temper. He sighed. My son, I'm an old man, and I had a short night. And it's none of my business to teach you your job. Just tell Mr. Douglas that we'll see him another day when he's ready to receive us properly. Come on, Mike. He started to roust himself painfully out of his chair. LaRue said hastily, No, no, Dr. Harshaw. We'll clear this side of the table. I'll... Well, I'll do something. It's yours. That's better. But Harshaw remained poised to get up. But where's the flag of Mars? And how about honors? I'm afraid I don't understand you. Never seen a day when I had so much trouble with plain English. Look, see that Federation banner back of where the secretary is going to sit? Where's the one like it over here for Mars? LaRue blinked. I must admit, you've taken me by surprise. I didn't know the Martians used flags. They don't, but you couldn't possibly whop up what they use for high state occasions. And neither could I, boy, but that's beside the point. So, we'll let you off easy and take an attempt for the deed. Piece of paper, Miriam. Now, like this. Harshaw drew a rectangle, sketched in it the traditional human symbol for Mars, a circle with an arrow leading out from it to the upper right. Make the field in white and the sigil of Mars in red. Should be sewed in bunting, of course, but with a clean sheet and a bucket of paint, any boy scout could improvise one in ten minutes. Were you a scout? Ah, uh, some time ago. Good. Then you know the scout's motto. Now about honors. Maybe you're caught unprepared there, too, eh? You expect to play Hail to Sovereign Peace as the Secretary comes in? Oh, we must. It's obligatory. Then you'll want to follow it with the anthem for Mars. I don't see how I can. Even if there is one, we don't have it. Dr. Harshaw, be reasonable. Look, son, I am being reasonable. We came here for a quiet, small, informal meeting, strictly business, we find you've turned it into a circus. Well, if you're going to have a circus, you've got to have elephants. 
and there's no two ways about it. Now, we realize you can't play Martian music any more than a boy with a tin whistle can play a symphony. But you can play a symphony. The Ten Planets Symphony. Grocket? I mean, do you catch on? Have the tape cut in at the beginning of the Mars movement. Play that, or enough bars to let the theme be recognized. LaRue looked thoughtful. Yes, I suppose we could. But, Dr. Harshaw, I promised you half the table. But I don't see how I can promise sovereign honors, the flag and the music, even on this improvised, merely symbolic scale. I... I don't think I have the authority. Nor the guts, Harshaw said bitterly. Well, we didn't want a circus, so tell Mr. Douglas that we'll be back when he's not so busy and not so many visitors. Been nice chatting with you, son. Be sure to stop by the secretary's office and say hello when we come back, if you're still here. He again went through the slow, apparently painful act of being a man too old and feeble to get out of a chair easily. LaRue said, Dr. Harsha, please don't leave. Ah, uh, the secretary won't come in until I send word that we are ready for him. So let me see what I can do. Yes? Harsha relaxed with a grunt. Shoot yourself. But one more thing while you're here. I heard a ruckus at the main door a moment ago. What I could catch, one of the crew members of the champion wanted to come in. They're all friends of Smith, so let them in. We'll accommodate them. Help to fill up this side of the table. Harshaw sighed and rubbed a kidney. Very well, sir. LaRue agreed stiffly and left. Miriam said out of the corner of her mouth, Boss. Did you sprain your back doing handstands night before last? Quiet, girl, or I'll paddle you. With grim satisfaction, Jubal surveyed the room, which was continuing to fill with high officials. He had told Douglas that he wanted a small, informal talk, no formality while knowing with utter certainty that the mere announcement of such talks would fetch all the powerful and power-hungry as surely as light attracts moths. And now, he felt sure, Mike was about to be treated as a sovereign by each and every one of those nabobs, with the whole world watching. Just let him try to rouse the boy around after this. Sanforth was still trying mightily to shoo out the remaining newsmen, and the unfortunate assistant chief of protocol, deserted by his boss, was jittering like a nervous babysitter in his attempt to play musical chairs with too few chairs and too many notables. They continued to come in, and Jubal concluded that Douglas had never intended to convene this public meeting earlier than eleven o'clock, and that everyone else had been so informed. The earlier hour given Jubal was to permit the private pre-conference conference that Douglas had demanded and that Jubal had refused. Well, the delay suited Jubal's plans. The leader of the Eastern Coalition came in. Since Mr. King was not, by his own choice, the nominal chief of delegation for his nation, his status under strict protocol was merely that of assemblyman. But Jubal was not even mildly surprised to see the harried assistant chief of protocol drop what he was doing and rush to seat Douglas' chief political enemy at the main table and near the seat reserved for the secretary general. It simply reinforced Jubal's opinion that Douglas was no fool. Dr. Nelson, surgeon of the champion, and Captain Van Tromp, her skipper, came in together and were greeted with delight by Mike. Jubal was pleased, too, as it gave the boy something to do, under the cameras, instead of just sitting still like a dummy. Jubal made use of the disturbance to rearrange the seating, since there was now no longer any need to surround the man from Mars with a bodyguard. He placed Mike precisely opposite the Secretary General's chair, and himself took the chair on Mike's left, not only to be close to him as his counsel, but to be where he could actually touch Mike inconspicuously. 
Since Mike had only the foggiest notions of human customary manners, Jubal had arranged with him signals as imperceptible as those used by a rider in putting a high-schooled horse through dressage maneuvers. Stand up, sit down, bow, shake hands. With the difference that Mike was not a horse, and his training had required only five minutes to achieve utterly dependable perfection. Mahmud broke away from the reunion of shipmates, came around, and spoke to Jubal privately. Doctor, I must explain that the skipper and the surgeon are also water brothers of our brother, and Michael Valentine wanted to confirm it at once by again using the ritual. All of us. I told him to wait. Do you approve? Eh? Yes, yes, certainly. Not in this mob. Jubal worried it for a moment. Damn it, how many water brothers did Mike have? How long was this daisy chain? Maybe you three can come with us when we leave, and have a bite and a talk in private. I shall be honored, and I feel sure the other two will come also, if possible. Good. Dr. Mahmoud, do you know of any other brothers of our young brother who are likely to show up? No, not from the company of the champion, at least. There are no more. Mahmoud hesitated, then decided not to ask the obvious complimentary question, as it would hint at how disconcerted he had been at first to discover the extent of his own conjugational commitments. I'll tell Sven and the old man. He went back to them. Harshaw saw the papal nuncio come in, saw him seated at the main table and smiled inwardly. If that long-eared debit LaRue had any lingering doubts about the official nature of this meeting, he would do well to forget them. A man came up behind Harshaw, tapped him on the shoulder. Is this where the man from Mars hangs out? Yes, agreed Jubal. Which one is he? I'm Tom Boone. Senator Boone, that is. And I've got a message for him from Supreme Bishop Digby. Jubal suppressed his personal feelings and let his cortex go into emergency high speed. I'm Jubal Harshaw, Senator. He signaled Mike to stand up and offered to shake hands. And this is Mr. Smith. Mike, this is Senator Boone. How do you do, Senator Boone? Mike said in perfect dancing school form. He looked at Boone with interest. He had already had it straightened out for him that Senator did not mean old one, as the word seemed to shape. Nevertheless, he was interested in seeing just what a senator was. He decided that he did not yet grok it. Pretty well, thank you, Mr. Smith. But I won't take up your time. They seem to be about to get this shindig started. Mr. Smith, Supreme Bishop Digby, sent me to give you a personal invite to attend services at the Archangel Foster Tabernacle of the New Revelation. Beg pardon? Jubal moved in on it. Senator, as you know, many things here, everything, is new to the man from Mars. But it so happens that Mr. Smith has already seen one of your church services by stereo vision. Not the same thing. I know, but he expressed great interest in it, and asked many questions about it, many of which I could not answer. Boone looked keenly at him. You're not one of the faithful? I must admit that I am not. Come along yourself. Always hope for a sinner. Thank you. I will. You're right. I will, friend, for I certainly won't let Mike go into your trap alone. Next Sunday, then, I'll tell Bishop Digby. Next Sunday, if possible, Jubal corrected. We might be in jail by then. Boone grinned. There's always that, ain't there? But send word around to me or 
the supreme bishop, and you won't stay in long. He looked around the crowded room. Seem to be kind of short on chairs in here. Not much chance for a plain senator with all those muckamucks elbowing each other. Perhaps you would honor us by joining us, senator. Jubal answered smoothly. At this table. Eh? Why, thank you, sir. Don't mind if I do. Ringside seat. That is, Harshaw added, if you don't mind the political implications of being seen seated with the official Mars delegation, we aren't trying to crowd you into an embarrassing situation. Boone barely hesitated. Not at all. Who cares what people think? Matter of fact, between you and I, the bishop is very, very interested in this young man. Fine. There's a vacant chair there by Captain Van Tromp. That man there. But probably you know him. Van Tromp? Sure. Sure, old friends. Know him well. Met him at the reception. Senator Boone nodded at Smith, swaggered down and seated himself. Most of those present were seated now, and fewer were getting past the guards at the doors. Jubal watched one argument over seating, and the longer he watched it, the more it made him fidget. At last he felt that he simply could not stand it. He could not sit still and watch this indecency go on. So he leaned over and spoke very privately with Mike, made sure that if Mike did not understand why, at least he understood what Jubal wanted him to do. Mike listened. Jubal, I will do. Thanks, son. Jubal got up and approached a group of three. The assistant chief of protocol the chief of the Uruguayan delegation, and a third man who seemed angry but baffled. The Uruguayan was saying forcefully, Seat him. Then you must find seats for any and all other local chiefs of state, eighty or more. You've admitted that you can't do that. This is Federation soil we stand on. And no chief of state has precedence over any other chief of state. If any exceptions are made... Jubal interrupted by addressing the third man. Sir, he waited just long enough to gain his attention, plunged on. The man from Mars has instructed me to ask you to do him the great honor of sitting with him, if your presence is not required elsewhere. The man looked startled, then smiled broadly. Why, yes, that would be satisfactory. The other two... Both the palace official and the Uruguayan dignitary started to object. Jubal turned his back on them. Let's hurry, sir. I think we have very little time. He had seen two men coming in with what appeared to be a stand for a Christmas tree and a bloody sheet, but what was almost certainly the Martian flag. As they hurried to where he was, Mike got up and was standing, waiting for them. Jubal said... Sir, permit me to present Valentine Michael Smith. Michael, the President of the United States. Mike bowed very low. There was barely time to seat him on Mike's right, as the improvised flag was even then being set up behind them. Music started to play. Everyone stood, and a voice proclaimed, The Secretary General. Twenty. Jubal had considered having Mike remain seated while Douglas came in, but had rejected the idea. He was not trying to place Mike a notch higher than Douglas, but merely to establish that the meeting was between equals. So when he stood up, he signaled Mike to do so likewise. The great double doors at the back of the conference hall had opened at the first strains of Hail to Sovereign Peace and Douglas came in. He went straight to his chair and started to sit down. Instantly, Jubal signaled Mike to sit down, the result being that Mike and the Secretary-General sat down simultaneously, with a long, respectful pause of some seconds before anyone else resumed his seat. Jubal held his breath. 
Had LaRue done it or not? He hadn't quite promised. Then the first fortissimo toxin of the Mars movement filled the room. The war god theme that startles even an audience expecting it. With his eyes on Douglas and with Douglas looking back at him, Jubal was at once up out of his chair again like a scared recruit snapping to attention. Douglas stood up too, not as quickly, but promptly. But Mike did not get up. Jubal had not signaled him to do so. He sat quietly, impassively, quite unembarrassed by the fact that everyone else, without any exception, got quickly back on his feet when the Secretary General stood up. Mike did not understand any of it, and was quite content to do what his water brother told him to do. Jubal had puzzled over this bit after he had demanded the Martian anthem. If the demand was met, what should Mike do while it was played? It was a nice point and the answer depended on just what role Mike was playing in this comedy. The music stopped. On Jubal's signals, Mike then stood up, bowed quickly, and sat down, seating himself about as the secretary-general and the rest were seated. They were all back in their seats, much more quickly this time, as no one could have missed the glaring point that Mike had remained seated through the anthem. Jubal sighed with relief. He had gotten away with it. A great many years earlier, he had seen one of that vanishing tribe of royalty, a reigning queen, receive a parade, and he had noticed that the royal lady had bowed after her anthem was played, i.e., she had acknowledged a salute offered to her own sovereign self. But the political head of a democracy stands and uncovers for his nation's anthem like any other citizen, for he is not a sovereign. But as Jubal had pointed out to LaRue, one couldn't have it two ways. Either Mike was merely a private citizen, in which case this silly Jim Khanna should never have been held, Douglas should have had the guts to tell all these overdressed parasites to stay home, or by the preposterous legal theory inherent in the Larkin decision, the kid was a sovereign all by his little lonesome. Jubal felt tempted to offer LaRue a pinch of snuff. Well, the point had not been missed by at least one. The papal nuncio was keeping his face straight, but his eyes were twinkling. Douglas started to speak. Mr. Smith, we are honored and happy to have you here as our guest today. We hope that you will consider the planet Earth your home quite as much as the planet of your birth, our neighbor, our good neighbor, Mars. He went on at some length, in careful, rounded, pleasant periods, which did not quite say anything. Mike was welcome, but whether he was welcome as a sovereign, as a tourist from abroad, or as a citizen returning home was quite impossible to determine, Jubal decided, from Douglas' words. Jubal watched Douglas, hoping to catch his eye, looking for some nod or expression that would show how Douglas had taken the letter Jubal had sent to him by hand immediately on arrival. But Douglas never looked at him. Presently, Douglas concluded, still having said nothing, and said it very well. Jubal said quietly, Now, Mike. Smith addressed the Secretary General, in Martian. But he cut it off before consternation could build up, and said gravely, Mr. Secretary General of the Federation of Free Nations of the Planet Earth, then went on again in Martian. Then in English, We thank you for our welcome here today. We bring greetings to the peoples of Earth from the ancient ones of Mars. And shifted again into Martian. Jubal felt that ancient ones was a good touch. It carried more bulge than old ones, and Mike had not objected to the change in terminology. In fact, while Mike had insisted on speaking rightly, Jubal's draft had not required much editing. 
It had been Jill's idea to alternate, sentence by sentence, a Martian version and an English version, and Jubal admitted with warm pleasure that her gimmick puffed up a formal little speech as devoid of real content as a campaign promise into something as rollingly impressive as Wagnerian opera. And about as hard to figure out, Jubal added. It didn't matter to Mike. He could insert the Martian translation as easily as he could memorize and recite the edited English version, i.e., without effort for either. If it would please his water brothers to say these sayings, it made Mike happy. Someone touched Jubal on the shoulder, shoved an envelope in his hand, and whispered, From the Secretary General. Jubal looked up, saw that it was Bradley, hurrying silently away. Jubal opened the envelope in his lap, glanced at the single sheet inside. The note was one word, yes, and had been signed with initials J-E-D, all in the famous green ink. Jubal looked up, found that Douglas' eyes were now on him. Jubal nodded ever so slightly, and Douglas looked away. The conference was now over. All that remained was to let the world know it. Mike concluded the sonorous nullities he had been given. Jubal heard his own words. Growing closer, with mutual benefit to both worlds, and each race according to its own nature, but did not listen. Douglas then thanked the man from Mars, briefly but warmly. There was a pause. Jubal stood up. Mr. Secretary General? Yes, Dr. Harshaw? As you know, Mr. Smith is here today in a dual role, like some visiting prince in the past history of our own great race, traveling by caravan and sailing across uncharted vastnesses to a distant realm, he brings to earth the good wishes of the ancient powers of Mars. But he is also a human being, a citizen of the Federation and of the United States of America. As such, he has rights and properties and obligations. Jubal shook his head. Pesky ones, I'm sorry to say. As attorney for him in his capacity as a citizen and a human being, I have been puzzling over his business affairs, and I have not even managed a complete list of what he owns, much less decide what to tell tax collectors. Jubal stopped to wheeze. I'm an old man. I might not live to complete the task. Now you know that my client has had no business experience in the human sense. Martians do these things differently. But he is a young man of great intelligence. The whole world knows that his parents were geniuses, and blood will tell. There's no doubt that in a few years he could, if he wished, do very nicely on his own without the aid of one old broken-down lawyer. But his affairs need attention today. Business won't wait. But, in fact, he is more eager to learn the history and the arts and the ways of the people of this, his second home, than he is to bury himself in debentures and stock issues and royalties. And I think in this he is wise. Although without business experience, Mr. Smith possesses a direct and simple wisdom that continues to astonish me, and to astonish all who meet him. When I explained to him the trouble I was having, he simply looked at me with a clear, calm gaze and said, Why, that's no problem, Jubal. We'll ask Mr. Douglas. Jubal paused and said anxiously, The rest of this is just personal business, Mr. Secretary. Should I see you about it privately and let the rest of these ladies and gentlemen go home? Go right ahead, Dr. Harshaw, Douglas added. Protocol is dispensed with as of now. Anyone who wishes to leave, please feel free to do so. 
No one left. All right, Jubal went on. I can wrap it up in one sentence. Mr. Smith wants to appoint you his attorney in fact, with full power to handle all his business affairs. Just that. Douglas looked convincingly astonished. That's a tall order, Doctor. I know it is, sir. I pointed out to him that it was an imposition, that you are the busiest man on this planet and didn't have time for his affairs. Jubal shook his head and smiled. I'm afraid it didn't impress him. Seems on Mars the busier a person is, the more is expected of him. Mr. Smith simply said, We can ask him. So I'm asking you. Of course, we don't expect an answer offhand. That's another Martian trait. Martians are never in a hurry. Nor are they inclined to make things complicated. No bond, no auditing, none of that claptrap. A written power of attorney if you want it. But it does not matter to him. He would do it just as readily, orally, and right now, Chinese style. That's another Martian trait. If a Martian trusts you, he trusts you all the way. He doesn't come prying around to see if you're keeping your word. Oh, I should add, Mr. Smith is not making this request of the Secretary General. He's asking a favor of Joseph Edgerton Douglas, you personally. If you should retire from public life, it would not affect this in the slightest. Your successor in office, whoever he might be, doesn't figure in it. It's you he trusts, not just whoever happens to occupy the octagon office in this palace. Douglas nodded. Regardless of my answer, I feel honored and humble. Because if you decline to serve or can't serve or do take on this chore and want to drop it later, or anything. Mr. Smith has his own second choice for the job. Ben Caxton it is. Stand up for a second, Ben. Let people see you. And if both you and Caxton can't or won't, his next choice is... Well, I'll guess we'll reserve that name for the moment. Just let it rest that there are successive choices. Ah, uh, let me see now. Jubal looked fuddled. I'm out of the habit of talking on my feet. Miriam, where is that piece of paper we listed things on? Jubal accepted a sheet from her and added. Better give me the other copies, too. She passed over to him a thick stack of sheets. This is a little memo we prepared for you, sir. Or for Caxton, if it turns out that way. Hmm, let me see. Oh, yes. Steward to pay himself what he thinks the job is worth, but not less than, well, a considerable sum. Nobody else's business, really. Steward to deposit monies in a drawing account for living expenses of party of the first part. Uh, oh, yes. I thought maybe you would want to use the Bank of Shanghai, say, as your depository, and say Lloyd's as your business agent, or maybe the other way around, just to protect your own name and fame. But Mr. Smith won't hear of any fixed instructions. Just an unlimited assignment of power. Revocable by either side at choice. But I won't read all this. That's why we wrote it out. Jubal turned and looked vacantly around. Uh, Miriam, trot around and give this to the Secretary General. That's a good girl. Um, these other copies, I'll leave them here. You may want to pass them out to people, or you may need them yourself. Oh, I'd better give one to Mr. Caxton, though. Here, Ben. Jubal looked anxiously around. Ah, uh, I guess that's all I have to say, Mr. Secretary. Did you have anything more to say to us? 
Just a moment. Mr. Smith. Yes, Mr. Douglas? Is this what you want? Do you want me to do what it says on this paper? Jubal held his breath, avoided even glancing at his client. Mike had been carefully coached to expect such a question, but there had been no telling what form it would take, nor any way to tell in advance how Mike's literal interpretations could trip them. Yes, Mr. Douglas, Mike's voice rang out clearly in the big room, and in a billion rooms around a planet. You want me to handle your business affairs? Please, Mr. Douglas, it would be a goodness. I thank you. Douglas blinked. Well, that's clear enough. Doctor, I'll reserve my answer, but you shall have it promptly. Thank you, sir, for myself, as well as for my client. Douglas started to stand up. Assemblyman Kung's voice sharply interrupted. One moment! How about the Larkin decision? Jubal grabbed it before Douglas could speak. Ah, yes, the Larkin decision. I've heard quite a lot of nonsense talked about the Larkin decision, but mostly from irresponsible persons. Mr. Kung, what about the Larkin decision? I'm asking you, or your client, or the Secretary General. Jubal said gently, Shall I speak, Mr. Secretary? Please do. Very well. Jubal paused, slowly took out a big handkerchief, and blew his nose in a prolonged blast, producing a minor chord three octaves below middle C. He then fixed Kung with his eye and said solemnly, Mr. Assemblyman, I'll address this to you, because I know it is unnecessary to address it to the government in the person of the secretary. Once, a long, long time ago, when I was a little boy, another little boy, equally young and foolish, and I, formed a club, just the two of us. Since we had a club, we had to have rules. And the first rule we passed, unanimously, I should add, was that henceforth we would always call our mothers Crosspatch. Silly, of course. But we were very young. Mr. Kung, can you deduce the outcome of that rule? I won't guess, Dr. Harshaw. I tried to implement our cross-patch decision once. Once was enough, and it saved my chum from making the same mistake. All it got me was my young bottom well warmed with a peach switch. And that was the end of the cross-patch decision. Jubal cleared his throat. Just a moment, Mr. Kung. Knowing that someone was certain to raise this non-existent issue, I tried to explain the Larkin decision to my client. At first he had trouble realizing that anyone could think that this legal fiction would apply to Mars. After all, Mars is inhabited by an old and wise race, much older than yours, sir, and possibly wiser. But when he did understand it, he was amused. Just that, sir, tolerantly amused. Once, just once, I underrated my mother's power to punish a small boy's impudence. That lesson was cheap, a bargain. But this planet cannot afford such a lesson on a planetary scale. Before we attempt to parcel out lands which do not belong to us, it behooves us to be very sure what Peach switches are hanging in the Martian kitchen. Kung looked blandly unconvinced. Dr. Harshaw, if the Larkin decision is no more than a small boy's folly, why were national honors rendered to Mr. Smith? Jubal shrugged. 
That question should be put to the government, not to me. But I can tell you how I interpreted them as elementary politeness to the ancient ones of Mars. Please? Mr. Kung, those honors were no hollow echo of the Larkin decision. In a fashion quite beyond human experience, Mr. Smith is the planet Mars. Kung did not even blink. Continue, or rather, the entire Martian race. In Smith's person, the ancient ones of Mars are visiting us. Honors rendered to him are honors rendered to them, and harm done to him is harm done to them. This is true in a very literal but utterly unhuman sense. It was wise and prudent for us to render honors to our neighbors today. But the wisdom in it has nothing to do with the Larkin decision. No responsible person has argued that the Larkin precedent applies to an inhabited planet. I venture to say that no one ever will. Jubal paused and looked up, as if asking heaven for help. But, Mr. Kung, be assured that the ancient rulers of Mars do not fail to notice how we treat their ambassador. The honors rendered to them through him were a gracious symbol. I am certain that the government of this planet showed wisdom thereby. In time, you will learn that it was a most prudent act as well. Kung answered blandly, Doctor, if you are trying to frighten me, you have not succeeded. I did not expect you, but fortunately for the welfare of this planet, your opinion did not control. Jubal turned back to Douglas. Mr. Secretary, this is the longest public appearance I have made in years, and I find that I am fatigued. Could we recess these talks while we await your decision? Twenty-one. The meeting adjourned. Jubal found his intention of getting his flock out of the palace balked by the presence of the American president and of Senator Boone. Both wanted to chat with Mike. Both were practical politicians who realized fully the freshly enhanced value of being seen on intimate terms with the man from Mars. And both were well aware that the eyes of the world, via stereovision, were still on them. And other hungry politicos were closing in. Jubal said quickly, Mr. President, Senator, we're leaving at once to have lunch. Can you join us? He reflected that two in private would be easier to handle than two dozen in public, and he had to get Mike out of there before anything else came unstuck. To his relief, both had other duties elsewhere. Jubal found himself promising not only to fetch Mike to that obscene Fosterite service, but also to bring him to the White House. Oh, well, the boy could always get sick if necessary. Places, girls! With his escort again around him, Mike was convoyed to the roof. Anne, leading the way since she would remember it, and creating quite a bow wave with her height, her Valkyrie blonde beauty, and her impressive cloak of a fair witness. Jubal, Ben, and the three officers from the champion covered the rear. Larry and the Greyhound bus were waiting on the roof. A few minutes later, the driver left them on the roof of the new Mayflower. Newsmen caught up with them there, of course, but the girls guarded Mike on down to the suite Duke had taken earlier. They were becoming quite good at it and were enjoying it. Miriam and Dorcas in particular displayed ferocity that reminded Jubal of a mother cat defending her young. Only they made a game of it, keeping score against each other. A reporter that closed within three feet of either of them courted a spiked instep. They found their corridor patrolled by SS troopers and an officer outside the door of their suite. 
Jubal's back hair rose, but he realized, or hoped, he corrected himself, that their presence meant that Douglas was carrying out his half of the bargain in full measure. The letter Jubal had sent to Douglas before the conference, explaining what he was going to do and say, and why, had included a plea to Douglas to use his power and influence to protect Mike's privacy from here on, so that the unfortunate lad could begin to lead a normal life, if a normal life was possible for Mike. Jubal again corrected himself. So Jubal merely called out, Jill, keep Mike under control. It's okay. Right, boss. And so it was. The officer at the door simply saluted. Jubal glanced at him. Well, howdy, Major. Busted down any doors lately? Major Block turned red, but kept his eyes forward and did not answer. Jubal wondered if the assignment was punishment. No, likely just coincidence. There probably wouldn't be more than a handful of SS officers of appropriate rank available for the chore in this area. Jubal considered rubbing it in by saying that a skunk had wandered in that door and ruined his living room furniture. And what was the Major going to do about that? But he decided against it. It would not only be ungracious but untrue. Duke had rigged a temporary closure out of plywood before the party got too wet for such tasks. Duke was waiting inside. Jubal said, Sit down, gentlemen. How about it, Duke? Duke shrugged. Who knows? Nobody has bugged this suite since I took it. I guarantee that. I turned down the first suite they offered me, just as you said to, and I picked this one because it's got a heavy ceiling. The ballroom is above us, and I've spent the time since searching the place. But, boss, I've pushed enough electrons to know that any dump can be bugged so that you can't find it without tearing the building down. Fine, fine, but I didn't mean that. They can't keep a hotel this big bugged throughout just on the chance that we might take a room in it. At least, I don't think they can. I mean, how about the supplies? I'm hungry, boy, and very thirsty. And we've three more for lunch. Oh, that. That stuff was unloaded under my eyes, carried down the same way, placed just inside the door. I put it all in the pantry. You've got a suspicious nature, boss. I sure have, and you'd better acquire one if you want to live as long as I have. Jubal had just trusted Douglas with a fortune equivalent to a medium-sized national debt. But he had not assumed that Douglas' overeager lieutenants would not tamper with food and drink. So to avoid the services of a food taster, he had fetched all the way from the Poconos plenty of food, more than a plenty of liquor, and a little water. And, of course, ice cubes. He wondered how Caesar had licked the Gauls without ice cubes. I don't hanker to, Duke answered. Matter of taste. I've had a pretty good time on the whole. Get cracking, girls. Anne, douse your cloak and get useful. First girl back in here with a drink for me skips her next turn at front. After our guests, I mean. Do please sit down, gentlemen. Sven, what's your favorite poison? Aquavit, I suppose. Larry, tear down, find a liquor store, and fetch back a couple of bottles of Aquavit. Fetch Bull's Gin for the captain, too. Hold it, Jubal, Nelson said firmly. I won't touch Aquavit unless it's chilled overnight. And I'd rather have scotch. Me too, agreed Van Tromp. All right, got enough of that to drown a horse. Dr. Mahmoud, if you prefer soft drinks, I'm pretty sure the girls tuck some in. Mahmoud looked wistful. I should not allow myself to be tempted by strong drink. No need to be. Let me prescribe for you as a physician. Jubal looked him over. 
Son, you look as if you had been under considerable nervous strain. Now we could alleviate that with meprobamate, but since we don't have that at hand, I'm forced to substitute two ounces of ninety-proof ethanol. Repeat as needed. Any particular flavor you prefer to kill the medicinal taste, and with or without bubbles. Mahmoud smiled and suddenly did not look at all English. Thank you, Doctor, but I'll sin my own sins with my eyes open. Gin, please, with water on the side, or vodka, or whatever is available. Or medicinal alcohol, Nelson added. Don't let him pull your leg, Jubal. Stinky drinks anything and always regrets it. I do regret it. Mahmud said earnestly, "Because I know it is sinful." Then don't needle him about it, Sven," Jubal said brusquely. "If Stinky gets more mileage out of his sins by regretting them, that's his business. My own regretter burned out from overload during the market crash in twenty nine, and I've never replaced it. And that's my business, to each his own. How about vittles, Stinky?" And probably stuffed a ham into one of those hampers, and there might be other unclean items not as clearly recognizable. Shall I check? Mahmud shook his head. I'm not a traditionalist, Jubal. That legislation was given a long time ago, according to the needs of the time. The times are different now. Jubal suddenly looked sad. Yes, but for the better. Never mind. This too shall pass, and leave not a rack of mutton behind. Eat what you will, my brother. God forgives necessity. Thank you, but truthfully, I often do not eat in the middle of the day. Better eat, or the prescribed ethanol will do more than relax you. Besides, these kids who work for me may sometimes misspell words, but they are all superb cooks. Miriam had come up behind Jubal with a tray bearing four drinks, orders having been filled at once while Jubal ranted. "Boss," she broke in, "I heard that. Will you put it in writing?" "What?" He whirled around and glared at her, snooping. "You stay in after school and write one thousand times. I will not flap my ears at private conversations." Stay until you finish it. Yes, boss. This is for you, Captain, and for you, Doctor Nelson, and this is yours, Doctor Mahmoud. Water on the side, he said. Yes, Miriam. Thank you. Usual harsh or service, sloppy but fast. Here's yours, boss. You put water in it. Anne's orders. She says you're too tired to have it on the rocks. Jubal looked long-suffering. You see what I have to put up with, gentlemen. We should never have put shoes on him. Miriam, make that one thousand times in Sanskrit. Yes, boss. Just as soon as I find time to learn it. She patted him on the head. You go right ahead and have your tizzy, dear. You've earned it. We're all proud of you. Back to the kitchen, woman. Hold it. Has everybody else got a drink? Where's Ben's drink? Where's Ben? They have by now. Ben is phoning in his calm. His drink is at his elbow. Very well. You may back out quietly without formality, and send Mike in. Gentlemen, make a aloha paole, for there are fewer of us every year. He drank. They joined him. Mike's helping. He loves to help. I think he's going to be a butler when he grows up. I thought you had left. Send him in anyhow. Doctor Nelson wants to give him a physical examination. No hurry. Put in the ship's surgeon. Jubal, this is excellent scotch. But what was the toast? Sorry, Polynesian. May our friendship be everlasting. Call it a footnote to the water ceremony this morning.
By the way, gentlemen, both Larry and Duke are water brothers to Mike, too. But don't let it fret you. They can't cook. But they're the sort to have at your back in a dark alley. If you vouch for them, Jubal, Van Tromp assured him, admit them and tile the door. But let's drink to the girls while we're alone. Sven, what's that toast of yours to the Fleckers? You mean the one to all pretty girls everywhere? Let's drink just to the four who are here. Skull. They drank to their female water brothers, and Nelson continued. Jubal, where do you find them? Raise them in my own cellar. Then just when I've got them trained and some use to me, some city slicker always comes along and marries them. It's a losing game. I can see how you suffer, Nelson said sympathetically. I do. I trust all of you gentlemen are married. Two were. Bamud was not. Jubal looked at him bleakly. Would you have the grace to discorporate yourself? After lunch, of course. I wouldn't want you to do it on an empty stomach. I'm no threat. I'm a permanent bachelor. Come, come, sir. I saw Dorcas making eyes at you, and you were purring. I'm safe, I assure you. Mahmud thought of telling Jubal that he would never marry out of his faith, decided that a Gentile would take it amiss, even a rare exception like Jubal. He changed the subject. But, Jubal, don't make a suggestion like that to Mike. He wouldn't grok that you were joking, and you might have a corpse on your hands. I don't know. I don't know that Mike can actually think himself dead, but he would try, and if he were truly a Martian, it would work. I'm sure he can, Nelson said firmly. Doctor, Jubal, I mean, have you noticed anything odd about Mike's metabolism? Uh, let me put it this way. There isn't anything about his metabolism which I have noticed that is not odd. Very. Exactly. Jubal turned to Mahmoud. But don't worry that I might invite Mike to suicide. I've learned not to joke with him. Not ever. I grok that he doesn't grok joking. Jubal blinked thoughtfully. But I don't grok grok. Not really. Stinky, you speak Martian. A little. You speak it fluently, I heard you. Do you grok grok? Mahmoud looked very thoughtful. No, not really. Grok is the most important word in the Martian language, and I expect to spend the next forty years trying to understand it and perhaps use some millions of printed words trying to explain it. But I don't expect to be successful. You need to think in Martian to grok the word grok, which Mike does, and I don't. Perhaps you have noticed that Mike takes a rather veering approach to some of the simplest human ideas. Have I? My throbbing head. Mine, too. Food, announced Jubal. Lunch and about time, too. Girls, put it down where we can reach it and maintain a respectful silence. Go on talking, doctor, if you will. Or does Mike's presence make it better to postpone it? Not at all. Mahmoud spoke briefly in Martian to Mike. Mike answered him, smiled sunnily. His expression became blank again, and he applied himself to food, quite content to be allowed to eat in silence. I told him what I was trying to do, and he told me that I would speak rightly. This was not his opinion, but a simple statement of fact, a necessity. I hope that if I fail to, he will notice and tell me. But I doubt if he will. You see, Mike thinks in Martian and this gives him an entirely different map of the universe from that which you and I use. You follow me? I grok it, agreed Jubal. Language itself shapes a man's basic ideas. Yes, but... Doctor, you speak Arabic, do you not? Eh? I used to, badly, many years ago, admitted Jubal. Put in a while as a surgeon with the American Field Service in Palestine. 
but I don't now. I still read it a little, because I prefer to read the words of the prophet in the original. Proper. Since the Koran cannot be translated, the map changes on translation no matter how carefully one tries. You will understand, then, how difficult I found English. It was not alone that my native language has much simpler inflections and more limited tenses. The whole map changed. English is the largest of the human tongues, with several times the vocabulary of the second largest language. This alone made it inevitable that English would eventually become, as it did, the lingua franca of this planet, for it is thereby the richest and the most flexible, despite its barbaric accretions. Or I should say, because of its barbaric accretions. English swallows up anything that comes its way makes English out of it. Nobody tried to stop this process, the way some languages are policed and have official limits, probably because there never has been, truly, such a thing as the King's English, for the King's English was French. English was in truth a bastard tongue, and nobody cared how it grew, and it did enormously until no one could hope to be an educated man unless he did his best to embrace this monster. Its very variety, subtlety, and utterly irrational idiomatic complexity makes it possible to say things in English which simply cannot be said in any other language. It almost drove me crazy until I learned to think in it, and that put a new map of the world on top of the one I grew up with, a better one in many ways, certainly a more detailed one. But nevertheless, there are things which can be said in the simple Arabic tongue that cannot be said in English. Jubal nodded agreement. Quite true. That's why I've kept up my reading of it. A little. Yes. But the Martian language is so much more complex than is English, and so wildly different in the fashion in which it abstracts its picture of the universe that English and Arabic might as well be considered one and the same language by comparison. An Englishman and an Arab can learn to think each other's thoughts in the other's language. But I'm not certain that it will ever be possible for us to think in Martian, other than by the unique fashion Mike learned it. Oh, we can learn a sort of pidgin Martian, yes, that is what I speak. Now, take this one word, grok. Its literal meaning, one which I suspect goes back to the origin of the Martian race as thinking, speaking creatures, and which throws light on their whole map, is quite easy. Grok means to drink. Huh? said Jubal. But Mike never says grok when he's just talking about drinking. He... Just a moment. Mahmoud spoke to Mike in Martian. Mike looked faintly surprised and said, Grok is drink, and dropped the matter. But Mike would also have agreed, Mahmoud went on, if I had named a hundred other English words, words which represent what we think of as different concepts, even pairs of antithetical concepts. And grok means all of these, depending on how you use it. It means fear, it means love, it means hate, proper hate. For by the Martian map, you cannot possibly hate anything unless you grok it completely, understand it so thoroughly that you merge with it, and it merges with you. Then, and only then, can you hate it, by hating yourself. But this also implies by necessity that you love it too, and cherish it, and would not have it otherwise. Then you can hate, and I think that Martian hate is an emotion so black that the nearest human equivalent could only be called a mild distaste. Mahmud screwed up his face. It means identically equal in the mathematical sense. The human cliché... This hurts me worse than it does you, has a Martian flavor to it, if only a trace. 
The Martians seem to know instinctively what we learned painfully from modern physics, that the observer interacts with the observed simply through the process of observation. Grok means to understand so thoroughly that the observer becomes a part of the process being observed, to merge, to blend, to intermarry, to lose personal identity in group experience. It means almost everything that we mean by religion, philosophy, and science. And it means as little to us as color means to a blind man. Mahmoud paused. Jubal, if I chopped you up and made a stew of you, you and the stew, whatever else was in it, would grok. And when I ate you, we would grok together, and nothing would be lost, and it would not matter which one of us did the chopping up, and eating. It would to me, Jubal said firmly. You aren't a Martian. Mahmoud again stopped again to talk to Mike in Martian. Mike nodded. You spoke rightly, my brother, Dr. Mahmoud. I am been saying so. Thou art God. Mahmoud shrugged helplessly. You see how helpless it is? All I got was a blasphemy. We don't think in Martian. We can't. Thou art God, Mike said agreeably. God grocks. Hell, let's change the subject. Jubal, could I impose on my fraternal status for some more gin? I'll get it, said Dorcas and jumped up. It was a pleasant family picnic made easy by Jubal's gift for warm informality, a gift shared by his staff, plus the fact that the three newcomers were themselves the same easy sort of people, each learned, acclaimed, and with no need to strive, and all four men shared a foster father interest in Mike. Even Dr. Mahmoud, rarely truly off guard with those who did not share with him the one true faith in submission to the will of God, always beneficent, merciful, found himself relaxed and happy. It had pleased him very much to learn that Jubal read the words of the prophet. And, now that he stopped to notice it, the women of Jubal's household were really much plumper than he had thought at first glance. That dark one. But he put the thought out of his mind. He was a guest. But it pleased him very much that these women did not chatter, did not intrude themselves into the sober talk of men, but were very quick with food and drink in warm hospitality. He had been shocked at Miriam's casual disrespect toward her master, then recognized it for what it was. Liberty permitted cats and favorite children in the privacy of the home. Jubal explained early, that they were doing nothing but waiting on word from the secretary-general. If he means business, and I think he's ready to deal, we may hear from him yet today. If not, we'll go home this evening, and come back if we have to. But if we had stayed in the palace, he might have been tempted to dicker. Here, dug into our own hole, we can refuse to dicker. Dicker for what? asked Captain Van Tromp. You gave him what he wanted. Not all that he wanted. Douglas would rather have that power of attorney be utterly irrevocable. Instead of on his good behavior, with the power reverting to a man he despises and is afraid of. Namely, that scoundrel there with the innocent smile, our brother Ben but there are others besides Douglas who are certain to want to dicker, too. That bland Buddha Kung hates my guts. I just snatched the rug out from under him. But if he could figure a deal that might tempt us before Douglas nails this down, he would offer it. So we stay out of his way, too. Kung is one reason why we are eating and drinking nothing that we did not fetch with us. You really feel that's something to worry about? asked Nelson. Truthfully, Jubal, 
I had assumed that you were a gourmet who insisted on his own cuisine even away from home. I can't imagine being poisoned in a major hotel such as this. Jubal shook his head sorrowfully. Sven, you're the sort of honest man who thinks everybody else is honest, and you are usually right. No, nobody is going to try to poison you. But your wife might collect your insurance simply because you shared a dish with Mike. You really think that? Sven, I'll order anything you want, but I won't touch it, and I won't let Mike touch it. For I'll lay heavy odds that any waiter who comes to this suite will be on Kung's payroll, and maybe on two or three others. I'm not seeing boogeymen behind bushes. They know where we are, and they've had a couple of hours in which to act. Sven, in cold seriousness, my principal worry has been to keep this lad alive long enough to figure out a way to sterilize and stabilize the power he represents, so that it would be to no one's advantage to have him dead. Jubal sighed. Consider the Black Widow Spider. It's a timid little beastie. Useful and, for my taste, the prettiest of the arachnids, with its shiny patent leather finish and its red hourglass trademark. But the poor thing has the fatal misfortune of possessing enormously too much power for its size. So everybody kills it on sight. The Black Widow can't help it. It has no way to avoid its venomous power. Mike is in the same dilemma. He isn't as pretty as a black widow spider. Why, Jubal, Dorcas said indignantly. What a mean thing to say, and how utterly untrue. Sorry, child. I don't have your glandular bias in the matter. Pretty or not, Mike can't get rid of that money, nor is it safe for him to have it. And not just Kung. The High Court is not as non-political as it might be although their methods would probably make a prisoner out of him rather than kill him, a fate which, for my taste, is worse, not to mention a dozen other interested parties in and out of public office, persons who might or might not kill him, but who have certainly turned over in their minds just how it would affect their fortunes if Mike were guest of honor at a funeral. I... Telephone, boss. Anne... You have just interrupted a profound thought. You hail from Porlock. No, Dallas. And I will not answer the phone for anyone. She said to tell you it was Becky. Why didn't you say so? Jubal hurried out of the living room, found Madame Vassant's friendly face in the screen. Becky, I'm glad to see you, girl. He did not bother to ask how she had known where to call him. Hi, Doc. I caught your act, and I just had to call and tell you so. How'd it look? The professor would have been proud of you. I've never seen a tip turned more expertly. Then you spilled them before the marks knew what had hit them. Doc, the profession lost a great talker when you weren't born twins. That's high praise coming from you, Becky. Jubal thought rapidly. But you set up the act. I just cashed in on it. And there's plenty of cash. So name your fee, Becky, and don't be shy. He decided that whatever figure she picked, he would double it. That drawing account he had demanded for Mike would never feel it. And it was better, far better, to pay Becky off lavishly than to let the obligation stay open. Madame Vassant frowned. Now you've hurt my feelings. Becky, Becky, you're a big girl now, dear. Anybody can clap and cheer, but applause worthwhile will be found in a pile of soft green folding money. Not my money. The man from Mars picks up this tab, and believe me, he can afford it. He grinned. But all you'll get from me is thanks and a hug and a kiss that will crack your ribs the first time I see you. She relaxed and smiled. I'll hold you to it. 
I remember how you used to pat my fanny while you assured me that the professor was sure to get well. You always could make a body feel better. I can't believe that I ever did anything so unprofessional. You did, you know you did, and you weren't very fatherly about it either. Maybe so. Maybe I thought it was the treatment you needed. I've given up fanny padding for Lent. But I'll make an exception in your case. You'd better. And you'd better figure out that fee. Don't forget the zeros. Ah, uh, I'll think about it. But truthfully, Doc, there are more ways of collecting a fee than by making a fast count on the change. Have you been watching the market today? No, and don't tell me about it. Come over and have a drink instead. Ah, uh, I'd better not. I promised, well, a rather important client that I would be available for instant consultation. I see. Hmm. Becky, do you suppose that the stars would show that this whole matter would turn out best for everybody if it were all wrapped up, signed, sealed, and notarized today? Maybe just after the stock market closes? She looked thoughtful. I could look into it. You do that. And come stay with us when you aren't so busy. Stay as long as you like and never wear your hurting shoes the whole time. You'll like the boy. He's as weird as snake's suspenders, but sweet as a stolen kiss, too. Ah, uh, I will, as soon as I can. Thanks, Doc. They said goodbye, and Jubal returned to find that Dr. Nelson had taken Mike into one of the bedrooms and was checking him over. He joined them to offer Nelson the use of his kit, since Nelson had not had with him his professional bag. Jubal found Mike stripped down, and the ship's surgeon looking baffled. Doctor! Nelson said almost angrily. I saw this patient only ten days ago. Tell me where he got those muscles. Why, he sent in a coupon from the back cover of Rut, the magazine for he-men. You know, the ad that tells how a ninety-pound weakling can... Doctor, please. Why don't you ask him? Jubal suggested. Nelson did so. I thinked them, Mike answered. That's right, Jubal agreed. He thinked them. When I got him just over a week ago, he was a mess, slight, flabby, and pale, looked as if he had been raised in a cave, which I gather he was, more or less. So I told him he had to grow strong. So he did. Exercises? Nelson said doubtfully. Nothing systematic. Swimming, when and as he wished. A week of swimming won't make a man look as if he had been sweating over barbells for years. Nelson frowned. I am aware that Mike has voluntary control over the so-called involuntary muscles, but that is not entirely without precedent. This, on the other hand, requires one to assume that... Doctor, Jubal said gently. Why don't you just admit that you don't grok it and save the wear and tear? Nelson sighed. I might as well. Put your clothes on, Michael. Somewhat later, Jubal, under the mellowing influence of congenial company and the grape, was unburdening to the three from the champion his misgivings about his morning's work. The financial end was simple enough, just tie up Mike's money so that a struggle over it couldn't take place, not even if he dies, because I've let Douglas know privately that Mike's death ends his stewardship, whereas a rumor from a usually reliable source, me in this case, has reached Kung and several others to the effect that Mike's death will give Douglas permanent control. Of course, if I had had magical powers, I would have stripped the boy not only of all political significance, but also of every penny of his inheritance. 
That. Why would you have done that, Jubal? The captain interrupted. Harshaw looked surprised. Are you wealthy, skipper? I don't mean are your bills paid and enough in the sock to buy any follies your taste runs to. I mean rich, so loaded that the floor sags when you walk around to take your place at the head of a boardroom table. Me! Van Tromp snorted. I've got my monthly check, a pension, eventually, a house with a mortgage, and two girls in college. I'd like to try being wealthy for a while, I don't mind telling you. You wouldn't like it. Huh? You wouldn't say that if you had two daughters in school. For the record, I put four daughters through college, and I went in debt to my armpits to do it. One of them justified the investment. She's a leading light in her profession, which she practices under her husband's name, because I'm a disreputable old bum who makes money writing popular trash, instead of having the grace to be only a revered memory in her paragraph in Who's Who. The other three are nice people who always remember my birthday and don't bother me otherwise. I can't say that an education hurt them, but my offspring are not relevant save to show that I understand that a man often needs more than he's got. But you can fix that easily. You can resign from the service and take a job with some engineering firm that will pay you several times what you're getting just to put your name on their letterhead. General Atomics. Several others. You've had offers, haven't you? That's beside the point, Captain Van Tromp answered stiffly. I'm a professional man, meaning there isn't enough money on this planet to tempt you into giving up commanding spaceships. I understand that. But I wouldn't mind having money, too. A little more money won't do you any good, because daughters can use up ten percent more than a man can make in any normal occupation, regardless of the amount. That's a widely experienced but previously unformulated law of nature, to be known henceforth as Harshaw's Law. But, Captain, real wealth... On the scale that causes its owner to hire a battery of finaglers to hold down his taxes would ground you just as certainly as resigning would. Why should it? I would put it all in bonds and just clip coupons. Would you? Not if you were the sort of person who acquires great wealth in the first place. Big money isn't hard to come by. All it costs is a lifetime of single-minded devotion to acquiring it and making it grow into more money to the utter exclusion of all other interests. They say that the age of opportunity has passed. Nonsense! Seven out of ten of the wealthiest men on this planet started life without a shilling, and there are plenty more such strivers on the way up. Such people are not stopped by high taxation, nor even by socialism. They simply adapt themselves to new rules, and presently they change the rules. But no premier ballerina ever works harder, nor more narrowly, than a man who acquires riches. Captain, that's not your style. You don't want to make money. You simply want to have money in order to spend it. Correct, sir. Which is why I can't see why you should want to take Mike's wealth away from him. Because Mike doesn't need it. And it would cripple him worse than any physical handicap. Wealth, great wealth, is a curse. Unless you are devoted to the money-making game for its own sake. And even then, it has serious drawbacks. Oh, nonsense! Jubal, you talk like a harem guard trying to convince a whole man of the advantages of being a eunuch. Pardon me. Very possibly, agreed Jubal. And perhaps for the same reason. 
the human mind's ability to rationalize its own shortcomings into virtues is unlimited, and I am no exception. Since I, like yourself, sir, have no interest in money other than to spend it, there has never been the slightest chance that I would acquire any significant degree of wealth, just enough for my vices, nor any real danger that I would fail to scrounge that modest amount, since anyone with the savvy not to draw to a small pair can always manage to feed his vices whether they be tithing or chewing beetle nut. But great wealth? You saw that performance this morning? Now answer me truthfully. Do you think I could have revised it slightly so that I myself acquired all that plunder, become its sole manager and de facto owner while milking off for my own use any income I cared to name? and still have rigged the other issues so that Douglas would have supported the outcome? Could I have done that, sir? Mike trusts me. I am his water brother. Could I have stolen his fortune and so arranged it that the government in the person of Mr. Douglas would have condoned it? Ah, uh, damn you, Jubal. I suppose you could have. Most well, certainly I could have. Because our sometimes estimable Secretary General is no more a money seeker than you are. His drive is political power, a drum whose beat I do not hear. Had I guaranteed to Douglas, oh, gracefully, of course, there is decorum even among thieves, that the Smith estate would continue to bulwark his administration, then I would have been left undisturbed to do as I liked with the income, and had my acting guardianship made legal. Jubal shuddered. I thought that I was going to have to do exactly that, simply to protect Mike from the vultures gathered around him, and I was panic-stricken. Captain, you obviously don't know what an old man of the sea great wealth is. It is not a fat purse and time to spend it. Its owner finds himself beset on every side, at every hour, wherever he goes, by persistent pleaders like beggars in Bombay, each demanding that he invest or give away part of his wealth. He becomes suspicious of honest friendship. Indeed, honest friendship is rarely offered him. Those who could have been his friends are too fastidious to be jostled by beggars, too proud to risk being mistaken for one. Worse yet, his life and the lives of his family are always in danger. Captain, have your daughters ever been threatened with kidnapping? What? Good Lord, I should hope not. If you possess the wealth Mike had thrust on him, you would have those girls guarded night and day, and even then you would not rest, because you would never be sure that those very guards were not tempted. Look at the records of the last hundred or so kidnappings in this country, and note how many of them involved a trusted employee. And note, too, how few victims escaped alive. Then ask yourself, is there any luxury wealth can buy which is worth having your daughter's pretty necks always in a noose? Van Tromp looked thoughtful. No, I guess I'll keep my mortgaged house. It's more my speed. Those girls are all I've got, Jubal. Amen. I was appalled at the prospect. Wealth holds no charm for me. All I want is to live my own lazy, useless life, sleep in my own bed, and not be bothered. Yet I thought I was going to be forced to spend my last few years sitting in an office, barricaded by buffers and working long hours as Mike's man of business. Then I had an inspiration. 
Douglas already lived behind such barricades, already had such a staff. Since I was forced to surrender the power of that money to Douglas merely to ensure Mike's continued health and freedom, why not make the beggar pay for it by assuming all the headaches, too? I was not afraid that Douglas would steal from Mike. Only pipsqueak second-rate politicians are money-hungry, and Douglas, whatever his faults, is no pipsqueak. Quit scowling, Ben, and hope that he never dumps the load on you. So I dumped the whole load on Douglas, and now I can go back to my garden. But, as I have said, the money was relatively simple once I figured it out. It was the Larkin decision that fretted me. Caxton said, I thought you had lost your wits on that one, Jubal. That silly business of letting them give Mike sovereign honors. Honors, indeed. For God's sake, Jubal, you should simply have had Mike sign over all right, title, and interest, if any, under that ridiculous Larkin theory. You knew Douglas wanted him to... Jill told you. Ben, my boy, Jubal said gently, as a reporter, you are hardworking and sometimes readable. Gee, thanks, my fan. But your concepts of strategy are Neanderthal. Caxton sighed. I feel better, Jubal. For a moment there, I thought you had become softly sentimental in your old age. When I do, please shoot me. Captain, how many men did you leave on Mars? Twenty-three. And what is their status under the Larkin decision? Van Tromp looked troubled. I'm not supposed to talk. Then don't. Jubal reassured him. I can deduce it. And so can Ben. Dr. Nelson said, Skipper, both Stinky and I are civilians again. I shall talk where and how I please. And shall I, agreed Mahmoud. And if they want to make trouble for me, they know what they can do with my reserve commission. What business has the government telling us we can't talk? Those chair warmers didn't go to Mars. We did. Stow it, Sven. I intended to talk. These are our water brothers. But, Ben, I would rather not see this in your column. I would like to command a spaceship again. Captain, I know the meaning of off the record. But if you'll feel easier, I'll join Mike and the girls for a while. I want to see Jill anyhow. Please don't leave, but this is among water brothers. The government is in a stew about that nominal colony we left behind. Every man in it joined in signing away his so-called Larkin rights, assigned them to the government, before we left Earth. Mike's presence when we got to Mars confused things enormously. I'm no lawyer, but I understood that if Mike did waive his rights whatever they might be. That would put the administration in the driver's seat when it came to parceling out things of value. What things of value? demanded Caxton. Other than pure science, I mean. Look, Skipper, I'm not running down your achievement, but from all I've seen and heard, Mars isn't exactly valuable real estate for human beings. Or are there assets that are still classified drop-dead before reading? Van Tromp shook his head. No. The scientific and technical reports are all declassified, I believe. But, Ben, the moon was a worthless hunk of rock when we first got it. Now look at it. Touché, Caxton admitted. I wish my grandpappy had bought Lunar Enterprises instead of Canadian uranium. I don't have Jubal's objections to being rich, he added. But in any case, Mars is already inhabited. Van Tromp looked unhappy. 
Yes, but... Stinky, you tell him. Mahmood said, Ben, there is plenty of room on Mars for human colonization. And so far as I was ever able to find out, the Martians would not interfere. They did not object when we told them we intended to leave a colony behind. Nor did they seem pleased, not even interested. We are flying our flag and claiming extraterritoriality right now. But our status may be more like that of one of those ant cities, under glass, one sometimes sees in schoolrooms. I was never able to grok it. Jubal nodded. Precisely. Myself, too. This morning I did not have the slightest idea of the true situation, except that I knew that the government was anxious to get those so-called Larkin rights from Mike. Beyond that, I was ignorant, so I assumed that the government was equally ignorant and went boldly ahead. Audacity, always audacity, soundest principle of strategy. In practicing medicine, I learned that when you are most at loss is the time when you must appear confident. In law, I had learned that when your case seems hopeless, you must impress the jury with your relaxed certainty. Jubal grinned. Once, when I was a kid in high school, I won a debate on shipping subsidies by quoting an overwhelming argument from the files of the British Colonial Shipping Board. The opposition was totally unable to refute me, because there never was a British Colonial Shipping Board. I had made it up. Whole cloth. I was equally shameless this morning. The administration wanted Mike's Larkin rights and was scared silly that we might make a deal with Kung or somebody. So I used their greed and worry to wring out of them that ultimate logical absurdity of their fantastic legal theory, a public acknowledgment in unmistakable diplomatic protocol that Mike was a sovereign equal of the Federation itself and must be treated accordingly. Jubal looked smug. Thereby, Ben said dryly, putting yourself up the well-known creek without a paddle. Ben, Ben, Jubal said chidingly, Wrong metaphor. Not a canoe, but a tiger, or a throne. By their own logic, they had publicly crowned Mike. Need I point out that, despite the old saw about uneasy heads and crowns, it is nevertheless safer to be publicly a king than it is to be a pretender in hiding? A king can usually abdicate to save his neck. A pretender may renounce his pretensions, but it makes his neck no safer. Less so, in fact. It leaves him naked to his enemies. No, Ben, Kung saw that Mike's position had been enormously strengthened by a few bars of music and an old sheet, even if you did not. And Kung did not like it a bit. But I acted through necessity, not choice. And while Mike's position was improved, it was still not an easy one. Mike was, for the nonce, the acknowledged sovereign of Mars under the legalistic malarkey of the Larkin precedent. And as such, was empowered to hand out concessions, trading rights, enclaves, ad nauseum. He must either do these things himself, and thus be subjected to pressures even worse than those attendant on great wealth, and for which he is even less fitted? Or he must abdicate his titular position and allow his Larkin rights to devolve on those twenty-three men now on Mars, i.e., to Douglas. Jubal looked pained. I disliked these alternatives almost equally since each was based on the detestable doctrine that the Larkin decision could apply to inhabited planets. Gentlemen, 
I have never met any Martians. I have no vocation to be their champion. But I could not permit a client of mine to be trapped into such a farce. The Larkin decision itself had to be rendered void, and all rights under it with respect to the planet Mars. While the matter was still in our hands, and without giving the High Court a chance to rule. Jubal grinned boyishly. So I appealed to a higher court for a decision that would nullify the Larkin precedent. I cited a mythical British colonial shipping board. I lied myself blue in the face to create a new legal theory. Sovereign honors had been rendered Mike. That was fact. The world had seen it. But sovereign honors may be rendered to a sovereign, or to a sovereign's alter ego, his viceroy or ambassador. So I asserted that Mike was no cardboard sovereign under a silly human precedent not in point, but in awful fact the ambassador of the great Martian nation. Jubal sighed. Sheer bluff. And I was scared silly that I would be required to prove my claims— but I was staking my bluff on my hope and strong belief that others, Douglas and in particular Kung, would be no more certain of the facts than was I. Jubal looked around him. But I ventured to risk that bluff because you three were sitting with us, were Mike's water brethren. If you three sat by and did not challenge my lies, then Mike must be accepted as the Martian equivalent of ambassador, and the Larkin decision was a dead issue. I hope it is, Captain Van Tromp said soberly. But I did not take your statements as lies, Jubal. I took them as simple truth. Eh? But I assure you they were not. I was spinning fancy words, extemporizing. No matter. Inspiration or deduction? I think you told the truth. The skipper of the champion hesitated. Except that I would not call Mike an ambassador. I think he's an expeditionary force. Caxton's jaw dropped. Harshaw did not dispute him, but answered with equal soberness. In what way, sir? Van Tromp said, I'll amend that. It would be better to say that I think he's a scout for an expeditionary force, reconnoitering us for his Martian masters. It is even possible that they are in telepathic contact with him at all times, that he doesn't even need to report back. I don't know. But I do know that, after visiting Mars, I find such ideas much easier to swallow. And I know this. Everybody seems to take it for granted that Finding a human being on Mars, we would, of course, bring him home, and that he would be anxious to come home. Nothing could be further from the truth. Eh, Sven? Mike hated the idea, agreed Nelson. We couldn't even get close to him at first. He was afraid of us. Then he was ordered to go back with us. And from then on he did exactly what we told him to do. He behaved like a soldier, carrying out with perfect discipline orders that scared him silly. Just a moment, Caxton protested. Captain, even so, Mars attack us. Mars? You know more about these things than I do. But wouldn't that be about like us attacking Jupiter? I mean to say... We have about two and a half times the surface gravity that Mars has, just as Jupiter has about two and a half times our surface gravity. Somewhat analogous differences each way, on pressure, temperature, atmosphere, and so forth. We couldn't stay alive on Jupiter. And I don't see how Martians could stand our conditions. Isn't that true? Close enough, admitted Van Tromp. Then tell me why we should attack Jupiter, or Mars attack us. Hmm. Ben, have you seen any of the proposals to attempt a beachhead on Jupiter? Yes, but, well, nothing has ever gotten beyond the dream stage. It isn't practical. 
space flight wasn't practical less than a century ago. Go back in the files and see what your own colleagues said about it. Oh, say about 1940. These Jupiter proposals are at best no farther than drawing board. But the engineers working on them are quite serious. They think that by using all that we've learned from deep ocean exploration, plus equipping men with powered suits in which to float, it should be possible to put human beings on Jupiter. And don't think for a moment that the Martians are any less clever than we are. You should see their cities. Ah, uh, said Caxton. Okay, I'll shut up. I don't see why they would bother. Captain? Yes, Jubal. I see another objection. A cultural one. You know the rough division of cultures into Apollonian and Dionysian? I know in general what you mean. Well, it seems to me that even the Zuni culture would be called Dionysian on Mars. Of course, you've been there and I haven't. But I've been talking steadily with Mike. That boy was raised in an extremely Apollonian culture. And such cultures are not aggressive. Hmm. I see your point. But I wouldn't count on it. Mahmoud said suddenly, Skipper, there's strong evidence to support Jubal's conclusion. You can analyze a culture from its language every time. And there isn't any Martian word for war. He stopped and looked puzzled. At least I don't think there is. Nor any word for weapon nor for fighting. If a word for a concept isn't in a language, then its culture simply doesn't have the referent the missing word would symbolize. Oh, twaddle, stinky! Animals fight, and ants even conduct wars. Are you trying to tell me they have to have words for it before they can do it? I mean exactly that, Mahmoud insisted, when it applies to any verbalizing race such as ourselves, such as the Martians, even more highly verbalized than we are. A verbalizing race has words for every old concept and creates new words or new definitions for old words whenever a new concept comes along. Always. A nervous system that is able to verbalize cannot avoid verbalizing. It's automatic. If the Martians know what war is, then they have a word for it. There is a quick way to settle it, Jubal suggested. Call in Mike. Ask him. Just a moment, Jubal, Van Tromp objected. I learned years ago never to argue with a specialist. You can't win. But I also learned that the history of progress is a long, long list of specialists who were dead wrong when they were most certain. Sorry, Stinky. You're quite right, Captain. Only I'm not wrong this time. As may be, all Mike can settle is whether or not he knows a certain word, which might be like asking a two-year-old to define calculus. Proves nothing. I'd like to stick to facts for a moment. Sven, about Agnew. Nelson answered. It's up to you, Captain. Well... This is still private conversation among Water Brothers, gentlemen. Lieutenant Agnew was our junior medical officer, quite brilliant in his line, Sven tells me, and I had no complaints about him otherwise. He was well enough liked, but he had an unsuspected latent xenophobia, not against humans, but he couldn't stand Martians. Now, I had given orders against going armed outside the ship once it appeared that the Martians were peaceful. Too much chance of an incident. Apparently, young Agnew disobeyed me. At least we were never able to find his personal sidearm later, and the two men who last saw him alive say that he was wearing it. But all my log shows is missing and presumed dead. Here is why. 
Two crewmen saw Agnew go into a sort of passage between two large rocks, rather scarce on Mars. Mostly, it's monotonous. Then they saw a Martian enter the same way, whereupon they hurried, as Dr. Agnew's peculiarity was well known. Both say that they heard a shot. One says that he reached this opening in time to glimpse Agnew past the Martian, who pretty well filled the space between the rocks. They're so big. And then he didn't see him. The second man says that when he got there, the Martian was just exiting, simply sailed on past them and went his way, which is characteristically Martian. If he has no business with you, he simply ignores you. With the Martian out of the way, they could both see the space between the two rocks. And it was a dead end, empty. That's all, gentlemen. Except to say that Agnew might have jumped that rock wall under Mars' low surface gravity and the impetus of fear. But I could not, and I tried. And to mention that these two crewmen were wearing breathing gear, have to on Mars, and hypoxia can make a man's senses quite unreliable. I don't know that the first crewman was drunk through oxygen shortage. I just mention it because it is an explanation easier to believe than what he reported, which is that Agnew simply disappeared in the blink of an eye. In fact, I suggested as much to him and ordered him to check the demand valve and the rest of his breather gear before he went outside again. You see, I thought Agnew would show up presently, and I was looking forward to chewing him out and slapping him under hack for going armed, if he was, and for going alone, which seemed certain, both being flagrant breaches of discipline. But he never returned. We never found him nor his body. I do not know what happened, but my own misgivings about Martians date to that incident. They never again seem to me to be just big, gentle, harmless, rather comical creatures. Even though we never had any trouble with them, and they always gave us anything we wanted, once Stinky figured out how to ask for it, I played down the incident. Can't let men panic when you're a hundred million miles from home. Oh, I couldn't play down the fact that Dr. Agnew was missing and the whole ship's company searched for him. But I squelched any suggestion that there had been anything mysterious about it. Agnew had gotten lost among those rocks, had eventually died, no doubt, when his oxygen ran out, and was buried under sand drift or something. You do get quite a breeze both at sunrise and sundown on Mars. It does cause the sand to drift. So I used it as a reason to clamp down even harder on always traveling in company, always staying in radio contact with the ship, always checking breather gear, with Agnew as a horrible example. I did not tell that crewman to keep his mouth shut. I simply hinted that his story was unbelievable, especially as his mate was not able to back it up. I think the official version prevailed. Mahmoud said slowly, It did with me, Captain. This is the first time I've heard that there was any mystery about Agnew, and truthfully, I prefer your official version. I'm not inclined to be superstitious. Van Tromp nodded. That's what I had hoped for. Only Sven and myself heard that crewman's wild tale, and we kept it to ourselves, but just the same. The spaceship captain suddenly looked old. I still wake up in the night and ask myself, 
What became of Agnew? Jubal listened to the story without comment. He was still wondering what he should add to it when it ended. He wondered, too, if Jill had told Ben about Berquist and that other fellow, Johnson. He knew that he had not. There hadn't been time the night Ben had been rescued. And in the sober light of the following dawn, it had seemed better to let such things ride. Had the kids told Ben about the Battle of the Swimming Pool? And the two carloads of cops who were missing afterwards? Again, it seemed most unlikely. The kids knew that the official version was that the first task force had never showed up. They had all heard his phone call with Douglas. All Jubal's family were discreet. Whether guests or employees, gossipy persons were quickly ousted. Jubal regarded gossip as his own prerogative, solely. But Jill might have told Ben... Well, if she had, she must have bound him to silence. Ben had not mentioned disappearances to Jubal, and he wasn't trying to catch Jubal's eye now. Damn it. The only thing to do was to keep quiet and go on trying to impress on the boy that he simply must not go around making unpleasant strangers disappear. Jubal was saved from further soul-searching, and the stag conversation was broken up by Anne's arrival. Boss, that Mr. Bradley is at the door. The one who called himself Senior Executive Assistant to the Secretary General. You didn't let him in? No. I looked at him through the one way and talked to him through the speaky. He says he has papers to deliver to you personally, and that he will wait for an answer. Have him pass them through the flap, and you tell him that you are my senior executive assistant, and that you will fetch my receipt acknowledging personal delivery if that is what he wants. This is still the Martian embassy, until I check what's in those papers. Just let him stand in the corridor. I've no doubt that Major Block can find him a chair. And I am aware that you were gently reared, but this is a situation in which rudeness pays off. We don't give an inch, nor a kind word, until we get exactly what we want. Yes, boss. The package was bulky because there were many copies. There was one document only. Jubal called in everyone and passed them around. Girls, I am offering one lollipop for each loophole, booby trap, or ambiguity. Prizes of similar value to males. Now, everybody keep quiet. Presently, Jubal broke the silence. He's an honest politician. He stays bought. Looks that way, admitted Caxton. Anybody? No one claimed a prize. Douglas had kept it simple and straightforward, merely implementing the agreement reached earlier. Okay, said Jubal. Everybody is to witness every copy after Mike signs it. Especially you, Skipper, and Sven and Stinky. Get your seal, Miriam. Hell, let Bradley in now and have him witness too. Then give the poor guy a drink. Duke, call the desk and tell him to send up the bill. We're checking out. Then call Greyhound and tell him we want our go buggy. Sven, Skipper, Stinky, we're getting out of here the way Lot left Sodom. Why don't you three come up in the country with us? Take off your shoes and relax. Plenty of beds, home cooking, and no worries. The two married men asked for and received rain checks. Dr. Mahmoud accepted. The signing took rather long, mostly because Mike enjoyed signing his name, drawing each letter with great care and artistic satisfaction. The salvageable remains of the picnic, mostly unopened bottles, had been sent up and loaded by the time all copies were signed and sealed, and the hotel bill had arrived. Jubal glanced at the fat total and did not bother to add it. Instead, he wrote on it, Approved for payment, 
J. Harshaw for V. M. Smith, and handed it to Bradley. This is your boss's worry now, he told Bradley. Bradley blinked. Sir? Oh, just to keep it via channels. Mr. Douglas will doubtless turn it over to the chief of protocol. Isn't that the usual procedure? I'm rather green about these things. Bradley accepted the bill. Yes, he said slowly. Yes. That's right. LaRue will voucher it. I'll give it to him. Thank you, Mr. Bradley. Thanks for everything. Part 3 His Eccentric Education 22 in one limb of a spiral galaxy, close to a star known as Saul, to some of its dependents, another star of the same type underwent catastrophic readjustment and became Nova. Its glory would be seen on Mars in another three replenished 729 years, or 1,370 Terran years. The Old Ones noted the coming event as being useful shortly for instruction of the young, while never ceasing the exciting and crucial discussion of aesthetic problems concerning the new epoch woven around the death of the fifth planet. The departure of the spaceship champion for its home planet was noted without comment, and a watch was kept on the strange nestling sent back in it, but nothing more since it would be some time yet before it would be fruitful to grok the outcome. The twenty-three humans left behind on Mars coped, successfully in most ways, with an environment lethal to naked humans, but less difficult on the whole than that in the free state of Antarctica. One of them, discorporated through an undiagnosed illness sometimes called heartbreak, and at other times homesickness. The old ones cherished the wounded spirit and sent it back where it belonged for further healing. Aside from that, the Martians left the Terrans alone. On Earth, the exploding neighbor star was not noticed at all, human astronomers still being limited by speed of light. The man from Mars, having been briefly back in the news, had dropped out of the news again. The minority leader in the Federation Senate called for a bold new approach to the twin problems of population and malnutrition in Southeast Asia, starting with increased emergency grants in aid to families with more than five children. Mrs. Percy B. S. Suchek sued the supervisors of Los Angeles City County over the death of her pet poodle Piddle which had taken place during a five-day period of stationary inversion lair. Cynthia Duchess announced that she was going to have the perfect baby by a scientifically selected anonymous donor and an equally perfect host mother just as soon as a battery of experts completed calculating the exact instant for conception to ensure that the wonder child would be equally a genius in music, art, and statesmanship, and that she would, with the aid of hormonal treatments, nurse her child herself. She gave out a statement to the press on the psychological benefits of natural feeding and permitted, or insisted, that the press take pictures of her to prove that she was physically endowed for this happy duty a fact that her usual publicity pictures had never really left undecided. Supreme Bishop Digby denounced her as the harlot of Babylon and forbade any Fosterite to accept the commission, either as donor or host mother. Alice Douglas was quoted as saying, While I do not know Miss Duchess personally, one cannot help but admire her. Her brave example should be an inspiration to mothers everywhere. By accident, Jubal Harshaw saw one of the pictures and the accompanying story in a magazine some visitor had left in his house. He chuckled over it and posted it on the bulletin board in the kitchen, 
then noted, as he had expected, that it did not stay up long, which made him chuckle again. He did not have too many chuckles that week. The world had been too much with him. The working press soon ceased bothering Mike and the Harshaw household when it was clear that the story was over and that Harshaw did not intend to let any fresh news happen. But a great many thousands of other people not in the news business did not forget Mike. Douglas honestly tried to ensure Mike's privacy. SS troopers now patrolled Harshaw's fence, and an SS car circled over the grounds and challenged any car that tried to land. But Harshaw resented the necessity of having guards. Guards kept people out. The mail and the telephone came through. The telephone Jubal coped with by changing his call number and having all calls routed through an answering service to which was given a very limited list of persons from whom Harshaw would accept calls. And at that, he kept the instrument in the house set on refuse and record most of the time. But the mail always comes through. At first, Harshaw told Jill that the problem was Mike's. The boy had to grow up some day. He could start by handling his own mail, and she could help and advise him. But don't bother me with it. I have enough trouble with screwball mail of my own. Jubal could not make his decision stick. There was too much of it, and Jill simply did not know how. Just sorting the mail into categories was a headache. Jubal solved that by first making a phone call to the local postmaster, which got no results, then by a phone call to Bradley, which did get results after a suggestion from on high trickled back down to local level. Thereafter, mail for Mike arrived sacked as first class, second class, third class, and fourth class, with mail for everyone else in the household in still another sack. Second and third class mail was used to insulate a new root cellar north of the house, the old root cellar having been dug by the former owner as a fallout shelter and never having been satisfactory as a root cellar. Once the new root cellar was heavily over-insulated and could use no more, Jubal told Duke to dump such mail as fill to check erosion in gullies. Combined with a small amount of brush, such mail compacted very nicely. Fourth-class mail was a problem, especially as one package exploded prematurely in the village post office, blowing several years of wanted announcements off the notice board and ruining one use next window sign. By great good luck, the postmaster was out for coffee, and his assistant, an elderly lady with weak kidneys, was safe in the washroom. Jubal considered having all fourth-class mail addressed to Mike processed by the bomb disposal specialists of the SS, who performed the same service for the Secretary General. This turned out not to be necessary. Mike could spot a wrongness about a package without opening it. Thereafter, all fourth-class mail was unsacked in a heap just inside the gate. Then, after the postman had left, Mike would pry through the pile from a distance, cause to disappear any harmful parcel. Then Larry would truck the remainder to the house. Jubal felt that this method was far better than soaking suspect packages, opening them in darkness, X-raying them, or any other conventional method. Mike loved opening the harmless packages. It made every day Christmas for him. He particularly enjoyed reading his own name on address labels. The plunder inside might or might not interest him. Usually he gave it to one of the others, and in the process at last learned what property was in discovering that he could make gifts to his friends. Anything that nobody wanted wound up in a gully. This included, by definition, all gifts of food, as Jubal was not certain that Mike's nose for wrongness extended to poisons especially after Mike had drunk, through error, a beaker of poisonous solution Duke had left in the refrigerator he used for his photographic work. Mike had simply said mildly that the iced tea had a flavor he was not sure that he liked. Jubal told Jill that it was otherwise all right to keep anything that came to Mike by parcel post, provided that none of it was A, 
ever paid for, B, ever acknowledged, C, nor ever returned, no matter how marked. Some of the items were legitimately gifts. More of it was unordered merchandise. Either way, Jubal assumed conclusively that unsolicited chattels from strangers always represented efforts to make use of the man from Mars and therefore merited no thanks. An exception was made for livestock, from baby chicks to baby alligators, which Jubal advised her to return unless she was willing to guarantee the care and feeding thereof and the responsibility of keeping same from falling into the pool. First-class mail was a separate headache. After looking over a bushel or so of Mike's first-class mail, Jubal set up a list of categories. A. Begging letters, personal and institutional, erosion fill. B. Threatening letters, file unanswered, second and later letters from any one source to be turned over to SS. C. Offers of business deals of any nature, forward to Douglas, unanswered. D. Crackpot letters not containing threats. Pass around any real dillies. The rest to go in a gully. E. Friendly letters. Answer only if accompanied by stamped self-addressed envelope. In which case use one of several form letters to be signed by Jill. Jubal pointed out that letters signed by the man from Mars were valuable, per se, and an open invitation to more useless mail. F. Scatological letters passed to Jubal, who had a bet with himself that no such letter would ever show the faintest sign of literary novelty for further disposition, i.e., gully. G. Proposals of marriage and propositions not quite so formal. Ignore and file. Use procedure under B on third offense. H. Letters from scientific and educational institutions. Handle as under E. If answered at all, use form letter explaining that the man from Mars was not available for anything. If Jill felt that a form brush-off would not do, pass along to Jubal. I. Letters from persons who actually had met Mike, such as all the crew of the champion, the president of the United States, and a few others. Let Mike answer them exactly as he pleased. The exercise in penmanship would be good for him, and the exercise in human personal relations he needed even more. And if he wanted advice, let him ask for it. This guide cut the number of letters that had to be answered down to manageable size, a few each day for Jill, seldom even one for Mike. Just opening the mail took a major effort, but Jill found that she could skim and classify in about one hour each day after she got used to it. The first four categories remained large at all times. Category G was very large during the fortnight following the world stereocast from the palace, then dwindled, and the curve flattened to a steady trickle. Jubal cautioned Jill that, while Mike should himself answer letters only from acquaintances and friends, mail addressed to him was his to read if he wished. The third morning after the category system had gone into effect, Jill brought a letter, Category G, to Jubal. More than half of the ladies and other females, plus a few misguided males, who supplied this category included pictures alleged to be of themselves. Some of these pictures left little to the imagination, as did the letters themselves in many cases. This letter enclosed a picture which managed not only to leave nothing to the imagination, but started over by stimulating fresh imaginings. Jill said, Look at this, boss, I ask you. Jubal read the letter, then looked at the picture. She seems to know what she wants. What does Mike think of it? He hasn't seen it. That's why I brought it to you. Jubal glanced again at the picture. A type which in my youth we referred to as stacked. Well... Her sex is not in doubt, nor her agility. But why are you showing it to me? I've seen better, I assure you. But what should I do with it? The letter is bad enough, but that disgusting picture. Should I tear it up? Before Mike sees it. Oh, sit down, nurse. What does it say on the envelope? Nothing. 
Just the address and the return address. How does the address read? Huh? Mr. Valentine Michael Smith, the man from... Oh, then it's not addressed to you. Why, no, of course... That's all I wanted to be sure of. Now let's get something straight. I am not Mike's guardian. You are neither his mother nor his chaperone. I've simply co-opted you as his secretary. If Mike wants to read everything that comes in here addressed to him, including third-class junk mail, he is free to do so. Well, he does read almost all of those ads, but surely you don't want him to see filth. Jubal, Mike doesn't know what the world is like. He's innocent. So? How many men has he killed so far, Jill? Jill did not answer. She looked unhappy. Jubal went on. If you want to help him, you will concentrate on teaching him that casual killing is frowned on in this society. Otherwise, he is bound to be unpleasantly conspicuous when he goes out into the world. Ah, uh, I don't think he wants to go out into the world. Well, I'm damn well going to push him out of the nest as soon as I think he can fly. He can come back later if he wishes but I shan't make it possible for him to live out his life here as an arrested infant. For one thing, I can't, even if I wanted to, because Mike will probably outlive me by sixty or seventy years, and this nest will be gone. But you are correct. Mike is innocent, by our standards. Nurse, have you ever seen that sterile laboratory at Notre Dame? No, I've read about it healthiest animals in the world, but they can't ever leave the laboratory. Child, I'm not running a sterile laboratory. Mike has got to get acquainted with filth, as you call it, and get immunized to it. One day he's going to meet the gal who wrote this letter, or her spiritual twin sister. In fact, he's going to meet her by the dozens and hundreds. Shucks, with his notoriety and his looks, he can spend his life skipping from one warm bed to another if he likes. You can't stop it. I can't stop it. It's up to Mike. Furthermore, I wouldn't want to stop it. Although for my taste, it's a silly way to spend one's life. Doing the same monotonous exercises over and over again, I mean. What do you think? I... Jill stopped and blushed. I withdraw the question. Maybe you don't find them monotonous. But none of my business either way. But if you don't want Mike's feet kicked out from under him by the first five hundred women to get him alone, then I don't regard it as a good idea either. He should have other interests as well. Then don't try to intercept his mail. Letters like that may vaccinate him a little, or at least tend to put him on guard. Don't make a thing out of it. Just pass it along in the stack. Come, filthy picture. Answer his questions if he asks them. And try not to blush. Ah, uh, all right. Boss, you're infuriating when you're logical. Yes, a most uncouth way to argue. Now run along. All right, but I'm going to tear up that picture after Mike has seen it. Oh, don't do that. What? Do you want it, boss? Heaven forbid. I told you I had seen much better. But Duke is not as jaundiced as I am. He collects such pictures. If Mike doesn't want it, and five to one he doesn't, give it to Duke. He'll be delighted. Duke collects such trash? But he seems such a nice person. He is a very nice person indeed. Or I'd kick him out. I don't understand it. Jubal sighed. And I could sit here all day explaining it, and you still wouldn't understand it. My dear, there are aspects of sex on which it is impossible to communicate between the two sexes of our race. They are sometimes grokked by intuition across the gulf that separates us by a few exceptionally gifted individuals. But words are useless so I won't try. Just take my word for it. Duke is a perfect knight. 
sans peur et sans reproche. And he would like to have that picture. All right, he can have it if Mike doesn't keep it. But I'll just pass it along to you. I won't give it to Duke myself. He might get ideas. Sissy, you might enjoy his ideas. Anything startling in the mail otherwise? No, the usual crop of people who want Mike to endorse this and that, or peddle official man from Mars, thises and thats. One character had the nerve to ask for a five-year monopoly, royalty-free, on the name, but wants Mike to finance it as well. I admire that sort of wholehearted thief. Encourage him. Tell him that Mike is so rich that he makes crepe Suzettes with Napoleon brandy and needs some tax losses. So how much guarantee would he like? Are you serious, boss? I'll have to dig it out of the group already sacked for Mr. Douglas. Of course I'm not serious. The Gunniff would have to show up here tomorrow with his family. But you've given me a fine idea for a story, so run along. Front! Mike was not uninterested in the disgusting picture. He grokked correctly, if only theoretically, what the letter and the picture symbolized, and studied the picture with the clear-eyed delight with which he studied each passing butterfly. He found both butterflies and women tremendously interesting. In fact, all the grokking world around him was enchanting, and he wanted to drink so deep of it all that his own grokking would be perfect. He understood intellectually the mechanical and biological processes being offered to him in these letters. But he wondered why these strangers wanted his help in quickening their eggs. Mike understood, without grokking it, that these people made ritual of this simple necessity, a uh, growing closer, possibly almost as important and precious as the water ceremony. He was eager to grok it. But he was not in a hurry, hurry being one human concept he had failed to grok at all. He was sensitively aware of the key importance of correct timing in all acts. But with the Martian approach, correct timing was accomplished by waiting. He had noticed, of course, that his human brothers lacked his own fine discrimination of time and often were forced to wait a little faster than a Martian would. But he did not hold their innocent awkwardness against them. He simply learned to wait faster himself to cover their lack. In fact, he sometimes waited faster so efficiently that a human would have concluded that he was hurrying at breakneck speed. But the human would have been mistaken. Mike was simply adjusting his own waiting in warm consideration for the needs of others. So he accepted Jill's edict that he was not to reply to any of these brotherly offers from female humans, but he accepted it not as a final veto, but as a waiting Possibly a century hence would be better. In any case, now was not the correct time, since his water brother Jill spoke rightly. Mike readily assented when Jill suggested quite firmly that he give this picture to Duke. He went at once to do so, and would have done so anyhow. Mike knew about Duke's collection. He had seen it, looked through it with deep interest, trying to grok why Duke said... That one ain't much in the face, but look at those legs. Brother! It always made Mike feel good to be called brother by one of his water brothers, but legs were just legs, save that his own people had three each, while humans each had only two. Without being crippled thereby, he reminded himself, two legs were proper for humans. He must always grok that this was correct. As for faces, Jubal had the most beautiful face Mike had ever seen, clearly and distinctly his own. It seemed to Mike that these human females in Duke's picture collection could hardly be said to have grown faces as yet. So much did one look like the other in the face. All young human females had much the same face. How could it be otherwise? Of course, he had never had any trouble recognizing Jill's face. She was not only the first woman he had ever seen, but, most important, his first female water brother. Mike knew every pore on her nose, 
every incipient wrinkle in her face, and had praised each one in happy meditation. But while he now knew Anne from Dorcas and Dorcas from Miriam by their faces alone, it had not been so when first he came here. For several days Mike had distinguished between them by size and coloration, and of course by voice, since no two voices were ever alike. But, as sometimes did happen, all three females would be quiet at once, and then it was well that Anne was so much bigger, Dorcas so small, and that Miriam, who was bigger than Dorcas but smaller than Anne, nevertheless need not be mistaken for the missing one if either Anne or Dorcas was absent, because Miriam had unmistakable hair called red, even though it was not the color called red when speaking of anything but hair. This special meaning for red did not trouble Mike. He knew before he reached earth that every English word held more than one meaning. It was a fact one could get used to without grokking, just as the sameness of all girl faces could be gotten used to. And after waiting, they were no longer quite the same. Mike now could call up Anne's face in his mind and count the pores in her nose as readily as with Jill's. In essence, even an egg was uniquely itself, different from all other eggs anywhere and when. Mike had always known that. So each girl had her own face, no matter how small those differences might be. Mike gave the disgusting picture to Duke and was warmed by Duke's pleasure. Mike did not feel that he was depriving himself in parting with the picture. He had seen it once. He could see it in his mind whenever he wished. Even the face in that picture, as it had glowed with a most unusual expression of beautiful pain. He accepted Duke's thanks gravely and went happily back to read the rest of his mail. Mike did not share Jubal's annoyance at the avalanche of mail. He reveled in it. The insurance ads quite as much as the marriage proposals. His trip to the palace had opened his eyes to the enormous variety in this world, and he was resolved to grok it all. He could see that it would take him several centuries, and that he must grow and grow and grow, but he was undaunted and in no hurry. He grokked that eternity and the ever-beautifully changing now were identical. He had decided not to reread the Encyclopedia Britannica, the flood of mail gave him brighter glimpses of the world. He read it, grokked what he could, remembered the rest for contemplation at night while the household slept. From these nights of meditation he was beginning, he thought, to grok business and money and buying and selling, and related to unmartian activities. The articles in the encyclopedia had always left him feeling unfilled, as, he now grokked, each one had assumed that he knew many things that he did not know. But there arrived in the mail from Mr. Secretary General Joseph Edgerton Douglas, a checkbook and other papers, and his brother Jubal had taken great pains to explain to him what money was and how it was used. Mike had failed utterly to understand it at first, even though Jubal showed him how to make out his first check gave him money in exchange for it, taught him how to count it. Then suddenly, with a grokking so blinding that he trembled and forced himself not to withdraw, he understood the abstract, symbolic nature of money. These pretty pictures and bright medallions were not money. They were concrete symbols for an abstract idea which spread all through these people, all through their world. But these things were not money. Any more than water shared in water ceremony was the growing closer. Water was not necessary to the ceremony, and these pretty things were not necessary to money. Money was an idea, as abstract as an old one's thoughts. Money was a great structured symbol for balancing and healing and growing closer. Mike was dazzled with the magnificent beauty of money. The flow and change and counter-marching of the symbols was another matter, beautiful and small, but reminding him of games taught to nestlings to encourage them to learn to reason correctly and grow. 
It was the total structure that dazzled him. The idea that an entire world could be reflected in one dynamic, completely interconnected, symbol structure. Mike grokked then that the old ones of this race were very old indeed to have composed such beauty, and he wished humbly that he might soon be allowed to meet one of them. Jubal encouraged him to spend some of his money, and Mike did so with the timid, uncertain eagerness of a bride being brought to bed. Jubal suggested that he buy presents for his friends, and Jill helped him with it, starting by placing arbitrary limits. Only one present for each friend, and a total cost that was not even a reciprocal filled three of the sum that had been placed to his account. Mike's original intention had been to spend all of that pretty balance on his friends. He quickly learned how difficult it is to spend money. There were so many things from which to choose, all of them wonderful and most of them incomprehensible. Surrounded by thick catalogues from Marshall Fields to the Ginza and backed by way of Bombay and Copenhagen, he felt smothered in a plethora of riches. Even the Sears and Montgomery catalog was too much for him. But Jill helped. No, Mike, Duke would not want a tractor. Duke likes tractors. Um, maybe. But he's got one, or Jubal has, which is the same thing. He might like one of those cute little Belgian unicycles. He could take it apart and put it together and shine it all day long. But even that is too expensive. What with the taxes? Mike, dear, a present ought not to be very expensive, unless you are trying to get a girl to marry you or something. Especially something. But a present should show that you thought about it and considered that person's tastes. Something he would enjoy, but probably would not buy for himself. How? That's always the problem. Wait a minute. I just remembered something in this morning's mail. I hope Larry hasn't carted it off yet. She was back quickly. Found it. Listen to this. Living Aphrodite, a deluxe album of feminine beauty in gorgeous stereo color by the world's greatest artists of the camera. Notice, this item will not be sent by mail. It will be forwarded at purchaser's risk by prepaid express only. Orders cannot be accepted from addresses in the following states. Um, Pennsylvania is on the verboten list, but don't let that worry you. If it is addressed to you, it will be delivered, and if I know Duke's vulgar tastes, this is just what he would like. Duke did like it. It was delivered, not by express, but via the SS patrol car capping the house and the next ad for the same item to arrive in the house boasted, exactly as supplied to the man from Mars by special appointment, which pleased Mike and annoyed Jill. Other presents were just as difficult, but picking a present for Jubal was supremely difficult. Jill was stumped. What does one buy for a man who has everything? Everything, that is to say, that he wants which money can buy. The Sphinx, Three Wishes, the Fountain that Ponce de Leon failed to find, Oil for his ancient bones, or One Golden Day of Youth. Jubal had long ago even forsworn pets because he outlived them, or worse yet, it was now possible that a pet would outlive him, be orphaned. Privately they consulted the others. Shucks, Duke told them. Didn't you know? The boss likes statues. Really? Jill answered. I don't see any sculpture around. That's because most of the stuff he likes isn't for sale. He says that the crud they're making nowadays looks like a disaster in a junkyard, and any idiot with a blowtorch and astigmatism can set himself up as a sculptor. Anne nodded thoughtfully. I think Duke is right. You can tell what Jubal's tastes in sculpture are by looking at the books in his study, but I doubt if it will help much. Nevertheless, they looked. 
Anne and Jill and Mike, and Anne picked out three books as bearing evidence to her eyes of having been looked at most often. Hmm, she said. It's clear that the boss would like anything by Rodin. Mike, if you could buy one of these for Jubal, which one would you pick? Oh, here's a pretty one. Eternal Springtime. Mike barely glanced at it and turned the page. This one. What? Jill looked at it and shuddered. Mike, that one is perfectly dreadful. I hope I die long before I look like that. That is beauty, Mike said firmly. Mike, Jill protested, you've got a depraved taste. You're worse than Duke, or else you just don't know any better. Ordinarily, such a rebuke from a water brother, most especially from Jill, would have shut Mike up, forced him to spend the following night in trying to understand his fault. But this was art in which he was sure of himself. The portrayed statue was the first thing he had seen on earth which felt like a breath of home to him. Although it was clearly a picture of a human woman, it gave him a feeling that a Martian old one should be somewhere around, responsible for its creation. It is beauty, he insisted stubbornly. She has her own face. I grok. Jill, Anne said slowly, Mike is right. Huh? Anne, surely you don't like that. It frightens me, but Mike knows what Jubal likes. Look at the book itself. It falls open naturally to any one of three places. Now look at the pages. This page has been handled more than the other two. Mike has picked the boss's favorite. This other one, the caryatid who has fallen under the weight of her stone. He likes almost as well. But Mike's choice is Jubal's pet. I buy it, Mike said decisively. But it was not for sale. Anne telephoned the Rodin Museum in Paris on Mike's behalf, and only Gallic gallantry and her beauty kept them from laughing in her face. Sell one of the master's works? My dear lady, they are not only not for sale, but they may not be reproduced. No, no, no. Kelly Day. But for the man from Mars, some things are possible which are not possible for others. Anne called Bradley. A couple of days later, he called her back. As a compliment from the French government, no fee, but a strongly couched request that the present never be publicly exhibited, Mike would receive not the original, but a full size, microscopically exact replica a bronze photopantogram of she who used to be the beautiful Olmier. Jill helped Mike select presents for the girls. Here she knew her ground. But when he asked her what he should buy for her, she not only did not help but insisted that he must not buy her anything. Mike was beginning to realize that while a water brother always spoke rightly, Sometimes they spoke more rightly than others, i.e., that the English language had depths to it, and it was sometimes necessary to probe to reach the right depth. So he consulted Anne. Go ahead and buy her a present, dear. She has to tell you that. But you give her a present anyhow. Hmm. Anne vetoed clothes and jewelry, finally selected for him a present which puzzled him, Jill already smelled exactly the way Jill should smell. The small size and apparent unimportance of the present, when it arrived, added to his misgivings. And when Anne let him whiff it, before having him give it to Jill, Mike was more in doubt than ever. The odor was very strong and smelled not at all like Jill. Nevertheless, Anne was right. Jill was delighted with the perfume and insisted on kissing him at once. In kissing her, he grokked fully that this gift was what she wanted, and that it made them grow closer. When she wore it at dinner that night, he discovered that the fragrance truly did not differ from that of Jill herself, 
In some unclear fashion, it simply made Jill smell more deliciously like Jill than ever. Still stranger, it caused Dorcas to kiss him and whisper, My gun, the negligee is lovely and just what I wanted, but perhaps some day you'll give me perfume. Mike could not grok why Dorcas would want it since Dorcas did not smell at all like Jill, and therefore perfume would not be proper for her. Nor, he realized, would he want Dorcas to smell like Jill. He wanted Dorcas to smell like Dorcas. Jubal interrupted with, Quit nuzzling the lad and let him eat his dinner. Dorcas, you already reek like a Marseille cat house. Don't wheedle Mike for more stinkum. Boss, you mind your own business. It was all very puzzling, both that Jill could smell still more like Jill, and that Dorcas should wish to smell like Jill when she already smelled like herself, and that Jubal would say that Dorcas smelled like a cat when she did not. There was a cat who lived on the place, not as a pet, but as co-owner. On rare occasions it came to the house and deigned to accept a handout. The cat and Mike had grokked each other at once, and Mike had found its carnivorous thoughts most pleasing and quite Martian. He had discovered, too, that the cat's name, Friedrich Wilhelm Nietzsche, was not the cat's name at all. But he had not told anyone this because he could not pronounce the cat's real name. He could only hear it in his head. The cat did not smell like Dorcas. Giving presents was a great goodness, and the buying thereof taught Mike much about the true value of money. But he had not forgotten even momentarily that there were other things he was eager to grok. Jubal had put off Senator Boone's invitation to Mike twice without mentioning it to Mike, and Mike had not noticed. Since his quite different grasp of time made next Sunday no particular date. But the next repetition of the invitation came by mail and was addressed to Mike. Senator Boone was under pressure from Supreme Bishop Digby to produce the man from Mars, and Boone had sensed that Harshaw was stalling him and might stall indefinitely. Mike took it to Jubal, stood waiting. Well, Jubal growled, do you want to go or don't you? You don't have to attend a fosterite service. We can tell him to go to hell. So a checker cab with a human driver... Harshaw refused to trust his life to an autocab, picked them up the next Sunday morning, and delivered Mike, Jill, and Jubal to a public landing flat just outside the sacred grounds of Archangel Foster Tabernacle of the Church of the New Revelation. Twenty-three. Jubal had been trying to warn Mike all the way to church. Of what? Mike was not certain. He had listened. He always listened. But the landscape below them tugged for attention, too. He had compromised by storing what Jubal said. Now look, boy, Jubal had admonished, these Fosterites are after your money. That's all right. Most everybody is after your money. You just have to be firm. Your money and the prestige of having the man from Mars join their church. They're going to work on you, and you have to be firm about that, too. Beg pardon? Damn it. I don't believe you've been listening. I am sorry, Jubal. Well, look at it this way. Religion is a solace to many people, and it is even conceivable that some religion, somewhere, really is ultimate truth. But in many cases, being religious is merely a form of conceit. The Bible belt faith in which I was brought up encouraged me to think that I was better than the rest of the world. I was saved, and they were damned. We were in a state of grace, and the rest of the world were heathens. And by heathen, they meant such people as our brother Mahmud. It meant that an ignorant, stupid lout who seldom bathed and planted his corn by the phase of the moon, could claim to know the final answers of the universe. 
That entitled him to look down his nose at everybody else. Our hymn book was loaded with such arrogance, mindless, conceited self-congratulation on how cozy we were with the Almighty, and what a high opinion he had of us and us alone, and what hell everybody else was going to catch come Judgment Day. We peddled the only authentic brand of Lydia Pinkham's Juba, Jill said sharply. He doesn't grok it. Huh? Sorry, I got carried away. My folks tried to make a preacher out of me and missed by a narrow margin. I guess it still shows. It does. Don't rub it in, girl. I would have made a good one if I hadn't fallen into the fatal folly of reading anything I could lay my hands on. With just a touch more self-confidence and a liberal helping of ignorance, I could have been a famous evangelist. Shucks! This place we're headed for today would have been known as the Archangel Jubal Tabernacle. Jill made a face. Jubal, please, not so soon after breakfast. I mean it. A confidence man knows that he's lying. That limits his scope. But a successful shaman ropes himself first. He believes what he says, and such belief is contagious. There is no limit to his scope. But I lacked the necessary confidence in my own infallibility. I could never become a prophet, just a critic, which is a poor thing at best, a sort of fourth-rate prophet suffering from delusions of gender. Jubal frowned. That's what worries me about Fosterites, Jill. I think that they are utterly sincere. And you and I know that Mike is a sucker for sincerity. What do you think they'll try to do to him? Convert him, of course. Then get their hands on his fortune. I thought you had things fixed so that nobody could do that. No, I just fixed it so that nobody could take it away from him against his will. Ordinarily, he couldn't even give it away without the government stepping in. But giving it to a church, especially a politically powerful church like the Fosterites, is another matter. I don't see why. Jubal sighed. My dear, religion is practically a null area under the law. A church can do anything any other human organization can do and has no restrictions. It pays no taxes, need not publish records, is effectively immune to search, inspection, or control. And a church is anything that calls itself a church. Attempts have been made to distinguish between real religions entitled to these immunities and cults. This can't be done, short of establishing a state religion which is a cure worse than the disease. In any case, we haven't done it, and both under what's left of the old United States Constitution and under the Treaty of Federation, all churches are equal and equally immune, especially if they swing a big block of votes. If Mike is converted to fosterism and makes a will in favor of his church and then goes to heaven some sunrise... It will all be, to put it in the correct tautology, as legal as church on Sunday. Oh, dear, I thought we had him safe at last. There is no safety this side of the grave. Well, what are you going to do about it, Jubal? Nothing. Just fret, that's all. Mike stored their conversation without any effort to grok it. He recognized the subject as one of utter simplicity in his own language, but amazingly slippery in English. Since his failure to achieve mutual grokking on this subject, even with his brother Mahmoud, with his admittedly imperfect translation of the all-embracing Martian concept as Thou art God, he had simply waited until grokking was possible. He knew that the waiting would fructify at its time. His brother Jill was learning his language, and he would be able to explain it to her. They would grok together. In the meantime, the scenery flowing beneath him was a never-ending delight, and he was filled with eagerness for experience to come. He expected or hoped to meet a human old one. Senator Tom Boone was waiting to meet them at the landing flat. Howdy, folks. 
and may the good Lord bless you on this beautiful Sabbath. Mr. Smith, I'm happy to see you again, and you too, Doctor. He took his cigar out of his mouth and looked at Jill. And this little lady, didn't I see you at the palace? Yes, Senator, I'm Gillian Boardman. Thought so, my dear. Are you saved? Ah, uh, I guess not, Senator. Well, it's never too late. We'll be very happy to have you attend the seeker service in the outer tabernacle. I'll find a guardian to guide you. Mr. Smith and the doc will be going into the sanctuary, of course. The senator looked around. Senator? Uh, what, doc? If Miss Boardman can't go into the sanctuary, I think we had all better attend the seeker's service. She's his nurse and translator. Boone looked slightly perturbed. Is he ill? He doesn't look it. And why does he need a translator? He speaks English. I heard him. Jubal shrugged. As his physician, I prefer to have a nurse to assist me if necessary. Mr. Smith is not entirely adjusted to the conditions of this planet. An interpreter may not be necessary. But why don't you ask him? Mike, do you want Jill to come with you? Yes, Jubal. But... Very well, Mr. Smith. Boone again removed his cigar, put two fingers between his lips and whistled. Cherub here! A youngster in his early teens came dashing up. He was dressed in a short robe, tights, and slippers, and had what appeared to be pigeon's wings, because they were fastened, spread, on his shoulders. He was bareheaded, had a crop of tight golden curls and a sunny smile. Jill thought that he was as cute as a ginger ale lad. Boone ordered, Fly up to the sanctum office and tell the warden on duty that I want another pilgrim's badge sent to the sanctuary gate right away. The word is Mars. Mars, the kid repeated. Threw Boone a Boy Scout salute, turned and made a mighty sixty-foot leap over the heads of the crowd. Jill realized why the short robe had looked so bulky. It concealed a personal jump harness. Have to be careful of those badges, Boone remarked. You'd be surprised how many sinners would like to sneak in and sample a little of God's joy without having their sins washed away first. Now we'll just mosey along and sightsee a little while we wait for the third badge. I'm glad you folks got here early. They pushed through the crowd and entered the huge building, found themselves in a long high hallway. Boone stopped. I want you to notice something. There is economics in everything, even in the Lord's work. Any tourist coming here, whether he attends seeker service or not, and services run twenty-four hours a day, has to come in through here. What does he see? These happy chances. Boone waved at slot machines lining both walls of the hall. The bar and quick lunch is at the far end. He can't even get a drink of water without running this gauntlet. And let me tell you, it's a remarkable sinner who can get that far without shedding his loose change. But we don't take his money and give him nothing. Take a look. Boone shouldered his way to a machine, tapped the woman playing it on the shoulder. She was wearing around her neck a Fosterite rosary. Please, daughter. She looked up. Her annoyance changed to a smile. Certainly, Bishop. Bless you. You'll note. Boone went on, as he fed a quarter into the machine, that no matter whether it pays off in worldly goods or not, a sinner playing this machine is always rewarded with a blessing and an appropriate souvenir text. The machine stopped whirring and, lined up in the windows, was, God watches you. That pays three for one, Boone said briskly, and fished the payoff out of the receptacle. And here's your souvenir text. He tore a paper tab off that had extruded from a slot and handed it to Jill. Keep it, little lady, and ponder it. Jill sneaked a glance at it before putting it into her purse. 
but the sinner's belly is filled with filth. N.R. 22.17 You'll note, Boone went on, that the payoff is in tokens, not in coin, and the bursar's cage is clear back past the bar, and there is plenty of opportunity there to make love offerings for charity and other good works. So the sinner probably feeds them back in with a blessing each time and another text to take home. The cumulative effect is tremendous, really tremendous. Why, some of our most diligent and pious sheep got their start right here in this room. I don't doubt it, agreed Jubal, especially if they hit a jackpot. You understand, every combination is a complete sentence, a blessing. All but the jackpot. That's the three holy eyes. I tell you, when they see those eyes all lined up and staring at them, and all that manna from heaven coming down, it really makes them think. Sometimes they faint. Here, Mr. Smith. Boone offered Mike one of the slugs the machine had just paid. Give it a whirl. Mike hesitated. Jubal quickly took the proffered token himself. Damn it, he didn't want the boy getting hooked by a one-armed bandit. I'll try it, Senator. He fed the machine. Mike really hadn't intended to do anything. He had extended his time sense a little and was gently feeling around inside the machine trying to discover what it did and why they were stopping to look at it. But he had been too timid to play it himself. But when Jubal did so, Mike watched the cylinders spin around, noted the single eye pictured on each, and wondered what this jackpot was when all three were lined up. The word had only three meanings, so far as he knew, and none of them seemed to apply. Without really thinking about it, certainly without intending to cause any excitement, he slowed and stopped each wheel so that the eyes looked out through the window. A bell tolled. A choir sang hosannas. The machine lighted up and started spewing slugs into the receptacle and on into a catch basin below it in a flood. Boone looked delighted. Well, bless you. Doc, this is your day. Here, I'll help you. And put one back in to take the jackpot off. He did not wait for Jubal, but picked up one of the flood and fed it back in. Mike was wondering why all this was happening, so he lined up the three eyes again. The same events repeated, save that the flood was a mere trickle. Boone stared at the machine. Well, I'll be blessed. It's not supposed to hit twice in a row, but never mind, it did, and I'll see that you're paid on both of them. Quickly he put a slug back in. Mike still wanted to see why this was a jackpot. The eyes lined up again. Boone stared at them. Jill suddenly squeezed Mike's hand and whispered, Mike, stop it. But Jill, I was seeing... Don't talk about it. Just stop. Oh, you just wait till I get you home. Boone said slowly, I'd hesitate to call this a miracle. Machine probably needs a repairman, he shouted. Cherub here, and added, We'd better take the last one off, anyhow, and fed in another slug. Without Mike's intercession, the wheels slowed down on their own and announced, Foster loves you, and the mechanism tried but failed to deliver ten more slugs. A cherub older and with sleek black hair, came up and said, Happy day. You need help? Three jackpots, Boone told him. Three? Didn't you hear the music? Are you deaf? We'll be at the bar. Fetch the money there and have somebody check this machine. Yes, Bishop. They left the cherub scratching his head while Boone hurried them on through the happiness room to the bar at the far end. Got to get you out of here, Boone said jovially, before you bankrupt the church. Doc, are you always that lucky? Always, Harshaw said solemnly. 
He had not looked at Mike and did not intend to. He told himself that he did not know that the boy had anything to do with it, but he wished mightily that this ordeal were over and all of them home again. Boone took them to a stretch of the bar counter marked reserved and said, This'll do, or would the little lady like to sit down? This is fine, and if you call me little lady just once more, I'll turn Mike loose on you. A bartender hurried up. Happy day, your usual bishop. Double. What'll it be, Doc? And Mr. Smith, don't be bashful. You're the supreme bishop's guests. Brandy, thank you. Water on the side. Brandy, thank you, Mike repeated. Thought about it and added, No water for me, please. While it was true that the water of life was not the essence in the water ceremony, nevertheless, he did not wish to drink water here. That's the spirit, Boone said heartily. That's the proper spirit with spirits. No water. Get it? It's a joke. He dug Jubal in the ribs. Now what'll it be for the little lady? Cola? Milk for your rosy cheeks, or do you want a real happy day drink with the big folks? Senator, Jill said carefully, would your hospitality extend to a martini? Would it? Best martinis in the whole world right here. We don't use any vermouth at all. We bless them instead. Double martini for the little lady. Bless you, son, and make it fast. He turned to the others. We've just about time for a quick one. Then pay our respects to Archangel Foster and on into the sanctuary in time to hear the Supreme Bishop. The drinks arrived and the jackpots pay off. They drank with Boone's blessing. Then he wrangled in a friendly fashion with Jubal over the three hundred dollars just delivered, insisting that all three prizes belonged to Jubal even though Boone had inserted the slugs on the second and third. Jubal settled it by scooping up all the money and depositing it in a love-offering bowl near them on the bar. Boone nodded approvingly. That's a mark of grace, Doc. We'll save you yet. Another round, folks? Jill hoped that someone would say yes. The gin was watered, she decided, and the flavor was poor. Nevertheless, it was starting a small flame of tolerance in her middle. But nobody spoke up, so she trailed along as Boone led them away, up a flight of stairs past a sign reading, Positively no seekers nor sinners allowed on this level. This means you. Beyond the sign was a heavy grilled gate. Boone said to it, Bishop Boone and three pilgrims, guests of the Supreme Bishop. The gate swung open. He led them around a curved passage and into a room. It was a moderately large room, luxuriously appointed in a style that reminded Jill of undertaker's parlors. But it was filled with cheerful music. The basic theme seemed to be jingle bells. But a congo beat had been added, and the arrangement so embroidered that its ancestry was not certain. Jill found that she liked it, and that it made her want to dance. The far wall of the room was clear glass, and appeared to be not even that. Boone said briskly, Here we are, folks, in the presence. He knelt quickly, facing the empty wall. You don't have to kneel, you're pilgrims, but do so if it makes you feel better. Most pilgrims do. And there he is, just as he was when he was called up to heaven. Boone gestured with his cigar. Don't he look natural, preserved by a miracle, his flesh incorruptible? That's the very chair he used to sit in when he wrote his messages. And that's just the pose he was in when he went to heaven. He never moved, and he's never been moved. We just built the tabernacle right around him, removing the old church naturally and preserving its sacred stones. Opposite them, about twenty feet away, facing them, seated in a big armchair, remarkably like a throne, was an old man. He looked as if he were alive, 
and he reminded Jill strongly of an old goat that had been on the farm where she had spent her childhood summers. Yes, even to the outthrust lower lip, the cut of the whiskers, and the fierce brooding eyes. Jill felt her skin prickle. The archangel Foster made her uneasy. Mike said to her in Martian, My brother, this is an old one? I don't know, Mike. They say he is. He answered in Martian, I do not grok an old one here. I don't know, I tell you. I grok wrongness. Mike, remember. Yes, Jill. Boone said, What was he saying, little lady? What was your question, Mr. Smith? Jill said quickly, It wasn't anything. Senator, can I get out of here? I feel faint. She glanced back at the corpse. There were billowing clouds above it, and one shaft of light always cut through and sought out the face. The light changed enough so that the face seemed to change, and the eyes seemed bright and alive. Boone said soothingly, It sometimes has that effect the first time, but you ought to look at him from the Seeker's Gallery below us, looking up at him and with entirely different music, entirely. Heavy music with subsonics in it, I believe it is, reminds them of their sins. Now this room is a happy thoughts meditation chamber for high officials of the church. I often come here and sit and smoke a cigar for an hour if I'm feeling the least bit low. Please, Senator. Oh, certainly. You just wait outside, my dear. Mr. Smith, you stay as long as you like. Jubal said, Senator, hadn't we best get on into the services? They all left. Jill was shaking and squeezed Mike's hand. She had been scared silly that Mike might do something to that grisly exhibit and get them all lynched or worse. Two guards dressed in uniforms, much like the cherubim, but more ornate, thrust crossed spears in their path when they reached the portal of the sanctuary. Boone said reprovingly, Come, come, these pilgrims are the supreme bishop's personal guests. Where are their badges? The confusion was straightened out, the badges produced, and with them, their door prize numbers. A respectful usher said, This way, bishop, and led them up wide stairs and to a center box directly facing the stage. Boone stood back for them to go in. You first, little lady. There followed a tussle of wills. Boone wanted to sit next to Mike in order to answer his questions. Harshaw won, and Mike sat between Jill and Jubal with Boone on the aisle. The box was roomy and luxurious, with very comfortable self-adjusting seats, ashtrays for each seat, and drop tables for refreshments folded against the rail in front of them. Their balcony position placed them about fifteen feet over the heads of the congregation, and not more than a hundred feet from the altar. In front of it, a young priest was warming up the crowd, shuffling to the music and shoving his heavily muscled arms back and forth, fists clenched like pistons. His strong bass voice joined the choir from time to time. Then he would lift it in exhortation. Up off your behinds! What are you waiting for? Gonna let the devil catch you napping? The aisles were very wide, and a snake dance was moving down the right aisle, across in front of the altar, and weaving back up the center aisle, feet stomping in time with the priest's piston-like jabs and with the syncopated chant of the choir. Clump, clump, moan! Clump, clump, moan! Jill felt the beat of it and realized sheepishly that it would be fun to get into that snake dance, as more and more people were doing under the brawny young priest's taunts. That boy's a comer, Boone said approvingly. I've team preached with him a few times, and I can testify that he turns the crowd over to you already sizzling. The Reverend Jug Jackaman used to play left tackle for the Rams. You've seen him play. I'm afraid not, Jubal admitted. I don't follow football. Really? You don't know what you're missing. 
Why, during the season, most of the faithful stay after services, eat their lunches in their pews, and watch the game. The whole back wall behind the altar slides away, and you're looking right into the biggest stereo tank ever built. Puts the plays right in your lap. Better reception than you get at home, and it's more of a thrill to watch with a crowd around you. He stopped and whistled. Hey, cherub, over here. An usher hurried over. Yes, bishop. Son, you ran away so fast when you seated us, I didn't have time to put in my order. I'm sorry, bishop. Being sorry won't get you into heaven. Get happy, son. Get that old spring into your step and stay on your toes. Same thing all around, folks. Fine. He gave the order and added, And bring me back a handful of my cigars. Just ask the chief barkeep. Right away, bishop. Bless you, son. Hold it. The head of the snake dance was just about to pass under them. Boone leaned over the rail, made a megaphone of his hands, and cut through the high noise level. Dawn! Hey, Dawn! A woman looked up. He caught her eye, motioned her to come up. She smiled. Add a whiskey sour to that order. Fly! The woman showed up quickly as did the drinks. Boone swung a seat out of the box's back row and put it cornerwise in front of him so that she could visit more easily. Folks, meet Miss Dawn Ardent. My dear, that's Miss Boardman, the little lady down in the corner. And this is the famous Dr. Jubal Harshaw, here by me. Really? Doctor, I think your stories are simply divine. Thank you. Oh, I really do. I put one of your tapes on my player and let it lull me to sleep almost every night. Higher praise a writer cannot expect, Jubal said with a straight face. That's enough, Don, put in Boone. The young man sitting between them is... Mr. Valentine Smith, the man from Mars. Her eyes came open wider as her mouth opened. Oh, my goodness! Boone roared. Bless you, child. I guess I really snuck up on you that time. She said, Are you really the man from Mars? Yes, Miss Dawn Ardent. Just call me Dawn. Oh, goodness. Boone patted her hand. Don't you know it's a sin to doubt the word of a bishop? My dear, how would you like to help lead the man from Mars to the light? Oh, I'd love it. You certainly would, you sleek bitch, Jill said to herself. She had been growing increasingly angry ever since Miss Ardent had joined them. The dress the woman was wearing was long-sleeved, high-necked, and opaque, and covered nothing. It was a knit fabric almost exactly the shade of her tanned skin, and Jill was certain that skin was all there was under it. Other than Miss Ardent, which was really quite a lot, in all departments. The dress was ostentatiously modest compared with the extreme styles worn by many of the female half of the congregation, some of whom in the snake dance seemed about to jounce out of their clothes. Jill thought that, despite being dressed, Miss Ardent looked as if she had just wiggled out of bed and was anxious to crawl back in, with Mike. Quit squirming your carcass at him, you cheap hussy, Boone said. I'll speak to the Supreme Bishop about it, my dear. Now you'd better get back downstairs and lead that parade. Jug needs your help. She stood up obediently. Yes, Bishop. Pleased to meet you, Doctor, and Miss Broad. I hope I'll see you again, Mr. Smith. I'll pray for you. She undulated away. A fine girl, that, Boone said happily. Ever catch her act, Doctor? I think not. What does she do? Boone seemed unable to believe his ears. You don't know? No. Didn't you hear her name? That's Dawn Ardent. 
She's simply the highest paid peeler in all Baja, California. That's who she is. Men have committed suicide over her. Very sad. Works under an iris spotlight, and by the time she's down to her shoes, the light is just on her face, and you really can't see anything else. Very effective. Highly spiritual. Would you believe it, looking at that sweet face now, that she used to be a most immoral woman? I can't believe it. Well, she was. Ask her. She'll tell you. Better yet, come to a cleansing for seekers. I'll let you know when she's going to be on. When she confesses, it gives other women courage to stand up and tell about their sins. She doesn't hold anything back, and of course it does her good, too, to know that she's helping other people. Very dedicated woman now. Flies her own car up here every Saturday night right after her last show, so as to be here in time to teach Sunday school. She teaches the young men's happiness class, and attendance has more than tripled since she took over. I can believe that. Jubal agreed. How old are these lucky young men? Boone looked at him and laughed. You're not fooling me, you old devil. Somebody told you the motto of Don's class. Never too old to be young. No, truly. In any case, you can't attend her class until you've seen the light and gone through cleansing and been accepted. Sorry. This is the one true church pilgrim, nothing at all like those traps of Satan, those foul pits of iniquity that call themselves churches in order to lead the unwary into idolatry and other abominations. You can't just walk in here because you want to kill a couple of hours out of the rain. You got to be saved first. In fact, uh oh, camera warning. Red lights were blinking in each corner of the great hall, and Jugs got them done to a turn. Now you'll see some action. The snake dance picked up more volunteers, and the few left seated were clapping the cadence and bouncing up and down. Pairs of ushers were hurrying to pick up the fallen, some of whom were quiet, but others, mostly women, were writhing and foaming at the mouth. These were dumped hastily in front of the altar. And left to flop like freshly caught fish, Boone pointed his cigar at a gaunt redhead, a woman apparently about forty, whose dress was badly torn by her exertions. See that woman? It has been at least a year since she has gone all through a service without being possessed by the spirit. Sometimes Archangel Foster uses her mouth to talk to us, and when that happens, it takes four husky acolytes to hold her down. She could go to heaven any time. She's ready, but she's needed here. Anybody need a refill? Bar service is likely to be a little slow once the cameras are switched on and things get lively. Almost absently, Mike let his glass be replenished. He shared none of Jill's disgust with the scene. He had been deeply troubled when he had discovered that the old one had been no old one at all, but mere spoiled food. With no old one anywhere near, but he had tabled that matter and was drinking deep of the events around him. The frenzy going on below him was so Martian in its flavor that he felt both homesick and warmly at home. No detail of the scene was Martian; all was wildly different. Yet he grokked correctly that this was a growing closer as real as water ceremony, and in numbers and intensity. That he had never met before outside his own nest, he wished forlornly that someone would invite him to join that jumping up and down. His feet tingled with an urge to merge himself with them. He spotted Miss Dawn Ardent again in its van and tried to catch her eye. Perhaps she would invite him. He did not have to recognize her by size and proportions, even though he had noted, when he had first seen her, that she was exactly as tall as his brother Jill, with very nearly the same shapings and masses throughout. But Miss Dawn Ardent had her own face, 
with her pains and sorrows and growings graved on it under her warm smile. He wondered if Miss Dawn Ardent might some day be willing to share water with him and grow closer. Senator Bishop Boone had made him feel wary, and he was glad that Jubal had not permitted them to sit side by side, but Mike was sorry when Miss Dawn Ardent had been sent away. Miss Dawn Ardent did not feel him looking at her. The snake dance carried her away. The man on the platform had both his arms raised. The great cave became quieter. Suddenly he brought them down. Who's happy? We're happy. Why? God loves us. How do you know? Foster told us. He dropped to his knees, raised one clenched fist. Let's hear that lion roar. The congregation roared and shrieked and screamed, while he controlled the din using his fist as a baton, raising the volume, lowering it, squeezing it down to a sub-vocal growl, then suddenly driving it to crescendo that shook the balcony. Mike felt it beat on him, and he wallowed in it, with ecstasy so painful that he feared that he would be forced to withdraw. But Jill had told him that he must not ever do so again, except in the privacy of his own room. He controlled it and let the waves wash over him. The man stood up. Our first hymn, he said briskly, is sponsored by Manor Bakeries, makers of angel bread, the loaf of love with our supreme bishop's smiling face on every wrapper and containing a valuable premium coupon redeemable at your nearest neighborhood church of the new revelation. Brothers and sisters, tomorrow Manor Bakeries with branches throughout the land start a giant price-slashing sale of pre-equinox goodies. Send your child to school tomorrow with a bulging box of Archangel Foster cookies, each one blessed and wrapped in an appropriate text, and pray that each goodie he gives away may lead a child of sinners nearer to the light. And now let's really live it up with the holy words of that old favorite, Forward Foster's Children, all together, Forward Foster's Children. Smash apart your foes, Faith our shield and our more. Strike them down by rows. Second verse. Make no peace with sinners. God is on our side. Mike was so joyed by it all that he did not stop then to translate and weigh and try to grok the words. He grokked that the words were not of essence. It was a growing closer. The snake dance started moving again, the marchers chanting the potent sounds along with the choir and those too feeble to march. After the hymn, they caught their breaths while there were announcements, heavenly messages, another commercial, and the awarding of door prizes. And then a second hymn, Happy Faces Uplifted, was sponsored by Dattelbaum's department stores, where the saved shop in safety since no merchandise is offered which competes with a sponsored brand. A children's happy room in each branch, supervised by a saved sister. The young priest moved out to the very front of the platform and cupped his ear, listening. We want Digby. Who? We want Digby. Louder! Make him hear you! We want Dig. B. Clap, clap, stomp, stomp. We want dig. B. Clap, clap, stomp, stomp. It went on and on, getting louder as the building rocked with it. Jubal leaned to Boone and said, Much of that and you'll do what Samson did. Never fear, Boone told him around his cigar, reinforced, fireproof, and sustained by faith. Besides, it's built to shake. It was designed that way. Helps. The lights went down. Curtains behind the altar parted. And a blinding radiance from no visible source picked out the supreme bishop, waving his clasped hands over his head and smiling at them. They answered with the lion's roar, and he threw them kisses. 
On his way to the pulpit, he stopped, half raised one of the possessed women still writhing slowly near the altar, kissed her on the forehead, lowered her gently, started on, stopped again, and knelt by the bony redhead. The supreme bishop reached behind him, and a portable microphone was instantly placed in his hand. He put his other arm around the woman's shoulders, placed the pickup near her lips. Mike could not understand her words. Whatever they were, he was reasonably sure that they were not English. But the supreme bishop was translating, interjecting his words quickly at each pause in the foaming spate. Archangel Foster is with us today. He is especially pleased with you. Kiss the sister on your right. Archangel Foster loves you all. Kiss the sister on your left. He has a special message for one of us here today. The woman spoke again. Digby seemed to hesitate. What was that? Louder, I pray you. She muttered and screamed at length. Digby looked up and smiled. His message is for a pilgrim from another planet. Valentine Michael Smith, the man from Mars. Where are you, Valentine Michael? Stand up, stand up. Jill tried to stop him, but Jubal growled. Easier to do it than to fight it. Let him stand up, Jill. Wave, Mike. Now you can sit down. Mike did so, amazed to find that they were now chanting, Man from Mars. Man from Mars. The sermon that followed seemed to be directed at him, too, but try as he would, he could not understand it. The words were English, or most of them were, but they seemed to be put together wrongly, and there was so much noise, so much clapping, and so many shouts of hallelujah and happy day that he grew quite confused. He was glad when it was over. As soon as the sermon was finished, Digby turned the service back to the young priest and left. Boone stood up. Come on, folks. We pull a sneak now, ahead of the crowd. Mike followed along, Jill's hand in his. Presently they were going through an elaborately arched tunnel with the noise of the crowd left behind them. Jubal said, Does this way lead to the parking lot? I told my driver to wait. Eh? Boone answered. It does if you go straight ahead, but we're going to see the Supreme Bishop first. What? Jubal replied. No, I don't think we can. It's time for us to get on home. Boone stared. Doctor, you don't mean that. The Supreme Bishop is waiting for us right now. You can't just walk out on him. You must pay your respects. You're his guests. Jubal hesitated, then gave in. Well, there won't be a lot of other people. This boy has had enough excitement for one day. Just the Supreme Bishop. He wants to see you privately. Boone ushered them into a small elevator concealed in the decorations of the tunnel. Moments later, they were waiting in a parlor of Digby's private apartments. A door opened. Digby hurried in. He had removed his vestments and was dressed in flowing robes. He smiled at them. Sorry to keep you waiting, folks. I just have to have a shower as soon as I come off. You've no notion how it makes you sweat to punch Satan and keep on slugging. So this is the man from Mars? God bless you, son. Welcome to the Lord's house. Archangel Foster wants you to feel at home here. He's watching over you. Mike did not answer. Jubal was surprised to see how short the Supreme Bishop was. Lifts in his shoes when he was on stage? Or the way the lighting was arranged? Aside from the goatee he wore in evident imitation of the departed Foster, the man reminded him of a used car salesman. The same ready smile and warm, sincere manner but he reminded Jubal of someone else, too. Somebody got it. Professor Simon Magus, Becky Vesey's long-dead husband. 
Jubal relaxed a little and felt friendlier toward the clergyman. Simon had been as likable a scoundrel as he had ever known. Digby had turned his charm on Jill. Don't kneel, daughter. We're just friends in private here. He spoke a few words to her, startling Jill with a surprising knowledge of her background, and adding earnestly, I have deep respect for your calling, daughter. In the blessed words of Archangel Foster, God commands us first to minister to the body in order that the soul may seek the light untroubled by ills of the flesh. I know that you are not yet one of us, but your service is blessed by the Lord. We are fellow travelers on the road to heaven. He turned to Jubal. You too, doctor. Archangel Foster has told us that the Lord commands us to be happy, and many is the time I have put down my crook, weary unto death with the cares and woes of my flock, and enjoyed an innocent happy hour over one of your stories, and have stood up refreshed, ready to fight again. Uh, thank you, Bishop. I mean it deeply. I've had your record searched in heaven. Now, now, never mind. I know that you are an unbeliever. But let me speak. Even Satan has a purpose in God's great plan. It is not yet time for you to believe. Out of your sorrow and heartache and pain you spin happiness for other people. This is all credited on your page of the great ledger. Now, please... I did not bring you here to argue technology. We never argue with anyone. We wait until they see the light, and then we welcome them. But today we shall just enjoy a happy hour together. Digby then proceeded to act as if he meant it. Jubal was forced to admit that the glib fraud was a charming host, and his coffee and liquor and food were all excellent. Jubal noticed that Mike seemed decidedly jumpy, especially when Digby deftly cut him out of the herd and spoke with him alone. But Khan found it. The boy was simply going to have to get used to meeting people and talking to them on his own, without Jubal or Jill or somebody to feed him his lines. Boone was showing Jill some relics of Foster in a glass case on the other side of the room. Jubal covertly watched her evident reluctance with mild amusement while he spread pâté de foie gras on toast. He heard a door click and looked around. Digby and Mike were missing. Where did they go, Senator? Eh? What was that, Doctor? Bishop Digby and Mr. Smith, where are they? Boone looked around, seemed to notice the closed door. Oh, they've just stepped in there for a moment. There's a little retiring room used for private audiences. You were in it, weren't you, when the Supreme Bishop was showing you around? Um, yes. It was a small room with nothing in it but a chair on a dais. A throne, Jubal corrected himself with a private grin, and a kneeler with an armrest. Jubal wondered which one would use the throne and which one would be left with the kneeler. If this tinsel bishop tried to argue religion with Mike, he was in for some shocks. I hope they don't stay in there too long. We really do have to be getting back. I doubt if they'll stay long. Probably Mr. Smith wanted a word in private. People often do. And the Supreme Bishop is very generous that way. Look, I'll call the parking lot and have your cab waiting right at the end of that passageway where we took the elevator. That's the Supreme Bishop's private entrance. Save you a good ten minutes. That's very kind of you. So if Mr. Smith has something on his soul he wants to confess, we won't have to hurry him. I'll step outside and phone. Boone left. Jill came over and said worriedly, Jubal, I don't like this. I think we were deliberately maneuvered so that Digby could get Mike alone and work on him. I'm sure of it. Well, they haven't any business doing that. I'm going to bust right in on them and tell Mike it's time to leave. Suit yourself, Jubal answered. But I think you're acting like a broody hen. This isn't like having the SS on our tails, Jill. This swindle is much smoother. There won't be any strong-arm stuff. He smiled. 
It's my opinion that if Digby tries to convert Mike, they'll wind up with Mike converting him. Mike's ideas are pretty hard to shake. I still don't like it. Relax. Help yourself to the free chow. I'm not hungry. Well, I am. And if I ever turned down a free feed, they'd toss me out of the Authors Guild. He piled paper-thin Virginia ham on buttered bread, added to it other items, none of them syntho, until he had an unsteady ziggurat, munched it, and licked mayonnaise from his fingers. Ten minutes later, Boone had not returned. Jill said sharply, Jubal, I'm not going to remain polite any longer. I'm going to get Mike out of there. Go right ahead. She strode to the door. Jubal, it's locked. Thought it might be. Well, what do we do? Break it down? Only as a last resort. Jubal went to the inner door, looked it over carefully. Mmm, with a battering ram and twenty stout men, I might try it, but I wouldn't count on it. Jill, that door would do credit to a bank vault. It's just been prettied up to match the room. I've got one much like it for the fireproof off my study. What do we do? Beat on it if you want to. You'll just bruise your hands. I'm going to see what's keeping friend Boone. But when Jubal looked out into the hallway, he saw Boone just returning. Sorry, Boone said. Had to have the cherubim hunt up your driver. He was in the happiness room having a bite of lunch. But your cab is waiting for you just where I said. Senator, Jubal said, we've got to leave now. Will you be so kind as to tell Bishop Digby? Boone looked perturbed. I could phone him if you insist, but I hesitate to do so, and I simply cannot walk in on a private audience. Then phone him. We do insist. But Boone was saved the embarrassment as, just then, the inner door opened and Mike walked out. Jill took one look at his face and shrilled, Mike, are you all right? Yes, Jill. I'll tell the Supreme Bishop you're leaving, said Boone, and went past Mike into the smaller room. He reappeared at once. He's left, he announced. There's a back way into his study, Boone smiled. Like cats and cooks, the Supreme Bishop goes without saying. That's a joke. He says that... Goodbyes add nothing to happiness in this world, so he never says goodbye. Don't be offended. We aren't, but we'll say goodbye now, and thank you for a most interesting experience. No, don't bother to come down. I'm sure we can find our way out. Twenty-four. Once they were in the air, Jubal said, Well, Mike, what did you think of it? Mike frowned. I do not grok. You aren't alone, son. What did the bishop have to say? Mike hesitated a long time, finally said, My brother Jubal, I need to ponder until grokking is. Ponder right ahead, son. Take a nap. That's what I'm going to do, Jill said suddenly. Jubal, how do they get away with it? Get away with what? Everything. That's not a church. It's a madhouse. It was Jubal's turn to ponder before answering. No, Jill, you're mistaken. It is a church. And the logical eclecticism of our times. Huh? The new revelation and all doctrines and practices under it are all old stuff, very old. All you can say about it is that neither Foster nor Digby ever had an original thought in his life. But they knew what would sell in this day and age. So they pieced together a hundred time-worn tricks, gave them a new paint job, and they were in business. A booming business, too. The only thing that scares me is that I might live to see it sell too well. 
until it was compulsory for everybody. Oh, no! Oh, yes! Hitler started with less, and all he had to peddle was hate. Hate always sells well, but for repeat trade and the long pull, happiness is sounder merchandise. Believe me, I know. I'm in the same grift myself. As Digby reminded me, Jubal grimaced. I should have punched him. Instead, he made me like it. That's why I'm afraid of him. He's good at it. He's clever. He knows what people want. Happiness. The world has suffered a long, bleak century of guilt and fear. Now Digby tells them that they have nothing to fear in this life or hereafter, and that God commands them to love and be happy. Day in, day out, he keeps pushing it. Don't be afraid. Be happy. Well, that part's all right, Jill admitted, and I can see that he works hard at it, but piffle. He plays hard. No, he gave me the impression that he really is devoted to his work, that he had sacrificed everything else to piffle, I said. For Digby, it's play. Jill, of all the nonsense that twists the world, the concept of altruism is the worst. People do what they want to do every time. If it sometimes pains them to make a choice, if the choice turns out to look like a noble sacrifice, you can be sure that it is in no wise nobler than the discomfort caused by greediness. The unpleasant necessity of having to decide between two things, both of which you would like to do when you can't do both. The ordinary bloke suffers that discomfort every day, every time he makes a choice between spending a buck on beer or tucking it away for his kids, between getting up when he's tired or spending the day in his warm bed and losing his job. No matter which he does, he always chooses what seems to hurt least or pleasures most. The average chump spends his life harried by these small decisions, but the utter scoundrel and the perfect saint merely make the same choices on a larger scale. They still pick what pleases them, as Digby has done. Saint or scoundrel, he's not one of the harried little chumps. Which do you think he is, Jubal? You mean there's a difference? Oh, Jubal, your cynicism is just a pose and you know it. Of course there's a difference. Mm, yes, you're right, there is. I hope he's just a scoundrel, because a saint can stir up ten times as much mischief as a scoundrel. Strike that from the record. You would just tag it as cynicism as if tagging it proved it wrong. Jill, what troubled you about those church services? Well, everything. You can't tell me that that is worship. Meaning they didn't do things that way in the little brown church in the Vale you attended as a kid. Brace yourself, Jill. They don't do it your way in St. Peter's either, nor in Mecca. Yes, but, well... None of them do it that way. Snake dances, slot machines, even a bar right in church. That's not reverence. It's not even dignified, just disgusting. I don't suppose that temple prostitution was very dignified either. Huh? I rather imagine that the two-backed beast is just as sweaty and comical when the act is performed in the service of a god as it is under any other circumstances. As for those snake dances, have you ever seen a shaker service? No, of course not, and neither have I. Any church that is again sexual intercourse, as they were, doesn't last long. But dancing to the glory of God has a long and respected history. It doesn't have to be good dancing. According to eyewitness reports, the Shakers could never have made the Bolshoi Ballet. It merely has to be enthusiastic. Do you consider the rain dances of our southwest Indians irreverent? 
No, but that's different. Everything always is. And the more it changes, the more it is the same. Now about those slot machines. Ever see a bingo game in church? Well, yes. Our parish used to hold them when we were trying to raise the mortgage. But we held them on Friday nights. We certainly didn't do such things during church services. So... Minds me of a married woman who was very proud of her virtue. She slept with other men only when her husband was away. Why, Jubal, the two cases aren't even slightly alike. Probably not. Analogy is even slipperier than logic. But, little lady, smile when you call me that. It's a joke. Why didn't you spit in his face? He had to stay on his good behavior no matter what we did. Digby wanted him to. But, Jill, if a thing is sinful on Sunday, it is sinful on Friday. At least it grocks that way to an outsider, myself. Or perhaps to a man from Mars. The only difference I can see is that the Fosterites give away, absolutely free, a scriptural text even if you lose. Could your bingo games make the same claim? Fake scripture, you mean? A text from the new revelation? Boss, have you read the thing? I've read it. Then you know. It's just dressed up in biblical language. Part of it is just icky sweet with no substance, like a saccharin tablet. More of it is sheer nonsense. And some of it is just hateful. None of it makes sense. It isn't even good morals. Jubal was silent so long that Jill thought he had gone to sleep. At last he said, Jill, are you familiar with Hindu sacred writings? Hmm, I'm afraid not. The Quran? Or any other major scripture? I could illustrate my point from the Bible, but I would not wish to hurt your feelings. Ah, uh, I'm afraid I'm not much of a scholar, Jubal. Go ahead, you won't hurt my feelings. Well, I'll stick to the Old Testament. Picking it to pieces usually doesn't upset people quite so much. You know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? Of how Lot was saved from these wicked cities when Yahweh smote them with a couple of heavenly A-bombs? Oh, yes, of course. His wife was turned into a pillar of salt. Caught by the fallout, perhaps. She tarried and looked back. Always seemed to me to be too stiff a punishment for the peccadillo of female curiosity. But we were speaking of Lot. St. Peter describes him as a just, godly, and righteous man, vexed by the filthy conversation of the wicked. I think we must stipulate St. Peter to be an authority on virtue, since to him was given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. But if you search the only records concerning Lot in the Old Testament, it becomes hard to determine exactly what Lot did or did not do that established him as such a paragon. He divided up a cattle range at his brother's suggestion. He got captured in a battle. When he was tipped off, he lambed out of town in time to save his skin. He fed and sheltered two strangers overnight, but his conduct shows that he knew them to be VIPs whether or not he knew they were angels. And by the Koran and by my own lights, his hospitality would have counted for more if he had thought they were just a couple of unworthy poor in need of a pad and a handout. Aside from these insignificant items and St. Peter's character reference, there is just one thing that Lot did mentioned anywhere in the Bible on which we can judge his virtue. Virtue so great, mind you, that heavenly intercession saved his life. See chapter 19 of Genesis, verse 8. And what does it say? Look it up when we get home. I don't expect you to believe me. Jubal, you're the most infuriating man I've ever met. And you're a very pretty girl and a fair cook. So I don't mind your ignorance. 
All right, I'll tell you. Then you look it up anyhow. Some of Lot's neighbors came and beat on his door and wanted to meet these two blokes from out of town. Lot didn't fight with them. He offered them a deal instead. He had two young daughters, virgins, at least such was his opinion, and he told this crowd of men that he would give them these two little girls, and they could use them any way they liked. A gang shagging, a midnight review. He pleaded with them to do any damn thing they pleased to his daughters. Only please go away and quit beating on his door. Jubal, does it really say that? Look it up yourself. I've modernized the language, but the meaning is as unmistakable as a whore's wink. Lot offered to let a gang of men, young and old, the Bible says, abuse two young virgins under his protection if only they wouldn't break down his door. Say. Jubal leaned forward and beamed. Maybe I should have tried that when the SS was breaking my door down. Maybe it would have got me into heaven, and St. Peter knows my chances aren't too good otherwise. Then he frowned and looked worried. No, it wouldn't have worked. The recipe plainly calls for virgins in tacti, and I wouldn't have known which two of you gals to offer those troopers. Hmph! <laughs> You won't find out from me. Possibly I couldn't find out from any of you. Even Lot might have been mistaken. But that's what he promised him. His virgin daughters, young and tender and scared, urged this street gang to rape them as much as they wished in any way they liked. If only they would leave him in peace. Jubal snorted in disgust. And the Bible cites this sort of scum as being a righteous man. Jill said slowly, I don't think that's quite the way we were taught it in Sunday school. Damn it, look it up. They probably gave you a bowdlerized version. That's not the only shock in store for anybody who actually reads the Bible. Consider Elisha. It says here that Elisha was so all-fired holy that merely touching his bones restored a dead man to life. But he was a bald-headed old coot, like myself. So one day some children made fun of his baldness, just as you girls do. So God personally interceded and sent two bears to tear forty-two small children into bloody bits. That's what it says. Second chapter of Second Kings. Boss, I never make fun of your bald head. Who was it sent my name to those hair restorer quacks? Dorcas, maybe? Whoever it was, God knows. And she had better keep a sharp eye out for bears. I might turn pious in my dotage and start enjoying divine protection. But I shan't give you any more samples. The Bible is loaded with such stuff. Read it and find out. Crimes that would turn your stomach are asserted to be either divinely ordered or divinely condoned. Along with, I must add, a lot of hard common sense and some pretty workable rules for social behavior. I am not running down the Bible. It stacks up pretty well as sacred writings go. It isn't a patch on the sadistic pornographic trash that goes by the name of sacred writings among the Hindus or a dozen other religions. But I'm not singling out any of them for condemnation either. It is entirely conceivable that some one of these mutually contradictory mythologies is the literal word of God, that God is in truth the sort of bloodthirsty paranoid who would rend to bits forty-two children for the crime of sassing one of his priests. Don't ask me about the front office's policies. I just work here. My point is that Foster's new revelation that you're so contemptuous of is pure sweetness and light as scripture goes. 
Bishop Digby's patron is a pretty good Joe. He wants people to be happy, happy here on earth, plus guaranteed eternal bliss in heaven. He doesn't expect you to chastise the flesh here and now in order to reap rewards after you're dead. Oh, no. This is the modern giant economy package. If you like to drink and gamble and dance and wench, and most people do, come to church and do it under holy auspices. Do it with your conscience free of any trace of guilt. Really have fun at it. Live it up. Get happy. Jubal failed to look happy himself. He went on. Of course, there's a slight charge. Digby's God expects to be acknowledged as such. But that has been a foible of God's always. Anyone who is stupid enough to refuse to get happy on his terms is a sinner, and a sinner deserves anything that happens to him. But this is one rule common to all gods and goddesses throughout history. Don't blame Foster and Digby. They didn't invent it. Their brand of snake oil is utterly orthodox in all respects. Boss, you sound as if you were halfway converted. Not me. I don't enjoy snake dances. I despise crowds, and I do not propose to let my social and mental inferiors tell me where I have to go on Sundays. And I wouldn't enjoy heaven if that crowd is going to be there. I simply object to your criticizing them for the wrong things. As literature, the new revelation stacks up about average. It should. It was composed by plagiarizing other scriptures. As for logic and internal consistency, these mundane rules do not apply to sacred writings and never have. But even on these grounds, the new revelation must be rated superior. It hardly ever bites its own tail. Try reconciling the Old Testament with the New Testament sometime or Buddhist doctrine with Buddhist apocrypha. As morals, fosterism is merely the Freudian ethic sugar-coated for people who can't take their psychology straight. Although I doubt if the old lecher who wrote it, pardon me, was inspired to write it, was aware of this. He was no scholar, but he was in tune with his times. He tapped the zeitgeist. Fear and guilt and a loss of faith. How could he miss? Now pipe down. I'm going to nap. Who's been talking? The woman tempted me. Jubal closed his eyes. On reaching home, they found that Caxton and Mahmoud had flown in together for the day. Ben had been disappointed to find Jill not at home on his arrival, but he had managed to bear up without tears through the company of Anne, Miriam, and Dorcas. Mahmoud always visited for the avowed purpose of seeing his protégé Mike and Dr. Harshaw. However, he too had shown fortitude at having only Jubal's food, liquor, garden, and odalisks to entertain him during his host's absence. He was lying face down with Miriam rubbing his back while Dorcas rubbed his head. Jubal looked at him. Don't get up. I can't. She's sitting on me. A little higher up, Miriam. Hi, Mike. Hi, my brother stinky Dr. Mahmoud. Mike then gravely greeted Ben and asked to be excused. Run along, son, Jubal told him. Anne said, Wait a minute, Mike. Have you had lunch? He said solemnly. Anne, I am not hungry. Thank you. Turned and went into the house. Mahmoud twisted, almost unseating Miriam. Jubal, what's troubling our son? Yeah, said Ben. He looks seasick. Let him alone and he'll get well. An overdose of religion. Digby has been working on him. Jubal sketched the morning's events. Mahmoud frowned. But was it necessary to leave him alone with Digby? This seems to me... Pardon me, my brother. Unwise. 
He's not hurt. Stinky, he's got to learn to take such things in his stride. You've preached your brand of theology to him. I know you have. He's told me about it. Can you name me one good reason why Digby shouldn't have his innings? Answer me as a scientist, not as a Muslim. I am unable to answer anything other than as a Muslim, Dr. Mahmoud said quietly. Sorry, I recognize the correctness of your answer, even though I don't agree with it. But, Jubal, I use the word Muslim in its exact technical sense, not as a sectarian, which Merriam incorrectly terms Mohammedan, and which I'm going to go right on calling you until you learn to pronounce Miriam correctly. Quit squirming. I'm not hurting you. Yes, Miriam. Ouch! Women should not be so muscular. Jubal, as a scientist, I find Michael the greatest prize of my career. As a Muslim, I find in him a willingness to submit to the will of God. And this makes me happy for his sake although I readily admit that there are great semantic difficulties, and as yet he does not seem to grok what the English word God means. He shrugged. Nor the Arabic word Allah. But as a man, and always a slave of God, I love this young man, our foster son and water brother, and I would not have him come under bad influences. Quite aside from his creed, this Digby strikes me as a bad influence. What do you think? Ole, Ben applauded. He's a slimy bastard, and the only reason I haven't been taking his racket apart in my column is that the syndicate is afraid to print it. Stinky, keep talking that well, and you'll have me studying Arabic and buying a rug. I hope so, but the rug is not necessary. Jubal sighed. I agree with both of you. I'd rather see Mike smoking marijuana than be converted by Digby. But I don't think there's the slightest chance of Mike's being taken in by that syncretic hodgepodge Digby pedals. And he's got to learn to stand up to bad influences. I consider you a good influence. But I don't really think you stand much more chance than Digby has. The boy has an amazingly strong mind of his own. Muhammad may have to make way for a new prophet. If God so wills it, Mahmud answered calmly. That leaves no room for argument, Jubal agreed. We were discussing religion before you got home, Dorcas said softly. Boss, did you know that women have souls? They do. So Stinky says. Mariam, Mahmud explained, wanted to know why we Mohammedans thought only men had souls. So I cited the writings. Miriam, I'm surprised at you. That's as vulgar a misconception as the notion that Jews sacrifice Christian babies in secret obscene rites. The Koran is explicit. In half a dozen places that entire families enter into paradise, men and women together. For example, see Ornaments of Gold, verse 70. Isn't it stinky? Enter the garden, ye and your wives, to be made glad. That's as well as it can be put in English, agreed Mahmud. Well, said Miriam, I had heard about the beautiful hauris that Mohammedan men have for playthings when they go to heaven, and that didn't seem to leave much room for wives. Hauris aren't women, said Jubal. They are separate creations, like jinni and angels. They don't need human souls. They are spirits to start with, eternal and unchanging and beautiful. There are male hauris, too, or the male equivalent of hauris. Hauris don't have to earn their way into paradise. They're on the staff. They serve endless, delicious foods and pass around drinks that never give hangovers and entertain in other ways as requested. But the souls of human wives don't have to do any housework, any more than the men. Correct, Stinky? Close enough, aside from your flippant choice of words. The Hauris, 
He stopped and sat up so suddenly that he dumped Miriam. Say, it's just possible that you girls don't have souls. Miriam sat up and said bitterly, Why, you ungrateful dog of an infidel, take that back. Peace, Miriam. If you don't have a soul, then you're immortal anyhow and won't miss it. Jubal, is it possible for a man to die and not notice it? Can't say. Never tried it. Could I have died on Mars and just dreamed that I came home? Look around you. A garden the prophet himself would be pleased with. Four beautiful houris, passing around lovely food and delicious drinks at all hours. Even their male counterparts, if you want to be fussy. Is this paradise? I can guarantee that it isn't, Jubal assured him. My taxes are due this week. Still, that doesn't affect me. And take these hauris. Even if we stipulate for the sake of argument that they are of beauty adequate to meet the specifications, after all, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. They pass. And you'll pay for that, boss, Miriam added. There still remains, Jubal pointed out. One more requisite attribute of Hauri's. Hmm, said Mahmoud. I don't think we need to go into that. In paradise, rather than a temporary physical condition, it would be a permanent spiritual attribute, more a state of mind. Yes? In that case, Jubal said emphatically, I am certain that these are not Hauri's. Mahmoud sighed. In that case, I'll just have to convert one. Why only one? There are still places left in the world where you can have the full quota. No, my friend. In the wise words of the prophet, while the legislations permit four, it is impossible for a man to deal justly with more than one. That's some relief. Which one? We'll have to see. Mariam, are you feeling spiritual? You go to hell. How reason? Deed. Jill? Give me a break, Ben protested. I'm still working on Jill. Later, Jill. Anne? Sorry, I've got a date. Dorcas? You're my last chance. Stinky, she said softly. Just how spiritual do you want me to feel? When Mike got inside the house, he went straight upstairs to his room, closed the door, got on the bed, assumed the fetal position, rolled up his eyes, swallowed his tongue, and slowed his heart almost to nothing. He knew that Jill did not like him to do this in the daytime, but she did not object as long as he did not do it publicly. There were so many things that he must not do publicly, but only this one really aroused her ire. He had been waiting to do this ever since he had left that room of terrible wrongness. He needed very badly to withdraw and try to grok all that had happened. For he had done something else that Jill had told him not to. He felt a very human urge to tell himself that it had been forced on him, that it was not his fault. But his Martian training did not permit him this easy escape. He had arrived at a cusp. Right action had been required. The choice had been his. He grokked that he had chosen correctly, but his water brother Jill had forbidden this choice. But that would have left him no choice. This was contradiction. At a cusp, choice is. By choice, spirit grows. He considered whether or not Jill would have approved had he taken other action. Not wasting food? No. He grokked that Jill's injunction had covered that variant of action, too. At this point, the being sprung from human genes shaped by Martian thought, and who could never be either one, completed one stage of his growth, burst out and ceased to be a nestling. The solitary loneliness of predestined free will was then his, and with it the Martian serenity to embrace it, cherish it, savor its bitterness, and accept its consequences. 
With tragic joy, he knew that this cusp was his, not Jill's. His water brother could teach, admonish, guide, but choice at a cusp was not shared. Here was ownership beyond any possible sale, gift, hypothecation. Owner and owned, grocked fully, inseparable. He eternally was the action he had taken at cusp, now that he knew himself to be self, he was free to grok ever closer to his brothers, merge without let. Self's integrity was and is and ever had been. Mike stopped to cherish all his brother selves, the many threes fulfilled on Mars, both corporate and discorporate, the precious few on Earth, the as yet unknown powers of three on Earth, that would be his to merge with and cherish, now that at last, long waiting, he grokked and cherished himself. Mike remained in his trance. There was still much to grok, loose ends and bits and pieces to be puzzled over and fitted into his growing pattern. All that he had seen and heard and been at the Archangel Foster Tabernacle not just the cusp he had encountered when he and Digby had come face to face alone. Why Bishop Senator Boone had made him warily uneasy without frightening him. Why Miss Dawn Ardent had tasted like a water brother when she was not. The texture and smell of the goodness he had incompletely grokked in the jumping up and down and the wailing. Jubal's stored conversation both coming and going. Jubal's words troubled him more than other details. He studied them with great care, compared them with what he had been taught as a nestling, making great effort to bridge between his two languages, the one he thought with and the one he now spoke and was gradually learning to think in for some purposes. The human word church, which turned up over and over again among Jubal's words, gave him most knotty difficulty. There was no Martian concept of any sort to match it, unless one took church and worship and God and congregation and many other words and equated them all to the totality of the only world he had known during most of his growing waiting, then forced the concept back awkwardly into English in that phrase which had been rejected, but by each differently, by Jubal, by Mahmud, by Digby. Thou art God. He came closer to understanding it in English himself now, although it could never have the crystal inevitability of the Martian concept it stood for. In his mind, he spoke simultaneously the English sentence and the Martian word and felt closer grokking. Repeating it like a student telling himself that the jewel is in the lotus, he sank into nirvana untroubled. Shortly before midnight, he speeded up his heart, resumed normal breathing, ran down his engineering checklist, found that all was in order, uncurled, and sat up. He had been spiritually weary. Now he felt light and gay and clear-headed, eager to get on with the many actions he saw spreading out before him. He felt a puppyish need for company almost as strong as his earlier necessity for quiet. He stepped out into the upper hall, was delighted to encounter a water brother. Hi! Oh, hello, Mike. My, you look chipper. I feel fine. Where is everybody? Everybody's asleep but you and me. So keep your voice down. Ben and Stinky went home an hour ago and people started going to bed. Oh! Mike felt mildly disappointed that Mahmoud had left. He wanted to explain to him his new grokking. But he would do so when next he saw him. I ought to be asleep too but I felt like a snack. Are you hungry? Me? Sure. I'm hungry. Good. You ought to be. You missed dinner. Come on. I know there's some cold chicken, and we'll see what else. 
They went downstairs, loaded a tray lavishly. Let's take it outside. It's still plenty warm. That's a fine idea, Mike agreed. Warm enough to swim, if we wanted to? This is a real Indian summer. Just a second. I'll switch on the floods. Don't bother, Mike answered. I'll carry the tray. I can see. He could see, as they all knew, in almost total darkness. Jubal said that his exceptional night sight probably came from the conditions in which he had grown up. And Mike grokked that that was true, but he grokked also that there was more to it than that. His foster parents had taught him to see. As for the night being warm enough, he would have been comfortable naked on Mount Everest. But he knew that his water brothers had very little tolerance for changes in temperature and pressure. He was always considerate of their weakness, once he had learned of it. But he was eagerly looking forward to snow, seeing for himself that each tiny crystal of the water of life was a unique individual, as he had read, walking barefoot in it, rolling in it. In the meantime, he was equally pleased with the unseasonably warm autumn night and the still more pleasing company of his water brother. Okay, you carry the tray. I'll switch on just the underwater lights. That'll be plenty to eat by. Fine. Mike liked having light coming up through the ripples. It was a goodness, a beauty, even though he did not need it. They picnicked by the pool then lay back on the grass and looked at the stars. Mike, there's Mars. It is Mars, isn't it? Or is it Antares? It is Mars. Mike, what are they doing on Mars? He hesitated a long time. The question was too wide in scope to pin down to the sparse English language. On the side toward the horizon, the southern hemisphere, it is spring. The plants are being taught to grow. Taught to grow? He hesitated only slightly. Larry teaches plants to grow every day. I have helped him. But my people, the Martians, I mean, I grok now that you are my people. Teach the plants another way. In the other hemisphere it is growing colder, and the nymphs, those who have stayed alive through the summer, are being brought into the nests for quickening and more growing. He thought, Of the humans we left at the equator when I came here, one has discorporated and the others are sad. Yes, I heard about it in the news. Mike had not heard about it in the news. He had not known it until he was asked. They should not be sad. Mr. Booker T. W. Jones, food technician first class, is not sad. The old ones have cherished him. You knew him? Yes. He had his own face, dark and beautiful. But he was homesick. Oh, dear. Mike, do you ever get homesick? For Mars? At first, I was very homesick he answered truthfully. I was lonely always. He rolled toward her and took her in his arms. But now I am not lonely. I grok I shall never be lonely again. Mike, darling. They kissed and went on kissing. Presently his water brother said breathlessly, Oh, my! That was almost worse than the first time. You are all right, my brother? Yes, yes, indeed. Kiss me again. Quite a long time later, by cosmic clock, she said, Mike, is that... I mean, do you know? I know. It is for growing closer. Now we grow closer. Well, I've been ready a long time. Goodness, we all have, but never mind, dear. Turn just a little. I'll help. As they merged, grokking together, 
Mike said softly and triumphantly, Thou art God. Her answer was not in words. Then, as their grokking made them ever closer, and Mike felt himself almost ready to discorporate, her voice called him back. Oh, oh, thou art God. We grok God. Twenty-five. On Mars, the little human advance guard were building half-buried pressure domes for the larger male and female party that would arrive by next ship. This work went much faster than originally scheduled as the Martians were uncritically helpful. Part of the time saved was spent in preparing a preliminary estimate on a very long-distance plan to free the bound oxygen in the sands of Mars to make the planet more friendly to future human generations. The old ones neither helped nor hindered these long-distance human plans. Time was not yet. Their own meditations were approaching a violent cusp that would control the shape of Martian art for many millennia. On Earth, Elections continued as usual, and a very advanced poet published a limited edition of verse consisting entirely of punctuation marks and spaces. Time magazine reviewed it and suggested that the Federation Assembly Daily Record could profitably be translated into the same medium. The poet was invited to lecture at the University of Chicago, which he did, clad in full formal evening dress, lacking only trousers and shoes. A colossal advertising campaign opened to sell more sexual organs of plants for human use, and Mrs. Joseph, shadow of greatness, Douglas, was quoted as saying, I would no more think of sitting down to eat without flowers on my table than without serviettes. A Tibetan swami from Palermo, Sicily, announced in Beverly Hills a newly discovered ancient yoga discipline for ripple breathing which greatly increased both prana and the cosmic attraction between the sexes. His chelas were required to assume the matsyendra posture, dressed in hand-woven diapers while he read aloud from the Rig Veda, and an assistant guru checked through their purses in another room. Nothing was ever stolen from the purses. The purpose was less immediate. The President of the United States, by proclamation, named the first Sunday in November as National Grandmother's Day and urged the grandchildren of America to say it with flowers. A funeral parlor chain was indicted for price-cutting. The Fosterite bishops, after secret conclave, announced the Church's second major miracle. Supreme Bishop Digby had been translated bodily to heaven and spot promoted to Archangel, ranking with but after Archangel Foster. The glorious news had been held up pending heavenly confirmation of the elevation of a new supreme bishop, Huey Short, a compromise candidate accepted by the Boone faction after the lots had been cast repeatedly. Lunita and Oi published identical doctrinaire denunciations of Short's elevation, L'Osservatore Romano, and the Christian Science Monitor ignored it, Times of India snickered at it editorially, and the Manchester Guardian reported it without comment. The Fosterite congregation in England was small, but extremely militant. Digby was not pleased with his promotion. The man from Mars had interrupted him with his work half-finished, and that stupid jackass Short was certain to louse it up. Foster listened to him with angelic patience until Digby ran down, then said, Listen, Junior, you're an angel now, so forget it. Eternity is no time for recriminations. You, too, were a stupid jackass until you poisoned me. Afterwards, you did well enough. Now that Short is Supreme Bishop, 
He'll do all right, too. He can't help it. Same as with the popes. Some of them were warts until they got promoted. Check with one of them. Go ahead. There's no professional jealousy here. Digby calmed down a little, but made one request. Foster shook his halo in negation. You can't touch him. You shouldn't have tried to touch him in the first place. Oh, you can submit a requisition for a miracle if you want to make a bloody fool of yourself. But I'm telling you, it'll be turned down. You simply don't understand the system yet. The Martians have their own setup, different from ours. And as long as they need him, we can't touch him. They run their own show their own way. The universe has variety, something for everybody, a fact you field workers often miss. You mean this punk can brush me aside, and I've got to hold still for it? I held still for the same thing, didn't I? I'm helping you now, am I not? Now look, there's work to be done, and lots of it, before you can expect to be promoted again. The boss wants performance, not gripes. If you need a day off to get your nerve back, duck over to the Muslim paradise and take it. Otherwise, straighten your halo, square your wings, and dig in. The sooner you start acting like an angel, the quicker you'll start feeling angelic. Get happy, Junior. Digby heaved a deep, ethereal sigh. Okay, I'm happy. Where do I start? Jubal was not disturbed by Digby's disappearance, because he did not hear of it even as soon as it was announced, and when he did hear, while he had a fleeting suspicion as to who had performed the miracle, he dismissed it from his mind. If Mike had had a finger in it, he had gotten away with it. And what happened to supreme bishops worried Jubal not at all, as long as he didn't have to be bothered with it. More important, his own household had gone through a considerable upset. In this case, Jubal knew what had happened, but did not care to inquire. That is to say, Jubal guessed what had happened, but did not know with whom, and didn't want to know. A slight case of rape. Was rape the word? Well, statutory rape. No, not that either. Mike was of legal age and presumed to be able to defend himself in the clinches. Anyhow, it was high time the boy was salted, no matter how it had happened. Jubal couldn't even reconstruct the crime from the way the girls behaved because their patterns kept shifting. Sometimes... A, B, C versus D, then B, C, D versus A, or A, B versus C, D, or A, D versus C, B, through all possible ways that four women can gang up on each other. This continued for most of the week following that ill-starred trip to church, during which period Mike stayed in his room in a withdrawal trance so deep that Jubal would have pronounced him dead had he not seen it before. Jubal would not have minded it if the service around the place had not gone to hell in a bucket. The girls seemed to spend half their time tiptoeing in to see if Mike was all right, and they were too preoccupied to cook properly, much less to be decent secretaries. Even rock-steady Anne. Hell, Anne was the worst of the lot, absent-minded and subject to unexplained tears, and Jubal would have bet his life that if Anne were to witness the second coming, she would simply have memorized date, time, personae, events, and barometric pressure without batting her calm blue eyes. Then, late Thursday afternoon, Mike woke himself up, and suddenly it was A, B, C, D in the service of Mike, less than the dust beneath his chariot wheels. Inasmuch as the girls now found time to give Jubal perfect service, too, Jubal counted his blessings and let it lie, except for a wry and very private thought that, if he had demanded a showdown, Mike could easily quintuple their salary simply by dropping a postcard to Douglas, but that the girls would just as readily have supported Mike.
Once domestic tranquility was restored, Jubal did not mind that his kingdom was now ruled by a mayor of the palace. Meals were on time and, if possible, better than ever. When he shouted, Front! The girl who appeared was bright-eyed, happy, and efficient. Such being the case, Jubal did not give a hoot who rated the most side boys. Or girls. Besides, the change in Mike was as interesting to Jubal as the restoration of peace was pleasant. Before that week, Mike had been docile in a fashion that Jubal classed as pathological. Now he was so self-confident that Jubal would have described it as cocky had it not been that Mike continued to be unfailingly polite and considerate. But he accepted homage from the girls as if a natural right. He seemed older than his calendar age rather than younger. His voice had deepened. He spoke with disciplined forcefulness rather than timidly. Jubal decided that Mike had joined the human race. He could, in his mind, discharge this patient as cured. Except, Jubal reminded himself on one point, Mike still did not laugh. He could smile at a joke and sometimes did not ask to have them explained to him. Mike was cheerful, even merry, but he never laughed. Jubal decided that it was not important. This patient was sane healthy, and human. Short weeks earlier, Jubal would have given odds against the cure taking place. He was honest and humble enough as a physician not to claim credit. The girls had had more to do with it, or should he say, girl? From the first week of his stay, Jubal had told Mike almost daily that he was welcome to stay, but that he should stir out and see the world as soon as he felt able. In view of this, Jubal should not have been surprised when Mike announced one breakfast that he was leaving. But he was both surprised and, to his greater surprise, hurt. He covered it by using his napkin unnecessarily before answering. So? When? We're leaving today. Um, plural. Jubal looked around the table. Are Larry and Duke and I going to have to put up with our own cooking until I can dig up more help? We've talked that over, Mike answered. Jill is going with me, nobody else. I do need somebody with me, Jubal. I know quite well that I don't know as yet how people do things out in the world. I still make mistakes. I need a guide for a time. I think it ought to be Jill, because she wants to go on learning Martian. And the others think so, too. But if you want Jill to stay, then it could be someone else. Duke and Larry are each willing to help me, if you can't spare one of the girls. You mean I get a vote? What? Jubal, it has to be your decision. We all know that. Son, you're a gent, and you've probably just told your first lie. I doubt if I could hold even Duke if you set your mind against it. I guess it ought to be Jill. But look, kids, this is still your home. The latch string is out. We know that, and we'll be back. Again, we will share water. We will, son. Yes, father. Huh? Jubal, there is no Martian word for father, but lately I have grokked that you are my father, and Jill's father. Jubal glanced at Jill. Mmm, I grok. Take care of yourselves. Yes, come, Jill. They were gone before he left the table. Twenty-six. It was the usual sort of carnival in the usual sort of town. The rides were the same, the cotton candy tasted the same, the flat joints practiced a degree of moderation acceptable to the local law in separating the marks from their half-dollars, 
whether with baseballs thrown at targets, with wheels of fortune, or what. But the separation took place just the same. The sex lecture was trimmed to suit local opinions concerning Charles Darwin's opinions. The girls in the posing show wore that amount of gauze that local mores required. And the fearless Fentons did their death-defying, in sober truth, double-dive just before the last ballet each night. The ten-in-one show was equally standard. It did not have a mentalist. It did have a magician. It did not have a bearded lady. It did have a half-man, half-woman. It did not have a sword-swallower. It did have a fire-eater. In place of a tattooed man, the show had a tattooed lady, who was also a snake-charmer, and for the blow-off, at another half-dollar per mark, she appeared absolutely nude, clothed only in bare living flesh in exotic designs, and any mark who could find one square inch below her neckline untattooed would be awarded a twenty-dollar bill. That twenty dollars had gone unclaimed all season, because the blow-off was honestly ballyhooed. Mrs. Pywonski stood perfectly still and completely unclothed, other than in bare living flesh. In this case, a fourteen-foot boa constrictor known as Honeybun. Honeybun was looped around Mrs. P. so strategically that even the local ministerial alliance could find no real excuse to complain, especially as some of their own daughters wore not nearly as much and covered still less while attending the carnival. To keep the placid, docile Honeybun from being disturbed, Mrs. P. took the precaution of standing on a small platform in the middle of a canvas tank, on the floor of which were more than a dozen cobras. The occasional drunk, who was certain that all snake charmer snakes were defanged, and so tried to climb into the tank in pursuit of that undecorated square inch, invariably changed his opinion as soon as a cobra noticed him, lifted and spread its hood. Besides, the lighting wasn't very good. However, the drunk could not have won the twenty dollars in any case. Mrs. P.'s claim was much sounder than the dollar. She and her late husband had had for many years a tattooing studio in San Pedro. When trade was slack, they had decorated each other. And eventually, at some minor inconvenience to herself, the artwork on her was so definitively complete from her neck down that there was no possible room for an encore. She took great pride both in the fact that she was the most completely decorated woman in the world and by the world's greatest artist, for such was her humbly grateful opinion of her late husband, and also in the certainty that every dollar she earned was honest. She associated with grifters and sinners, and did not hold herself aloof from them, but her own integrity was untouched. She and her husband had been converted by Foster himself, she kept her membership in San Pedro and attended services at the nearest branch of the Church of the New Revelation, no matter where she was. Patricia Piwanski would gladly have dispensed with the protection of Honeybun in the blow-off, not merely to prove that she was honest, that needed no proof, since she knew it was true, but because she was serene in her conviction that she was the canvas for religious art greater than any on the walls or ceilings of the Vatican. When she and George had seen the light, there was still about three square feet of Patricia untouched. Before he died, she carried a complete pictorial life of Foster, from his crib with the angels hovering around, to the day of glory, when he had taken his appointed place among the archangels. Regrettably, since it might have turned many sinners into seekers of the light, much of this sacred history had to be covered up, the amount depending on the local lawmen. But she could show it in closed happiness meetings of the local churches she attended, if the shepherd wanted her to, which he almost always did. But while it was always good to add to happiness, the saved did not need it. Patricia would rather have saved sinners. She couldn't preach. She couldn't sing, and she had never been called to speak in tongues, but she was a living witness to the light. In the ten and one, her act came next to last, just before the magician. 
This gave her time to put away unsold photographs of herself, a quarter for black and white, half a dollar in color, a set of special photographs for five dollars in a sealed envelope, sold only to Marx, who signed a printed form alleging that they were doctors of medicine, psychologists, sociologists, or other such entitled to professional material not available to the general public. And such was Patricia's integrity that she would not sell these even for ten dollars if the mark did not look the part. She would then ask to see his business card. No dirty dollars were going to put her kids through school. And also gave her time to slip behind the rear canvas and get herself and her snakes ready for the blow-off. The magician, Dr. Apollo, performed on the last platform nearest to the canvas fly leading to the blow-off. He started by passing out to his audience a dozen shiny steel rings, each as wide as a plate. He invited them to convince themselves that each ring was solid and smooth. Then he had them hold the rings so that they overlapped. Dr. Apollo walked along the platform, reached out with his wand, and tapped each overlap. The solid steel links formed a chain. Casually, he laid his wand in the air, rolled up his sleeves, accepted a bowl of eggs from his assistant, and started to juggle half a dozen of them. His juggling did not attract too many eyes. His assistant was more worthy of stares. She was a fine example of modern functional design, and while she wore a great deal more than did the young ladies in the posing show, nevertheless, there seemed to be a strong probability that she was not tattooed anywhere. The Marks hardly noticed it when the six eggs became five, then four, three, two, until at last Dr. Apollo was tossing one egg in the air with his sleeve still rolled up and a puzzled look on his face. At last, he said, eggs are getting scarcer every year and tossed the remaining egg over the heads of those nearest the platform to a man in the back of the crowd. Catch! He turned away and did not seem to notice that the egg never reached its destination. Dr. Apollo performed several other tricks while wearing always the same slightly puzzled expression and with the same indifferent patter. Once he called a young boy close to the platform. Son, I can tell you what you are thinking. You think I'm not a real magician. And you're right. For that, you win a dollar. He handed the kid a dollar bill. It disappeared. The magician looked unhappy. Dropped it? Well, hang on to this one. A second bill disappeared. Oh, dear. Well, we'll have to give you one more chance. Use both hands. Got it? All right. Better get out of here fast with it. You should be home in bed anyhow. The kid dashed away with the money, and the magician turned back and again looked puzzled. Madame Merlin, what should we do now? His pretty assistant came up to him, pulled his head down by one ear, whispered in it. He shook his head. No, not in front of all these people. She whispered again. He looked distressed. I'm sorry, friends, but Madame Merlin insists that she wants to go to bed. Will any of you gentlemen help her? He blinked at the rush of volunteers. Oh, just two of you. Were any of you gentlemen in the army? There were still more than enough volunteers. Dr. Apollo picked two and said, There's an army cot under the end of the platform. Just lift up the canvas. Now... Will you set it up for her here on the platform? Madame Merlin, face this way, please. While the two men set up the cot, Dr. Apollo made passes in the air at his assistant. Sleep, sleep. You are now asleep. Friends, she is in a deep trance. Will you two gentlemen who so kindly prepared her bed now place her on it? One take her head, one take her feet. Careful now. In corpse-like rigidity, the girl was transferred to the cot. Thank you, gentlemen, but we ought not to leave her uncovered, should we? There was a sheet here somewhere. Oh, there it is. The magician reached out, recovered his wand from where he had parked it, pointed to a table laden with props at the far end of his platform. A sheet detached itself from the pile and came to him. 
Just spread this over her. Cover her head, too. A lady should not be exposed to public gaze while sleeping. Thank you. Now, if you will just step down off the platform. Fine. Madame Merlin. Can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Apollo. You were heavy with sleep. Now you are resting. You feel lighter, much lighter. You are sleeping on a bed of clouds. You are floating away on clouds. The sheet-covered form raised slowly up about her foot. Whoops! Don't get too light. We don't want to lose you. In the crowd, a boy in his late teens explained in a loud whisper, She's not under the sheet now. When they put the sheet over her, she went down through a trap door. That's just a light framework. Doesn't weigh as much as the sheet. And in a minute, he'll flip the sheet away, and while he does, the framework will collapse and disappear. It's just a gimmick. Everybody could do it. Dr. Apollo ignored him and went on talking. A little higher, Madame Merlin. Higher. There. The draped form floated about six feet above the platform. The smart youngster whispered to his friends, There's a slender steel rod, but you can't see it too easily. It's probably where one corner of the sheet hangs down there and touches the cot. Dr. Apollo turned and requested his volunteers to remove the cot and put it back under the platform. She doesn't need it now. She sleeps on clouds. He faced the floating form and appeared to be listening. What? Louder, please. Oh? She says that she doesn't want the sheet. It's too heavy. Here's where the framework disappears. The magician tugged one corner of the sheet, snatched it away. The audience hardly noticed that the sheet disappeared without his bothering to gather it in. They were looking at Madame Merlin, still floating, still sleeping. Six feet above the platform. The platform stood in the middle rear of the tent, and the audience surrounded it on all sides. A companion of the boy who knew all about stage magic said, Okay, Speedy, where's the steel rod? The kid said uncertainly, You have to look where he doesn't want you to look. It's the way they've got those lights fixed to shine right into your eyes. Dr. Apollo said, that's enough sleep, fairy princess. Give me your hand. Wake up. Wake up. He took her hand, pulled her erect, and helped her step down to the platform. You see, you saw how stiff she got down? You saw where she put her foot? That's where the steel rod went. The kid added with satisfaction, Just a gimmick. The magician went on talking. And now, friends, if you will kindly give your attention to our learned lecturer, Professor Timoshenko. The talker cut in at once. Don't go away. For this one performance, only by arrangement with the Council of Colleges and Universities and with the permission of the Department of Safety and Welfare of this wonderful city, we are offering this $20 bill absolutely free to any one of you. Most of the tip was turned into the blow-off. A few wandered around and started to leave as most of the lights in the main tent were turned off. The freaks and other carnies started packing their props and slum preparatory to tear down. There was a train jump coming in the morning, and living tops would remain up for a few hours' sleep, but canvas boys were already loosening stakes on the sideshow top. Shortly, the talker owner-manager of the ten-in-one came back into the semi-darkened tent, having rushed the blow-off and spilled the last marks out the rear exit. Smitty, don't go away. Got something for you. He handed the magician an envelope, which Dr. Apollo tucked away without looking at it. The manager added, Kid, I hate to tell you this, but you and your wife ain't going with us to Paducah. I know. Well, look, don't take it hard. There's nothing personal about it, but I got to think of the show. We're replacing you with a mentalist team. They do a top reading act. Then she runs a phrenology and mitt camp while he makes with the mad ball. We need him. And you know as well as I do, you didn't have no season's guarantee. You were just on trial. I know, agreed the magician. 
I knew it was time to leave. No hard feelings, Tim. Well, I'm glad you feel that way about it. The talker hesitated. Smitty, do you want some advice? Just say no if you don't. I would like very much to have your advice, the magician said simply. Okay, you asked for it. Smitty, your tricks are good. Hell, some of them even got me baffled. But clever tricks don't make a magician. The trouble is, you're not really with it. You behave like a carny. You mind your own business, and you never crab anybody else's act, and you're helpful if anybody needs it. But you're not a carny. You know why? You don't have any feeling for what makes a chump a chump. You don't get inside his mind. A real magician can make the marks open their mouths and catch flies just by picking a quarter out of the air. That Thurston's levitation you do. I've never seen it done any more perfectly, but the marks don't warm to it. No psychology. Now take me, for example. I can't even pick a quarter out of the air. Hell, I can barely use a knife and fork without cutting my mouth. I got no act. Except I got the one act that counts. I know marks. I know where that streak of larceny is in his heart. I know just how wide it is. I know what he hungers for, whether he knows it or not. That's showmanship, son. Whether you're a politician running for office, a preacher pounding a pulpit, or a magician. You find out what the chumps want, and you can leave half your props in your trunk. I'm sure you're right. I know I am. He wants sex and blood and money. We don't give him any real blood, unless a fire-eater or a knife-thrower makes a terrible mistake. We don't give him money either. We just encourage him to hope for it, while we take away a little. We don't give him any real sex. But why do seven out of ten of a tip buy the blow-off? To see a naked broad, that's why. And a chance to be paid a double sawbuck for looking. When maybe they got one just as good or better at home, naked any time they like. So he don't see one, and he don't get paid, and still we send him out happy. What else does a chump want? Mystery. He wants to think that the world is a romantic place, when he knows damn well it ain't. That's your job. Only you ain't learned how, shucks, son. Even the marks know that your tricks are fake. Only they'd like to believe they're real, and it's up to you to help them believe. As long as they're inside the show, that's what you lack. How do I get it, Tim? How do I learn what makes a chump tick? Hell, I can't tell you that. That's the piece you have to learn for yourself. Get out and stir around and be a chump yourself a while, maybe. But, well, take this notion you had of billing yourself as the man from Mars. You mustn't offer the chump what he won't swallow. They've all seen the man from Mars in pictures and on stereo vision. Hell, I've seen him myself. Sure, you look a bit like him, same general type, a casual resemblance. But even if you were his twin brother, the Marks know they won't find the man from Mars in a ten and one in the sticks. It's as silly as it would be to bill a sword swallower as the President of the United States. Get me? A chump wants to believe, but he won't thank you to insult what trace of intelligence he has, and even a chump has brains of a sort. You have to remember that. I will remember. Okay, I talk too much, but a talker gets in the habit. Are you kids going to be all right? How's the grouch bag? Hell, I oughtn't to do it. But do you need a loan? Thanks, Tim. We're not hurting any. Well, take care of yourself. Bye, Jill. He hurried out. Patricia Piwanski came in through the rear fly, wearing a robe. Kids, Tim sloughed your act. We were leaving anyhow, Pat. I knew he was going to. He makes me so mad I'm tempted to jump the show myself. Now, Pat, I mean it. I could take my act anywhere, and he knows it. Leave him without a blow-off. He can get other acts. But a good blow-off that the clowns won't clobber is hard to find. Pat, Tim is right, and Jill and I know it. I don't have showmanship. Well, maybe so, but I'm going to miss you. You've been just like my own kids to me. Oh dear, look, the show doesn't roll until morning. Come back to my living top and sit a while and visit. Jill said, "Better yet, Patty." Come into town with us and have a couple of drinks. How would you like to soak yourself in a big hot 
tub with bath salts. Ah, uh, I'll bring a bottle. No, Mike objected. I know what you drink, and we've got it. Come along. Well, I'll come. You're at the Imperial, aren't you? But I can't come with you. I've got to be sure my babies are all right first, and tell Honey Bun I'll be gone a bit and fix her hot water bottles. I'll catch a cab. Half an hour, maybe? They drove into town with Mike at the controls. It was a fairly small town, without automatic traffic control even downtown. Mike drove with careful precision, exactly at zone maximum and sliding the little ground car into holes Jill could not see until they were through them. He did it without effort in the same fashion in which he juggled. Jill knew how it was done, had even learned to do it a bit herself. Mike stretched his time sense until the problem of juggling eggs or speeding through traffic was an easy one with everything in slow motion. Nevertheless, she reflected that it was an odd accomplishment for a man who only months earlier had been baffled by tying shoelaces. She did not talk. Mike could talk while on extended time, if necessary, but it was awkward to converse while they were running on different time rates. Instead, she thought with mild nostalgia of the life they were leaving, calling it up in her mind and cherishing it, some of it in Martian concepts, more of it in English. She had enjoyed it very much, all her life, until she had met Mike. She had been under the tyranny of the clock, first as a little girl in school, then as a bigger girl in a much harder school, then under the unforgiving pressures of hospital routine. The carnival had been nothing like that. Aside from the easy and rather pleasant chore of standing around and looking pretty several times a day from mid-afternoon to the last bally of the night, she never had anything she actually had to do at any set time. Mike did not care whether they ate once a day or six times, and whatever housekeeping she chose to do suited him. They had their own living top and camping equipment. In many towns they had never left the lot from arrival to teardown. The carnival was a closed little world, an enclave, where the headlines and troubles of the outside world did not reach. She had been happy in it. To be sure, in every town the lot was crawling with marks, but she had acquired the carny viewpoint. Marks did not count. They might as well have been behind glass. Jill quite understood why the girls in the posing show could and did exhibit themselves in very little and in some towns nothing, if the fix was solid, without feeling immodest, and without being immodest in their conduct outside the posing show. Marks weren't people to them. They were blobs of nothing, hardly seen, whose sole function was to cough up half dollars for the take. Yes, the Kearney had been a happy, utterly safe home, even though their act had flopped. It had not always been that way when first they left the safety of Jubal's home to go out into the world and increase Mike's education. They had been spotted more than once, and several times they had had trouble getting away, not only from the press, but from the endless people who seemed to feel that they had a right to demand things of Mike simply because he had the misfortune to be the man from Mars. Presently, Mike had thought his features into more mature lines and had made other slight changes in his appearance. That, plus the fact that they frequented places where the man from Mars would certainly not be expected by the public to go, got them privacy. About that time, when Jill was phoning home to give a new mailing address, Jubal had suggested a cover-up story. And a couple of days later, Jill had read that the man from Mars had again gone into retreat this time in a Tibetan monastery. The retreat had actually been Hank's Grill in a nowhere town with Jill as a waitress and Mike as dishwasher. It was no worse than being a nurse and much less demanding, and her feet no longer hurt. Mike had a remarkably quick way of cleaning dishes, although he had to be careful not to use it when the boss was watching. They kept that job a week, then moved on, sometimes working, sometimes not. They visited public libraries almost daily, once Mike found out about them. Jill had discovered that Mike had taken for granted that Jubal's library contained a copy of every book on earth. When he learned the marvelous truth, 
They had remained in Akron nearly a month. Jill did quite a lot of shopping that month, as Mike with a book was almost no company at all. But Baxter's combined shows and riot of fun for all the family had been the nicest part of their meandering trip. Jill recalled with an inner giggle the time in what town? No matter. When the entire posing show had been pinched. It wasn't fair, even by chump's standards, since that concession always worked under precise prearrangement. Bras or no bras, blue lights or bright lights, whatever the top town clown ordained. Nevertheless, the sheriff had hauled them in, and the local justice of the peace had seemed disposed not only to fine, but to jail the girls as vagrants. The lot had closed down, and most of the carnies had gone to the hearing, along with innumerable chumps slavering to catch sight of shameless women getting their comeuppance. Mike and Jill had managed to crowd against the back wall of the courtroom. Jill had long since impressed on Mike that he must never do anything that an ordinary human could not do where it might be noticed. But Mike had grokked a cusp and had not discussed it with Jill. The sheriff was testifying as to what he had seen, the details of this public lewdness, and he was enjoying it. Mike had restrained himself, Jill admitted. In the midst of testimony, both sheriff and judge became suddenly and completely without clothes of any sort. She and Mike slipped quietly away during the excitement, and later she learned that the accused, all of them, had left too, and nobody seemed disposed to object. Of course, no one had connected the miracle with Mike, and he himself had never mentioned it to Jill, nor she to him. It was not necessary. The show had torn down at once and moved on two days early to a more honest town, where the rule was net bra and briefies and no beefs afterwards. But Jill would treasure forever the expression on the sheriff's face, and his appearance, too, when it was plain to be seen that his sudden sag in front meant that the sheriff had been wearing a tight corset for his pride. Yes, carny days had been nice days. She started to speak to Mike in her mind, intending to remind him of how funny that hick sheriff had looked with creases from his girdle on his hairy pot belly. But she stopped. Martian had no concept for funny, so of course she could not say it. They shared a growing telepathic bond, but in Martian only. Yes, Jill? His mind answered hers. Later. Shortly they approached the Imperial Hotel, and she felt his mind slow down as he parked the car. Jill much preferred camping on the carnival grounds, except for one thing bathtubs. Showers were all right, but nothing could beat a big tub of hot, hot water, climb into it up to your chin, and soak. Sometimes they checked into a hotel for a few days and rented a ground car. Mike did not, by early training, share her fanatic enthusiasm for scrubbing. He was now as fastidiously clean as she was, but only because she had trained him to be. Dirt did not annoy him. Moreover, he could keep himself immaculate without wasting time on washing or bathing, just as he had never had to see a barber once he knew precisely how Jill wanted his hair to grow. But Mike, too, liked the time spent in hotels for the sake of baptism alone. He enjoyed immersing himself in the water of life as much as ever, irrespective of a non-existent need to clean and no longer with any superstitious feeling about water. The Imperial was a very old hotel, and had not been much even when new, but the tub, in what was proudly called the bridal suite, was satisfactorily large. Jill went straight to it as they came in, started to fill it, and was hardly surprised to find herself suddenly ready for her bath, even to pretty bare feet, except that her purse was still clutched under her arm. Dear Mike, he knew how she liked to shop, how pleased she was with new clothes. He gently forced her to indulge her childish weakness by sending to Never Never any outfit which he sensed no longer delighted her. He would have done so daily had she not cautioned him that too many new clothes would make them conspicuous around the carnival. Thanks, dear, she called out, 
Let's climb in. He had either undressed or caused his own clothes to go away. Probably the former, she decided. Mike found buying clothes for himself without interest. He still could see no possible reason for clothes, other than for simple protection against the elements, a weakness he did not share. They got into the tub, facing each other. She scooped up a handful of water, touched it to her lips, offered it to him. It was not necessary to speak, nor was the ritual necessary. It simply pleased Jill to remind them both of something for which no reminder could ever be necessary through all eternity. When he raised his head, she said, The thing I was thinking of while you were driving was how funny that horrid sheriff looked in his skin. Did he look funny? Oh, very funny indeed. It was all I could do to keep from laughing out loud, but I did not want us noticed. Explain to me why he was funny. I do not see the joke. Ah, uh, dear, I don't think I can explain it. It was not a joke, not like puns and things like that which can be explained. I did not grok that he was funny. Mike said seriously. In both those men, the judge and the lawman, I grokked wrongness. Had I not known that it would displease you, I would have sent them both away. Dear Mike, she touched his cheek. Good Mike, believe me, dearest, it was better far to do only what you did do. Neither one of them will ever live it down, and I'll bet that there won't be another attempt to arrest anyone for indecent exposure in that township for another fifty years. Let's talk about something else. I have been wanting to say that I am sorry, truly sorry, that your act didn't go over. I did my best in writing the patter for it, dear, but I guess I'm no showman either. It was my lack, Jill. Tim speaks rightly. I don't grok the chumps. Nevertheless, it has been good to be with Baxter's combined shows. I have grokked closer to the chumps each day. Only we must not call them chumps any longer, nor marks, now that we are no longer with it. Just people, not chumps. I grok that they are chumps. Yes, dear, but it isn't polite to say so. I will remember. Have you decided where we are going now? No, no. When the time comes, I will know. Yes, dear. Jill reflected that Mike always did know. From his first change from docility to dominance, he had grown steadily in strength and sureness in all ways. The boy, he had seemed like a boy then, who had found it tiring to hold an ashtray in the air, could now not only hold her in the air, and it did feel like floating on clouds. That was why she had written it into the patter that way, while doing several other things and continuing to talk, but also could exert any other strength he needed. She recalled one very rainy lot where one of the trucks had bogged down. Twenty men were crowded around it trying to get it free. Mike had added his shoulder, and the truck moved. She had seen how it had happened. The sunken hind wheel had simply lifted itself out of the mud. But Mike, much more sophisticated now, had not allowed anyone to guess. She recalled, too, when he had at last grokked that the injunction about wrongness being necessary before he could make things go away applied only to living, grokking things. Her dress did not have to have wrongness for him to toss it away. The injunction was merely a precaution in the training of nestlings. An adult was free to do as he grokked. She wondered what his next major change would be, but she did not worry about it. Mike was good and wise. All she could teach him were little details of how to live among humans, while learning much more from him in perfect happiness, greater happiness than she had known since her father died. Mike? Wouldn't it be nice to have Dorcas and Anne and Miriam all here in the tub, too? And Father Jubal and the boys and, oh, our whole family. It would take a bigger tub. Who minds a little crowding? 
but Jubal's pool would do nicely. When are we making another visit home, Mike? Jubal asks me every time I talk to him. I grok it will be soon. Martian soon? Or Earth soon? Never mind, darling. I know it will be when the waiting is filled. But that reminds me that Aunt Patty will be here soon, and I do mean Earth soon. Wash me off? She stood up. He stayed where he was. The soap lifted out of the soap dish, traveled all over her, replaced itself, and the soapy lair slathered into bubbles of lather. Oh, that's enough. You tickle. Rinse? I'll just dunk. Quickly she squatted down, slushed suds off her, stood up. Just in time, too. Someone was knocking at the outer door. Dearie, are you decent? Coming, Pat, Jill shouted, and added as she stepped out of the tub, Dry me, please. At once she was dry, leaving not even wet footprints on the bath mat. Dear, you'll remember to put on some clothes before you come out. Patty's a lady, not like me. I will remember. Twenty-seven. Jill stopped to grab a negligee from a well-stocked wardrobe hurried out into the living room and let in Mrs. Pywanski. Come in, dear. We were grabbing baths in a hurry. He'll be right out. I'll get you a drink. Then you can have your second drink in the tub, if you like. Loads of hot water. I had a shower after I put Honey Bun to bed, but... Yes, I'd love a tub bath. But, Jill, baby, I didn't come here to borrow your bathtub. I came because I'm just heartsick that you kids are leaving the show. We won't lose track of you. Jill was busy with glasses. The hotel was so old that not even the bridal suite had its own ice dispenser. But the night bellman, indoctrinated and subsidized, had left a carton of ice cubes. Tim was right, and you know he was. Mike and I have got to slick up our act a lot before we can hold up our end. Your act is okay. Needs a few laughs in it, maybe, but... Hi, Smitty. As Mike came in, she offered him a gloved hand. Mrs. Pywanski always wore gloves away from the lot, and a high-necked dress and stockings. Dressed so, she looked like a middle-aged, most respectable widow, who had kept her figure trim in spite of her years. Looked so because she was precisely that. I was just telling Jill, she went on, that you've got a good act, you too. Mike smiled gently. Now, Pat, you don't have to kid us. It stinks. We know it. No, it doesn't, dearie. Oh, maybe it needs a little something to give it some zing. A few jokes, or, well, you could even cut down on Jill's costume a little. You've got an awful cute figure, hon. Jill shook her head. That wouldn't do it. Well, I saw a magician once that used to bring his assistant out dressed for the gay 90s. The 1890s, that is. Not even her legs showing. Then he would disappear one garment after another. The Marks loved it. But don't misunderstand me, dear. Nothing unrefined. She finished... Oh, in almost as much as you wear now. Patty, Jill said frankly, I'd do our act stark naked if the clowns wouldn't close the show. As she said it, she realized that she meant it and wondered how graduate nurse boardman, floor supervisor, had reached the point where she could mean it. Mike, of course. And she was quite happy about it. Mrs. Pywanski shook her head. You couldn't, honey. The marks would riot. Just a touch more ginger ale, dear. But if you've got a good figure, why not use it? How far do you think I would get as a tattooed lady if I didn't peel off all they'll let me? Speaking of that, Mike said, 
You don't look comfortable in all those clothes, Pat. I think the air cooling in this dump has gone sour again. It must be at least eighty. He himself was dressed in a light robe, his concession to the easygoing conventions of carny good manners. Extreme heat, he had learned, affected him slightly, enough so that he sometimes had to adjust consciously his metabolism. Extreme cold affected him not at all. But he knew that their friend was used to the real comfort of almost nothing, and affected the clothes she now wore to cover her tattoos when out among the marks. Jill had explained it to him. Why don't you get comfortable? Ain't nobody here but just us chickens. The latter, he knew, was a joke, an appropriate one for emphasizing that friends were in private. Jubal had tried to explain it to him, but failed. But Mike had carefully noted when and how the idiom could be used. Sure, Patty, Jill agreed. If you're raw under that dress, I can get you something light and comfortable. Or we'll just make Mike close his eyes. Ah, uh, well, I did slip back into one of my costumes. Then don't be stiff with friends. I'll get your zippers. Let me get these stockings and shoes. She went on talking while trying to think how she could get the conversation around to religion, where she wanted it. Bless them, these kids were ready to be seekers. She was certain. And she had counted on the whole season to bring them around to the light, not just one hurried visit before they left. The point about show business, Smitty, is that first you have to know what the marks want, and you have to know what it is you're giving them and how to make them like it. Now, if you were a real magician, oh, I don't mean that you aren't skillful, dearie, because you are. She tucked her carefully rolled hose in her shoes, loosened her garter belt, and got out of it modestly. Let Jill get her dress zippers. I mean, if your magic was real, like you had made a pact with the devil, that'd be one thing. But the marks know that it's clever sleight of hand, so you give 'em a light-hearted show to match. But did you ever see a fire eater with a pretty assistant? Heavens, a pretty girl would just clutter his act. The marks are standing around, hoping he'll set fire to himself or blow up. She snaked the dress over her head. Jill took it and kissed her. You look more natural, Aunt Patty. Sit back and enjoy your drink. Just a second, dearie. Mrs. Pywanski prayed mightily for guidance, wished that she were a preacher, or had even the gift of gab of a talker. Well, her pictures would just have to speak for themselves, and they would. That was why George had put them there. Now this is what I've got to show the marks. This and my snakes, but this is more important. Have either one of you ever looked, really looked, at my pictures? No, Jill admitted. I guess not. We didn't want to stare at you like a couple of marks. Then stare at me now, dears, because that's why George, bless his sweet soul, safe in heaven, put them on me, to be stared at, and studied. Now, right up here under my chin is the birth scene of our prophet, the holy archangel Foster, just an innocent babe, and maybe not knowing what heaven had in store for him, but the angels knew. See him there around him. The next scene is his first miracle, when a young sinner in the country school he attended shot down a poor little birdie, and he picked it up and stroked it, and it flew away unharmed. See the schoolhouse behind? Now it kind of jumps a little, and I'll have to turn my back. But all of them are dated for each holy event in his life. She explained how George had not had a bare canvas to work with when first the great opus was started, since they had both been sinners and young Patricia, already rather much tattooed. How, with great effort and inspired genius, George had been able to turn the attack on Pearl Harbor into Armageddon, and skyline of New York into the Holy City.
But, she admitted candidly, even though every single one of them is a sacred picture now, it did kind of force him to skip around to find enough bare skin to record in living flesh a witness to each milestone in the earthly life of our prophet. Here you see him preaching on the steps of the ungodly theological seminary that turned him down. That was the first time he was arrested, the beginning of the persecution. And on around, right on my spine, you see him smashing idolatrous images. And next you see him in jail, with the holy light streaming down on it. Then the faithful few bust into the jail. The Reverend Foster had realized early that, when it came to upholding religious freedom, brass knucks, clubs, and a willingness to tangle with cops, was worth far more than passive resistance. His had been a church militant from scratch, but he had been a tactician, too. Pitched battles were fought only where the heavy artillery was on the side of the Lord. And they rescue him and tar and feather the idolatrous judge who put him there. Around in front here, ah, uh, you can't see it very well. My bra covers most of it. A shame. Michael, what does she want? Thou knowest. Tell her. Aunt Patty, Jill said gently, you want us to look at all your pictures, don't you? Well, it's just as Tim says in the ballet. George used up all the skin I have in making the story complete. If George went to all that work, I'm sure he meant for them to be seen. Take off your costume. I told you that I wouldn't mind working our own act stark naked if they'd let me. And ours is just entertainment. Yours has a purpose. A holy purpose. Well, all right. If you really want me to. She sang a silent hallelujah and decided that Foster himself was sustaining her. With blessed luck and George's pictures, she would yet have these dear kids seeking the light. I'll unhook you. Jill. No, Michael. Wait. To her utter surprise and some fear, Mrs. Piwonski found that her spangled briefies and bra were gone. But Jill was surprised to find that her almost new negligee followed the little costume into wherever and nowhere. Jill was only mildly surprised when Mike's robe disappeared, too. She chalked it up correctly but not completely to his cat-like good manners. Mrs. Piwonski clutched at her mouth and gasped. Jill at once put her arms around her. There, there, dear, it's all right. Nobody's hurt. She turned her head and said, Mike, you did it. You'll simply have to tell her. Yes, Jill. Pat? Yes, Smitty? You said a while ago that I wasn't a real magician, that my tricks were just sleight of hand. You were going to take off your costume anyhow, so I took it off for you. But how? And where is it? Same place Jill's wrapper is. And my robe. Gone. But don't worry about it, Patty, put in Jill. We'll replace it. Two more, and twice as pretty. Mike, you shouldn't have done it. I'm sorry, Jill. I grokked it was all right. Well, I suppose it is. Jill decided that Aunt Patty wasn't too upset, and certainly she would never tell. She was Carney. Mrs. Piwonski was not worried by the loss of two scraps of costume, nor by her own nudity, nor by the nakedness of the other two. But she was greatly troubled by a theological problem that she felt was out of her depth. Smitty, that was real magic? I guess you would call it that, he agreed, using the words most exactly. I'd rather call it a miracle, she said bluntly. You can call it that, too, if you want to. But it wasn't sleight of hand. I know that. You weren't even near me. She, who daily handled live cobras, 
and who had more than once handled obnoxious drunks with her bare hands to their sorrow, was not afraid. Patricia Piwanski was not afraid of the devil himself. She was sustained by her faith that she was saved and therefore invulnerable to the devil. But she was uneasy for the safety of her friends. Smitty, look me in the eye. Have you made a pact with the devil? No, Pat, I have not. She continued to look into his eyes, then said, You aren't lying? He doesn't know how to lie, Aunt Patty. So it's a miracle. Smitty, you are a holy man. I don't know, Pat. Archangel Foster didn't know that he was a holy man until he reached his teens, even though he performed many miracles before that time. But you are a holy man. I can feel it, she thought. I think I felt it when I first met you. I don't know, Pat. I think he may be, admitted Jill, but he really doesn't know himself. Michael, I think we've told her too much not to tell her more. Michael, Patty repeated suddenly, the archangel Michael, send down to us in human form. And Patty, please, if he is, he doesn't know it. He wouldn't necessarily know it. God performs his wonders in his own way. Aunt Patty, will you please wait and let me talk just for a bit? Some minutes later, Mrs. Piwonski had accepted that Mike was indeed the man from Mars. She had agreed to accept him as a man and to treat him as a man. While stating explicitly that she still held to her own opinion as to his true nature and why he was on earth, explaining somewhat fuzzily, it seemed to Jill, that Foster had been really and truly a man while he was on earth, but had been also and always had been an archangel, even though he had not known it himself. If Jill and Michael insisted that they were not saved, she would treat them as they asked to be treated. God moves in mysterious ways. I think you could properly call us seekers, Mike told her. Then that's enough, my dears. I'm sure you're saved. But Foster himself was a seeker in his early years. I'll help. She had participated in another minor miracle. They had been seated in a circle on the rug. Jill lay back flat and suggested it to Mike in her mind. With no patter of any sort, with no sheet, nor anything to conceal a non-existent steel rod, Mike lifted her. Patricia watched it with serene happiness, convinced that she was vouchsafed sight of a miracle. Pat, Mike then said, lie flat. She did so without argument, as readily as if he had been Foster. Jill turned her head. Hadn't you better put me down first, Mike? No, I can do it. Mrs. Piwanski felt herself gently lifted. She was not frightened by it. She simply felt overpowering religious ecstasy, like heat lightning in her loins, making tears come to her eyes, the power of which she had not felt since, as a young woman, Holy Foster himself had touched her. When Mike moved them closer together and Jill put her arms around her, her tears increased, but her cries were the gentle sobs of happiness. Presently, he lowered them gently to the floor and found, as he expected, that he was not tired. He could not recall when last he had been tired. Jill said to him, Mike, we need a glass of water. Four question marks. Yes, her mind answered. And? Of elegant necessity. Why do you think she came here? I knew. I was not sure that you knew or would approve. My brother. Myself. My brother. Mike did not get up to fetch water. He sent a glass from the tray of drinks into the bathroom, had the tap fill it, returned it to Jill's hands. 
Mrs. Piwonski watched this with almost absent-minded interest. She was beyond being astonished. Jill held the glass, said to her, Aunt Patty, this is like being baptized, and like getting married. It's a Martian thing. It means that you trust us and we trust you, and we can tell you anything, and you can tell us anything, and that we are always partners now and forever. It's very serious. And once done, it can never be broken. If you broke it, we would have to die at once, saved or not. If we broke it, but we won't. But you don't have to share water with us if you don't want to. We'll still be friends. Now, if this in any way interferes with your faith, don't do it. We don't belong to your church, even though you guessed that we did. We don't. We may never belong. Seekers is the most you can call us now. Mike? We grok, he agreed. Pat, Jill speaks rightly. I wish we could say it to you in Martian. It would be clearer. But this is everything that getting married is, and a great deal more. We are free to offer water to you. But if there is any reason at all, in your religion or in your heart, not to accept, don't drink it. Patricia Piwonski took a deep breath. She had made such a decision once before, with her husband watching and had not funked it. And who was she to refuse a holy man and his blessed bride? I want it, she said firmly. Jill took a sip. We grow ever closer. She passed the glass to Mike. He looked at Jill, then at Patricia. I thank you for water, my brother. He took a sip. Pat, I give you the water of life. May you always drink deep. He passed the glass to her. Patricia took it. Thank you. Thank you, oh, my dears. The water of life. Oh, I love you both. She drank thirstily. Jill took the glass from her, finished it. Now we grow closer, my brothers. Jill? Now! Michael lifted his new water brother wafted her in and placed her gently on the bed. Valentine Michael Smith had grokked, when first he had known it fully, that physical human love, very human and very physical, was not simply a necessary quickening of eggs, nor was it mere ritual through which one grew closer. The act itself was a growing closer, a very great goodness, and, so far as he knew, unknown even to the old ones of his former people. He was still grokking it, trying at every opportunity to grok its fullness. But he had long since broken through any fear that heresy lay in his suspicion that even the old ones did not know this ecstasy. He grokked already that these, his new people, held spiritual depths unique. Happily, he tried to sound them, with no inhibitions from his childhood, to cause him guilt or reluctance of any sort. His human teachers had been unusually well qualified to instruct his innocence without bruising it. The result was as unique as he himself. Jill was very pleased, but not really surprised to find that Aunt Patty accepted as inevitable and necessary and with forthright fullness the fact that sharing water in a very ancient Martian ceremony with Mike led at once to sharing Mike himself in a human right ancient itself. Jill was somewhat surprised, although still pleased, at Pat's continued calm acceptance, when it certainly had been demonstrated to their new water brother that Mike was capable of more miracles than he had disclosed up to then. However, Jill did not then know that Patricia Piwonski had met a holy man before. Patricia expected more of holy men. Jill herself was simply serenely happy that a cusp had been reached and passed with right action, and was ecstatically happy herself to grow closer as the cusp was determined, all of which she thought in Martian and quite differently.
In time, they rested, and Jill had Mike treat Patty to a bath given by telekinesis, and herself sat on the edge of the tub and squealed and giggled when the older woman did. It was just play, very human and not at all Martian. Mike had done it for Jill on the initial occasion almost lazily rather than raise himself up out of the water. An accident, more or less. Now it had become a custom, one that Jill knew Patty would like. It tickled Jill to see Patty's face when she found herself being scrubbed all over by gentle, invisible hands, and then, presently, dried in a whisk with neither towel nor blast of air. Patricia blinked. After that, I need a drink, a big one. Certainly, darling. And I still want to show you kids my pictures, all of them. Patricia followed Jill out into the living room, Mike in train, and stood in the middle of the rug. But first look at me. Look at me, not at my pictures. What do you see? With mild regret, Mike stripped her tattoos off in his mind and looked at his new brother without her decorations. He liked her tattoos very much. They were peculiarly her own. They set her apart and made her a self. They seemed to him to give her a slightly Martian flavor, in that she did not have the bland sameness of most humans. He had already memorized them all and had thought pleasantly of having himself tattooed all over once he grokked what should be pictured. The life of his father, Water Brother Jubal, he would have to ponder it. He would discuss it with Jill, and Jill might wish to be tattooed, too. What designs would make Jill more beautifully Jill? In the way in which perfume multiplied Jill's odor without changing it? What he saw when he looked at Pat without her tattoos pleased him, but not as much. She looked as a woman necessarily must look to be woman. Mike still did not grok Duke's collection of pictures. The pictures were interesting, and had taught Mike that there was more variety in the sizes, shapes, proportions, and colors of women than he had known up to then, and that there was some variety in the acrobatics involving physical love. But having learned these simple facts, he seemed to grok that there was nothing more to be learned from Duke's prized pictures. Mike's early training had made of him a very exact observer, by eye and other senses, but that same training had left him unresponsive to the subtle pleasures of voyeurism. It was not that he did not find women, including most emphatically Patricia Piwonski, sexually stimulating, but it lay not in seeing them. Of his senses, smell and touch counted much higher, in which he was quasi-human, quasi-Martian. The parallel Martian reflex, as unsubtle as a sneeze, was triggered by those two, but could activate only in season. What must be termed sex in a Martian is as romantic as intravenous feeding. But having been invited to see her without her pictures, Mike did notice more sharply one thing about Patricia that he already knew. She had her own face, marked in beauty by her life. She had, he saw with gentle wonder her own face even more than Jill had, and it made him feel toward Pat even more of an emotion he did not as yet call love, but for which he used a Martian concept more discriminating. She had her own odor, too, and her own voice, as all humans did. Her voice was husky, and he liked to hear it even when he did not grok her meaning. Her odor was mixed, he knew, with an unscrubbable trace of bitter muskiness from daily contact with snakes. It did not put him off. Pat's snakes were part of Pat, as were her tattoos. Mike liked Pat's snakes and could handle the poisonous ones with perfect safety, and not alone by stretching time to anticipate and avoid their strikes. They grokked with him. He savored their innocent, merciless thoughts— they reminded him of home. Other than Pat, Mike was the only person who could handle Honeybun with pleasure to the boa constrictor. Her torpor was usually such that others could, if necessary, handle her, 
But Mike she accepted as a substitute for Pat. Mike let the pictures reappear. Jill looked at her and wondered why Aunt Patty had ever let herself be tattooed in the first place. She would really look rather nice if she weren't a living comic strip. But she loved Aunt Patty for what she was, not the way she looked. And, of course, it did give her a steady living. At least until she got so old and haggard that the marks wouldn't pay to look at her, even if all those pictures had been signed by Rembrandt. She hoped that Patty was tucking away plenty in the grouch bag. Then she remembered that Aunt Patty was now one of Mike's water brothers, and her own, of course, and Mike's endless fortune gave Patty certain old age insurance. Jill felt warmed by it. Well, repeated Mrs. Pywanski, what do you see? How old am I, Michael? I don't know, he said simply. Guess. I can't guess, Pat. Oh, go ahead. You won't hurt my feelings. Patty, Jill put in, he really does mean that he can't guess. He hasn't had much chance to learn to judge ages. You know how short a time he's been on Earth. And besides that, Mike thinks of things in Martian years and Martian arithmetic. If it's time or figures... I keep track of it for him. Well, you guess, hon. Be truthful. Jill looked Patty over again, noting her trim figure, but also noting her hands and throat and the corners of her eyes, then discounted her guess by five years despite the Martian honesty she owed a water brother. Hmm, thirtyish. Give or take a year. Mrs. Pywanski laughed triumphantly. That's just one bonus from the true faith, my dears. Jill, hun, I'm way into my forties. Just how far in, we won't say. I've quit counting. You certainly don't look it. I know I don't. That's what happiness does for you, dearie. After my first kid, I let my figure go to pot. I got quite a can on me. They invented the word broad just to fit me. My belly always looked like four months gone or worse. My busts hung down, and I've never had them lifted. You don't have to believe me. Sure, I know a good plastic surgeon doesn't leave a scar, but on me it would show, dear. It would chop chunks out of two of my pictures. Then I seen the light. I got converted. Nope, not exercise, not diet. I still eat like a pig, and you know it. Happiness, dear, perfect happiness in the Lord, through the help of blessed Foster. It's amazing, said Jill, and meant it. She knew women who had kept their looks quite as well, as she firmly intended to keep hers, but in every case only through great effort. She knew that Aunt Patty was telling the truth about diet and exercise, at least during the time she had known her. And as a surgical nurse, Jill knew exactly what was excised and where in a breast-lifting job. Those tattoos had certainly never known a knife. But Mike was not amazed. He assumed conclusively that Pat had learned how to think her body as she wished it, whether she attributed it to Foster or not. He was still trying to teach this control to Jill, but knew that she would have to perfect her knowledge of Martian before it could be perfect. No hurry. Waiting would accomplish it. Pat went on talking. I wanted you to see what the faith has done for me, but that's just outside. The real change is inside. Happiness. I've got to try to tell you about it. The good Lord knows that I'm not ordained and I'm not gifted with tongues, but I've got to try. And then I'll answer your questions if I can. The first thing that you've got to accept is that all the other so-called churches are traps of the devil. Our dear Jesus preached the true faith, so Foster said, and I truly believe. But in the dark ages his words were deliberately twisted and added to and changed until Jesus wouldn't recognize them. 
and that is why Foster was sent down to earth, to proclaim a new revelation and straighten it out and make it clear again. Patricia Pywonski pointed her finger and suddenly looked very impressive, a priestess clothed in holy dignity and mystic symbols. God wants us to be happy. He filled the world with things to make us happy if only we see the light. Would God let grape juice turn into wine if he didn't want us to drink and be joyful? He could just as easily let it stay grape juice or turn it straight into vinegar that nobody could get a happy giggle out of. Ain't that true? Of course, he don't mean you should get roaring drunk and beat your wife and neglect your kids. But he gave us good things to use, not to abuse, and not to ignore. But if you feel like a drink or six, among friends who have seen the light too, and it makes you want to jump up and dance and give thanks to the Lord on high for his goodness, why not? God made alcohol, and he made feet. And he made them so you could put them together and be happy. She paused and said, Fill her up again, honey. Preaching is thirsty work and not too strong on the ginger ale this time. That's good rye. And that ain't all. If God didn't want women to be looked at, he would have made them ugly. That's reasonable, isn't it? God isn't a cheat. He set up the game himself. He wouldn't rig it so that the marks can't win, like a flat joint wheel in a town with a fix on. He wouldn't send anybody to hell for losing in a crooked game. All right. God wants us to be happy, and he told us how. Love one another. Love a snake. If the poor thing needs love, love thy neighbor if he's seen the light and has love in his heart. And the back of your hand only to sinners and Satan's corruptors who want to lead you away from the appointed path and down into the pit. And by love, he didn't mean namby-pamby old maid aunt love that's scared to look up from a hymn book for fear of seeing a temptation of the flesh. If God hated flesh, why did he make so much of it? God is no sissy. He made the Grand Canyon and comets coursing through the sky and cyclones and stallions and earthquakes. Can a God who can do all that turn around and practically wet his pants just because some little Sheila leans over a mite and a man catches sight of a tit? You know better, hon, and so do I. When God told us to love, he wasn't holding out a card on us. He meant it. Love little babies that always need changing and love strong, smelly men so that there will be more little babies to love. And in between, go on loving because it's so good to love. Of course, that don't mean to peddle it any more than a bottle of rye whiskey means I gotta get fighting drunk and clobber a cop. You can't sell love, and you can't buy happiness. No price tags on either one. And if you think there is, the way to hell lies open to you. But if you give with an open heart and receive what God has an unlimited supply of, the devil can't touch you. Money? She looked at Jill. Hun, would you do that water-sharing thing with somebody, say, for a million dollars? Make it ten million, tax-free. Of course not. Michael, do you grok this? Almost in fullness, Jill. Waiting is. You see, dearie, I knew what it meant. I knew love was in that water. Your seekers, very near the light. But since you too, from the love that is in you, did share water and grow closer, as Michael says... I can tell you things I couldn't ordinarily tell a seeker. The Reverend Foster, self-ordained, or directly ordained by God, depending on authority cited, had an intuitive instinct for the pulse of his culture and his times at least as strong as that of a skilled carney sizing up a mark. The country and culture commonly known as America had had a badly split personality all through its history. 
Its overt laws were almost always puritanical for a people whose covert behavior tended to be Rabelaisian. Its major religions were all Apollonian in varying degree. Its religious revivals were often hysterical in fashion almost Dionysian. In the twentieth century, Terran Christian era, nowhere on earth was sex so vigorously suppressed as in America, and nowhere else was there such a deep interest in it. The Reverend Foster had in common with almost every great religious leader of that planet two traits. He had an extremely magnetic personality. Hypnotist was a word widely used by his detractors, along with others less mild. And sexually, he did not fall anywhere near the human norm. Great religious leaders on earth were always either celibate or the antithesis. Great leaders, the innovators, not necessarily the major administrators and consolidators. Foster was not celibate. Nor were any of his wives and high priestesses. The clincher for complete conversion and rebirth under the new revelation usually included a ritual which Valentine Michael Smith at a later time was to grok as especially suited for growing closer. This, of course, was nothing new. In Terran history, sects, cults, and major religions too numerous to list had used essentially the same technique but not on a major scale in America before Foster's times. Foster was run out of town more than once before he perfected a method and organization that permitted him to expand his Capric cult. In organization, he borrowed as liberally from Freemasonry, from Catholicism, from the Communist Party, and from Madison Avenue, as he had borrowed from any and all earlier scriptures in composing his new revelation, and he sugar-coated it all as a return to primitive Christianity to suit his customers. He set up an outer church which anybody could attend, and a person could remain a seeker with many benefits of the church for years. Then there was a middle church, which to all outward appearance was the church of the new revelation. The happy saved, who paid their tithes, enjoyed all economic benefits of the church's ever-widening business tie-ins, and whooped it up in the endless carnival and revival atmosphere of happiness, happiness, happiness. Their sins were forgiven, and henceforth very little was sinful as long as they supported their church, dealt honestly with their fellow Fosterites, condemned sinners, and stayed happy. The new revelation does not specifically encourage adultery. It simply gets rather mystical in discussing sexual conduct. The saved of the middle church supplied the ranks of the shock troops when direct action was needed. Foster borrowed a trick from the early 20th century wobblies. If a community tried to suppress a budding Fosterite movement, Fosterites from elsewhere converged on that town until there were neither jails nor cops enough to cope with them and the cops usually had had their ribs kicked in and the jails were smashed. If some prosecutor were brave enough to push an indictment thereafter, it was almost impossible to make it stick. Foster, after learning his lesson under fire, saw to it that such prosecutions were indeed persecution under the letter of the law. Not one conviction of a Fosterite qua Fosterite ever was upheld by the National Supreme Court nor later by the high court. But, in addition to the overt church, there was the inner church, never named as such, a hard core of the utterly dedicated who made up the priesthood, all the church lay leaders, all keepers of keys and records and makers of policy. They were the reborn, beyond sin, certain of their place in heaven, and sole participants of the inner mysteries and the only candidates for direct admission to heaven. Foster selected these with great care, doing so personally until the operation got too big. He looked for men as much like himself as possible, and for women like his priestess wives, dynamic, utterly convinced, as he was himself convinced, stubborn, 
and free, or able to be freed once their guilt and insecurity was purged, of jealousy in its simplest, most human meaning. And all of them potential satyrs and nymphs, as the secret inner church was that utterly Dionysian cult that America had never had, and for which there was an enormous potential market. But he was most cautious. If candidates were married, it had to be both spouses. An unmarried candidate had to be sexually attractive as well as sexually aggressive, and he impressed on his priests that the males must always equal or exceed in number the females. Nowhere is it admitted that Foster had studied the histories of earlier somewhat parallel cults in America, but he either knew or sensed that most of such had foundered because the possessive concupiscence of their priests led to male jealousy and violence. Foster never made this error. Not once did he keep a woman entirely to himself, not even the women he married legally. Nor did he try too eagerly to expand his core group. The middle church, the one known to the public, offered plenty to slake the milder needs of the great masses of guilt-ridden and unhappy. If a local revival produced even two couples who were capable of heavenly marriage, Foster was content. If it produced none, he let the other seeds grow and sent in a salted priest and priestess to nurture them. But so far as possible, he always tested candidate couples himself in company with some devoted priestess. Since such a couple was already saved, insofar as the middle church was concerned, he ran little risk. None, really, with the woman candidate, and he always sized up the man himself before letting his priestess go ahead. At the time she was saved, Patricia Piwonski was still young, married, and very happy, very happy. She had her first child. She looked up to and admired her much older husband. George Piwonski was a generous, very affectionate man. He did have one weakness— which often left him too drunk to show his affection after a long day. But his tattooing needle was still steady, and his eye sharp. Patty counted herself a faithful wife and, on the whole, a lucky one. True, George occasionally got affectionate with a female client. Quite affectionate, if it was early in the day. And, of course, some tattooing required privacy, especially with ladies. Patty was tolerant. Besides... She sometimes herself made a date with a male client, especially after George got to hitting the bottle more and more. Nevertheless, there was a lack in her life, one which was not filled even when an especially grateful client made her the odd gift of a bull snake. Shipping out on a freighter, he said, and couldn't keep it any longer. She had always liked pets and had none of the vulgar phobia about snakes. She made a home for it in their show window facing the street, and George made a beautiful four-color picture to back it up. Don't tread on me. His new design turned out to be very popular. Presently she had more snakes, and they were quite a comfort to her. But she was the daughter of an Ulster Protestant and a girl from Cork. The armed truce between her parents had left her with no religion. She was already a seeker when Foster preached in San Pedro. She had managed to get George to go a few Sundays, but he had not yet seen the light. Foster brought them the light. They made their confessions the same day. When Foster returned six months later for a quick check on how his branch was doing, the Piwanskis were so dedicated that he gave them personal attention. I never had a minute's trouble with George from the day he saw the holy light. She told Mike and Jill. Of course he still drank, but he drank in church and never too much. When our holy leader returned, George had already started his great project. Naturally, we wanted to show it to Foster if he could find time. Mrs. Piwonski hesitated. Kids, I really ought not to be telling you any of this. Then don't, Jill said emphatically. Patty, darling... Neither of us want you ever to do or say anything you don't feel easy about. Sharing water has to be easy and natural, 
and waiting until it comes easy for you is easy for us. Ah,、uh, but I do want to share it. Look, darlings, I trust you both, utterly. But I just want you to remember that this is church things I'm telling you, so you mustn't ever tell anyone. Just as I wouldn't tell anything about you. Mike nodded. Here on Earth, we sometimes call it water brother business. On Mars, there's no problem, but here I grok that there sometimes is. Water brother business, you don't repeat. I, I grok. That's a funny word, but I'm learning it. All right, darlings, this is water brother business. Did you know that all Fosterites are tattooed? Real church members, I mean, the ones who are eternally saved forever and ever and a day, like me. Oh, I don't mean tattooed all over the way I am, but look, see that, right over my heart. See, that's Foster's holy kiss. George worked it into the design so that it looks like part of the picture it's in, so that nobody could guess unless I told him. But it's his kiss, and Foster put it there himself. She looked ecstatically proud. They both examined it. It is a kiss mark, Jill said wonderingly, just like somebody had kissed you there wearing lipstick. But until you showed us, I thought it was part of that sunset. Yes, indeedy, that's why George did it. Because you don't go showing Foster's kiss to anyone who doesn't wear Foster's kiss, and I never have up to now. But, she insisted, I'm sure you're going to wear one, both of you, some day. And when you do, I want to be the one to tattoo 'em on. Jill said, I don't quite understand, Patty. I can see that it's wonderful for you to have been kissed by Foster, but how can he ever kiss us? After all, he's. Up in heaven. Yes, dearie, he is. But let me explain. Any ordained priest or priestess can give you Foster's kiss. It means God's in your heart. God is part of you forever. Michael was suddenly intent. Thou art God. Ha,、huh, Michael. Well, that is a strange way to say it. I've never heard a priest put it quite that way, but that does sort of express it. God is in you and of you and with you, and the devil can't ever get at you. Yes, agreed Mike. You grok God. He thought happily that this was nearer to putting the concept across than he had ever managed before, except that Jill was learning it in Martian, which was inevitable. That's the idea, Michael. God. Grocks you, and you are married in holy love and eternal happiness to His Church. The priest, or maybe priestess, it can be either, kisses you, and then the kiss mark is tattooed on to show that it's forever. Of course, it doesn't have to be this big. Mine is just exactly the size and shape of Foster's blessed lips, and the kiss can be placed anywhere to shield from sinful eyes. Lots of men have a patch of skull shaved and then wear a hat or a bandage until the hair grows out, or any spot where it's blessed. Certain it won't be seen unless you want it to be. You mustn't sit or stand on it, but anywhere else is okay. Then you show it when you go into a closed happiness gathering of the eternally saved. I've heard of happiness meetings, Jill commented. But I've never known quite what they are. Well, Mrs. Pywanski said judicially, there are happiness meetings and happiness meetings. The ones for ordinary members who are saved but might backslide are an awful lot of fun. Grand parties with only the amount of praying that comes natural and happily, and plenty of whoop it up that makes a good party. Maybe even a little real lovin'. But that's frowned on there, and you'd better be mighty careful who and how, because you mustn't be a seed of dissension among the brethren. The church is very strict about keeping things in their proper place. But a happiness meeting for the eternally saved—well, you don't have 
to be careful, because there won't be anybody there who can sin. All past and done with, if you want to drink and pass out. Okay, it's God's will, or you wouldn't want to. You want to kneel down and pray, or lift up your voice in song, or tear off your clothes and dance. It's God's will. Although, she added, you might not have any clothes on at all, because there can't possibly be anybody there who would see anything wrong in it. It sounds like quite a party, said Jill. Oh, it is, it is, always, and you are filled with heavenly bliss the whole time. And if you wake up in the morning on a couch with one of the eternally saved brethren, you know he's there because God willed it to make you all blessedly happy. And you are. They've all got Foster's kiss on them. They're yours. She frowned slightly. It feels a little like sharing water. You understand me? I grok, agreed Mike. Mike? Four question marks. Wait, Jill. Wait for fullness. But don't think, Patricia said earnestly, that a person can get into an inner temple happiness meeting just with a little tattoo mark. After all, it's too easy to fake. A visiting brother or sister? Well, take me. As soon as I know where the carney is going, I write to the local churches and send them my fingerprints so they can check them against the master file of the eternally saved at Archangel Foster Tabernacle, unless they already know me. I give them my address, care of billboard. Then when I go to church, and I always go to church Sundays, and I would never miss a happiness meeting even if it means Tim has to slough the blow-off some nights. I go first time and get positively identified. Most places they're mighty glad to see me. I'm an added attraction, with my unique and unsurpassed sacred pictures. I often spend most of the evening just letting people examine me. And every minute of it, bliss. Sometimes the priest wants me to bring honey bun, and I do Eve and the serpent. That takes body makeup, of course, or skin-colored tights, if there isn't time. Some local brother plays Adam, and we get scourged out of the Garden of Eden, and the local priest explains the real meaning, not all the twisted lies you hear. And we end by regaining our blessed innocence and happiness, and that's certain to get the party really rolling. Joy, she added. But everybody is always interested in my foster's kiss. Because, since he went back to heaven almost twenty years ago now, and the church has increased and flourished, not too many of us have a foster's kiss that wasn't laid on by proxy. I always have the tabernacle testify to that, too. And I tell them about it. Ah. Uh, Mrs. Pywonski hesitated, then told them about it, in explicit detail, and Jill wondered where her admittedly limited ability to blush had gone. Then she grokked that Mike and Patty were two of a kind, God's innocence, unable to be anything else, no matter what they did. She wished, for Patty's sake, that this preposterous mishmash were really true, that Foster had really been a holy prophet who had saved her for eternal bliss. But Foster... God's wounds, what a travesty! Then suddenly, through her greatly improved recall, Jill was standing back in a room with a wall of glass and looking into Foster's dead eyes. But in her mind, he seemed alive, and she felt a shiver in her loins and wondered what she would have done if Foster himself had offered her his holy kiss. And his holy self? She shut it out of her mind but not before Mike had caught much of it. She felt him smile with knowing innocence. She stood up. Patty Cake, darling, what time do you have to be back at the lot? Oh, dear, I should be back this blessed minute. Why? The show doesn't roll until 9.30. Well, Honey Bun misses me, and she's jealous if I stay out late. Can't you tell her that it's a happiness meeting night? Ah. Uh, 
The older woman gathered Jill in her arms. It is. It certainly is. Good. Then I'm going to get a certain amount of sleep. Jill is bushed, believe me. What time do you have to be up, then? Ah, uh, if I'm back on the lot by eight, I can get Sam to tear down my living top and have time to make sure that my babies are loaded safely. Breakfast? I don't eat breakfast right away. I'll get it on the train. Just coffee when I wake up, usually. We can make that right here in the room. I'll see that you're up. Now, you dears stay up and talk religion as long as you like. I won't let you oversleep, if you sleep. Mike doesn't sleep. Not at all? Never. He sort of curls up and thinks a while, if he's got something to think about. But he doesn't sleep. Mrs. Pywonski nodded solemnly. Another sign. I know it. And, Michael, someday you will know. Your call will come. Maybe, agreed Jill. Mike, I'm falling asleep. Pop me into bed. Please? She was lifted, wafted into the bedroom. The covers rolled back by invisible hands. She was asleep before he covered her. Jill woke up, as she had planned, exactly at seven. Mike had a clock in his head, too, but his was quite erratic so far as earth calendars and times were concerned. It vibrated to another need. She slipped out of bed, put her head into the other room. Lights were out, and the shades were tight. It was quite dark, but they were not asleep. Jill heard Mike say with soft certainty, Thou art God. Thou art God. Patricia whispered back in a voice as heavy as if drugged. Yes, Jill is God. Jill is God. Yes, Michael. And thou art God. Thou art God. Now, Michael, now. Jill went very softly back in and quietly brushed her teeth. Presently she let Mike know in her mind that she was awake and found as she expected that he knew it. When she came back into the living room, shades were up and morning sun was streaming in. Good morning, darlings. She kissed them both. Thou art God, Patty said simply. Yes, Patty, and thou art God. God is in all of us. She looked at Patty in the harsh, bright morning light and noted that her new brother did not look tired. She looked as if she had had a full night of sleep and some extra, and looked younger and sweeter than ever. Well, she knew that effect. If Mike wanted to stay up instead of reading or thinking all night, Jill never found it any trouble, and she suspected that her own sudden sleepiness the night before had been Mike's idea, too, and heard Mike agree in his mind that it was. Now, coffee for both you darlings, and me too, and I just happen to have stashed away a ready pack of orange juice, too. They breakfasted lightly, filled out with happiness. Jill saw Patty looking thoughtful. What is it, dear? Ah, uh, I hate to mention this, but what are you kids going to eat on? It happens that Aunt Patty has a pretty well-stuffed grouch bag, and I thought... Jill laughed. Oh, darling, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to laugh. But the man from Mars is rich. Surely you know that. Or don't you ever read the news? Mrs. Pywonski looked baffled. Well, I guess I knew that way. But you can't trust anything you hear over the news. Jill sighed. Patty, you're an utter darling. And believe me, now that we're water brothers, we wouldn't hesitate an instant to impose on you. Sharing the nest isn't just poetry. But it happens to be the other way around. If you ever need money, it doesn't matter how much. We can't use it up. Just say so. Any amount, any time. Write to me, or better yet, call me, because Mike doesn't have the foggiest idea about money. Why, dear, I've got a couple of hundred thousand dollars in a checking account in my name right this minute. Want some of it? 
Mrs. Pywanski looked startled, something she had not looked since Mike had caused her costume to go away. Bless me. No, I don't need money. Jill shrugged. If you ever do, just holler. We can't possibly spend it all, and the government won't let Mike give it away. At least, not much of it. If you want a yacht, Mike would enjoy giving you a yacht. I certainly would, Pat. I've never seen a yacht. Mrs. Pywanski shook her head. Don't take me up on a tall mountain, dearie. I've never wanted much, and all I want from you two is your love. You have that, Jill told her. I don't grok love, Mike said seriously. But Jill always speaks rightly. If we've got it, it's yours. And to know that you're both saved. But I'm no longer worried about that. Mike has told me about waiting and why waiting is. You understand me, Jill? I grok. I'm no longer impatient about anything. But I do have something for you, too. The tattooed lady got up and crossed to where she had left her purse, took a book out of it. She came back, stood close to them. My dear ones, this is the very copy of the new revelation that Blessed Foster gave me, the night he placed his kiss on me. I want you to have it. Jill's eyes suddenly filled with tears, and she felt herself choking. But Aunt Patty, Patty, our brother, we can't take this one. Not this one. We'll buy one. No, it's... it's water I'm sharing with you for growing closer. Oh, Jill jumped up. We'll take it. But it's ours now. All of us. She kissed her. Presently Mike tapped her on the shoulder. Greedy little brother. My turn. I'll always be greedy that way. The man from Mars kissed his new brother first on her mouth, then paused and gently kissed the spot where Foster had kissed her. Then he pondered, briefly by Earth time, picked a corresponding spot on the other side where he saw that George's design could be matched well enough for his purpose, kissed her there while he thought by stretched out time and in great detail what he wanted to accomplish. It was necessary to grok the capillaries. To the other two, subject and spectator, he simply, gently, and briefly pressed his lips to the garishly decorated skin. But Jill caught a hint of the effort he had exerted and looked. Patty, see! Mrs. Pywanski looked down at herself, marked on her skin, paired stigmata in blood red, were his lips. She started to faint then showed the depth of her own staunch faith. Yes, yes, Michael! Most shortly thereafter, the tattooed lady had disappeared, replaced by a rather mousy housewife in high neck, long sleeves, and gloves. I won't cry, she said soberly, and it's not goodbye. There are no goodbyes in eternity, but I will be waiting she kissed them both, briefly, left without looking back. Twenty-eight. Blasphemy! Foster looked up. Something bites you, Junior? This temporary annex had been run up in a hurry, and things did get in. Swarms of almost invisible imps, usually. Harmless, of course, but a bite from one left an itch on the ego. Ah, uh, you'd have to see it to believe it. Here, I'll run the omniscio back touch. You'd be surprised at what I can believe, Junior. Nevertheless... Digby supervisor shifted a part of his attention. Three temporals, humans, he saw they were, a man and two women, speculating about the eternal. Nothing odd about that. Yes? You heard what she said. 
The Archangel Michael, indeed. What about it? What about it? Oh, for God's sake! Very possibly. Digny was so indignant that his halo quivered. Foster, you must not have taken a good look. She meant that overage juvenile delinquent that sent me to the showers. Scan it again. Foster let the gain increase, noted that the angel in training had spoken rightly, and noticed something else and smiled his angelic smile. How do you know he isn't, Junior? Huh? I haven't seen Mike around the club lately, and I recall that his name has been scratched on the millennial solipsis tournament. That's a sign that he's likely away on detached duty, as Mike is one of the most eager solipsism players in this sector. But the notion's obscene. You'd be surprised how many of the boss's best ideas have been called obscene in some quarters, or rather you should not be surprised in view of your field work, but obscene is a concept you don't need. It has no theological meaning. To the pure, all things are pure. But I'm still witnessing, Junior. You listen. In addition to the fact that our brother Michael seems to be away at this micro-instant, and I don't keep track of him, we're not on the same watch list. That tattooed lady who made that oracular pronouncement is not likely to be mistaken. She's a very holy temporal herself. Who says? I say, I know. Foster smiled again with angelic sweetness. Dear little Patricia, getting a little long in the tooth now, but still earthily desirable and shining with an inner light that made her look like a stained-glass window. He noted without temporal pride that George had finished his great dedication since he had last looked at Patricia. And that picture of his being called up to heaven wasn't bad, not bad at all in the higher sense. He must remember to look up George and compliment him on it, and tell him he had seen Patricia. Hmm, where was George? A creative artist in the universe design section working right under the architect, as he recalled? No matter. The master file would dig him out in a split millennium. What a delicious little butterball Patricia had been, and such holy frenzy. If she had had just a touch more assertiveness and a touch less humility, he could have made her a priestess. But such was Patricia's need to accept God according to her own nature that she could have qualified only among the Lingayats, where she wasn't needed. Foster considered scanning back and seeing her as she had been, decided against it with angelic restraint. There was work to be done. Forget the Omniscio, Junior. I want a word with you. Digby did so and waited. Foster twanged his halo, an annoying habit he had when he was meditating. Junior, you aren't shaping up too angelically. I'm sorry. Sorrow is not for eternity. But the truth is, you've been preoccupied with that young fellow who may or may not be our brother Michael. Now wait. In the first place, it is not for you to judge the instrument used to call you from the pasture. In the second place, it is not he who vexes you. You hardly knew him. What's bothering you is that little brunette secretary you had. She had earned my kiss quite some temporal period before you were called. Hadn't she? I was still testing her. Then no doubt. You have been angelically pleased to note that Supreme Bishop Short, after giving her a most thorough examination himself, oh, very thorough, I told you he would measure up, has passed her, and she now enjoys the wider happiness she deserves. Hmm, a shepherd should take joy in his work, but when he's promoted, he should take joy in that too. Now it just happens I know there is a spot open for a guardian in training in a new sector being opened up. 
A job under your nominal rank, I concede, but good angelic experience. This planet? Well, you can think of it as a planet. You'll see. Is occupied by a race of tripolarity instead of bipolarity, and I have it on high authority that Don Juan himself could not manage to take earthly interest in any of their three polarities. That's not an opinion. He was borrowed as a test. He screamed and prayed to be returned to the solitary hell he has created for himself. Going to send me out to Flatbush, huh? So I won't interfere. Tut, tut. You can't interfere. The one impossibility that permits all else to be possible. I tried to tell you that when you arrived. But don't let it fret you. You are eternally permitted to try. Your orders will include a loop so that you will check back at here now without any loss of temporality. Now fly away and get cracking. I have work to do. Foster turned back to where he had been interrupted. Oh, yes, a poor soul temporally designated as Alice Douglas. To be a goad was a hard assignment at best, and she had met it unflaggingly. But her job was complete, and now she would need rest and rehabilitation from the inescapable battle fatigue. She'd be kicking and screaming and foaming ectoplasm at all orifices. Oh, she would need a thorough exorcism after a job that rough. But they were all rough. They couldn't be anything else. And Alice Douglas was an utterly reliable field operative. She could take any left-hand assignment as long as it was essentially virginal. Burn her at the stake or put her in a nunnery. She always delivered. Not that he cared much for virgins, other than with professional respect for any job well done. Foster sneaked a quick last look at Mrs. Pywonski. There was a fellow worker he could appreciate. Darling little Patricia, what a blessed, lusty benison.